Chinese authorities to be more transparent. After a mysterious outbreak of viral pneumonia hospitalized dozens. For made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. in the continent of Europe from the virus continues to rise at an alarming rate. The U.S. now has more reported cases of the coronavirus than any other country in the world. Turkey has delivered personal protective equipment to the United States. Turkey has delivered the medical equipment to three of Europe's worst hit countries. Doctors say treating COVID-19 is like piecing together a potentially deadly jigsaw puzzle. Hello everyone, welcome back to day two of the TRT World Forum 2020. I'm Ali Aslan and it's my great pleasure to host and moderate this upcoming high-level session titled New Realities in Foreign Affairs and International Relations After COVID-19. Well, I think we can all agree that the pandemic has affected all of our lives in a very deep, profound, substantial way. And foreign affairs and international relations are, of course, no exception of those. How has diplomacy changed in times of a pandemic? And what will the future of diplomacy look like? That's what we will discuss with three high-level distinguished foreign ministers in just a moment. But first up, to kick off this session, it's my great pleasure to welcome and yield the virtual debate floor to the Turkish Foreign Minister, Mevlut Çavuşoğlu. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ali Bey, for this opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to address you today, and it is my honor to be at the same panel with my uh, dear friends, Foreign Minister Pekka Havisto and Mahmoud uh, Kreshu. TRT World has become a major global news outlet in just five years. And this forum has already be, uh, become a well-known platform, bringing together prominent speakers uh, from around the world. I wish TRT World and the forum continued success. Dear guests, dear participants, the most pressing issue of this year is uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Many lives were lost, economies have suffered, Health systems were pushed to their limits. 
this is an unprecedented global crisis. However, crises also bring opportunities. With this opportunity, it is time to reflect on how we can change the way we do things to better develop a sustainable vision for the aftermath. We should start by identifying the new realities uh, as the title of this forum suggests. First, the pandemic revealed the weaknesses of the current multilateral system. It reaffirmed the validity of our call for the reform of international organizations. That's why we highlighted the need to promote multilateralism and strong institutions in the time of the pandemic. A few examples. We strongly supported the efforts within the G20. In MICTA, we underlined the importance of robust international cooperation together with Mexico, Indonesia, the Republic of Korea and Australia. We invited the leaders of the Turkic Council for an extraordinary summit to better address the challenges. We called for an executive committee meeting in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation with similar aim. We co-sponsored the UN General Assembly resolution calling for fair, transparent and equitable access to essential medical supplies and any future vaccines. We joined the EU's Coronavirus Global Response Pledging Conference, and we also took part in the Global Vaccine Summit. Second, with the understanding that nobody is safe until everybody is safe, we actively engage in humanitarian efforts worldwide. We provided medical supplies to 156 countries and 11 international organizations. Before the outbreak, we were already the top donor country in humanitarian and development assistance. And the coronavirus outbreak has just earned us another badge of honor. And we became the largest supplier of medical aid worldwide. Turkey brought back more than 100,000 Turkish citizens from 141 countries. While we were busy with the most comprehensive repatriation operation in our history, we didn't forget other nations. Our repatriation flights also took on board around 5,500 foreigners from 67 different countries. We benefited, of course, uh, from our extensive diplomatic network and the capabilities of Turkish Airlines. Having the fifth largest diplomatic network and the fourth largest flight network in the world made a huge difference. Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the geopolitics, it is a permanent reality of interstate relations, and this will also be true for the post-COVID uh, era. A few actors have been actively destabilizing our region. Turkey has been playing a key role in standing against these attempts. In the Eastern Mediterranean, our primary concern is to protect our rights as well as those of uh, the Turkish Cypriots, while Greece and the Greek Cypriots are trying to impose their unilateral and maximalist approach on us. We frequently see how EU solidarity is abused to promote the nationalist agenda of these members. Recently, Operation Irini was used as a tool against Turkey. On November 22nd, the operation ordered uh, the boarding, uh, boarding of a Turkish flag uh, commercial vessel without our prior consent. This was a clear violation of international law. Crew members were mistreated and harassed. At the end of an 11 hour long search, nothing in violation of the arms embargo was found on board. And we strongly protest this illegal act. UN Security Council resolutions on the Libyan arms embargo do not overrule the freedom of navigation. Of course, we reserve, reserve our uh, right to resort uh, to everyone, uh, every available uh, legal and legitimate tool to uh, respond. In any case, dear uh, friends, as Turkey, we are ready for dialogue and cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is why we called for an Eastern Mediterranean Regional Conference with the participation of all littoral states, including the Turkish Cypriots. 
In Syria, our military operations cleared over 8,000 square kilometers from Daesh and the PKK YPG. Thanks to our efforts, more than 411,000 Syrians returned home. Our presence in Idlib prevented yet another humanitarian disaster and the wave of uh, immigration. Our efforts as Astana guarantors together with the UN paved the way for the work of the Constitutional Committee. In Libya, we took the initiative to prevent another humanitarian disaster. Turkey's training and advisory support uh, for the UN-recognized Libyan government prevented a civil war. It also opened the way for the UN-led political process. Dear participants, dear friends, the illegal invasion of one-fifth of Azerbaijani territory since the early 90s was deemed a frozen conflict. Recent developments have shown that there is no frozen conflict. A conflict is a conflict, and it can escalate at any moment. It is not these conflicts uh, that are frozen. What is frozen is their solutions. When Armenia continued its aggression uh, through repeated attacks, the conflict turned violent again. On the basis of Azerbaijan's territory integrity and sovereignty, we supported a negotiated solution based on international law and UN Security Council resolutions. At the end, we welcomed the joint statement signed between Azerbaijan, Armenia and Russia. Upon Azerbaijan's request, Turkey will also undertake a role to preserve peace and monitor the ceasefire. Dear friends, had Turkey remained inactive in, in the face of such destabilizing developments, we will have faced much greater problems. In fact, what we do is also good for NATO. Today, we continue our meetings within the Alliance's Foreign Ministry. Unfortunately, at every turn, we always have to start from the beginning and wait for our friends to see the obvious. Turkey is a strong NATO ally and sees its future in Europe. Once we overcome the current confusion existing uh, mostly on the European side, I believe that the historic step of Turkey's accession to the European Union can be taken. This will also have a transformative effect on our wider uh, neighborhood as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't see foreign policy as a, a static area of uh, public domain. We don't view, view it uh, through geopolitical lenses only. As times change, the instruments of diplomacy must also adapt. Last year, I announced three major foreign policy initiatives. The pandemic has reaffirmed their relevance and importance. Our digital diplomacy initiative was announced well before the pandemic. Our aim is to improve our digital infrastructure and use, of, use the transformative power of new technologies in all areas of our diplomatic work. The second initiative, named Asia Anew, aims to advance Turkey's engagement with the region through a more holistic and long-term approach. This initiative complements our successful engagement activities in Africa and Latin America. Last but not least, uh, with growing uncertainty, complexity, and change, it is a necessity to create innovative platforms to discuss regional and global issues as TRT World is doing. The Antalya Diplomacy Forum aims to do exactly that. At the same time, Turkey will continue its more well-established approach towards building regional cooperation in the Balkans, Central Asia, and around Afghanistan, including brotherly country Pakistan. We will continue to promote global initiatives uh, like the Mediation for Peace we are co-chairing uh, with Finland. Uh, we will stand against xenophobia and animosity against Islam while promoting the alliance of the civilizations. Turkish diplomats are already chairing the UN General Assembly and the UNESCO General Conference to achieve effective multilateralism. As I look ahead to the post-pandemic world, the need for Turkey's enterprising and humanitarian diplomacy will be 
as great as ever. Let me stop here to give uh, the floor to my colleagues and look forward uh, your having your questions. I'll do my best to answer your questions as well. Thank you very much, Alibi. Thank you so much, uh, Foreign Minister Mevlu Cavusoglu, for kicking off this session and your preliminary remarks. Uh, much to talk about, of course, uh, throughout the remainder of the session. But first, let me introduce the other two panelists, very distinguished panelists. First up, we have the Pakistani Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi with us. Uh, welcome, and uh, welcome indeed also to the Finnish Foreign Minister Pekka. Avisto. Welcome to you all, gentlemen, and uh, let's dive right in, uh, Foreign Minister Qureshi. Obviously, face-to-face -face meetings, in-person interactions, these are all key aspects of diplomacy, traveling, being uh, on sites. Of course, the pandemic has made all these somewhat uh, difficult. Um, what are the challenges these days to conducting diplomacy? What are the challenges to conducting diplomacy in times of a pandemic? Well, thank you. Um, let me begin by thank you, uh, thanking uh, the TRT Forum for this invitation to be on the panel uh, for this uh, discussion. Uh, I am glad to know that in the last five years, uh, you, know, you have covered considerable ground and this forum has become a very well-known, well-respected forum. I'm happy to share this platform uh, with the Foreign Minister of Turkey and the Foreign Minister of Finland, who are well-known friends. Uh, this pandemic, you know, which is the uh, topic and very well chosen, you know, because of over uh, 60 million people around the globe having been infected and uh, having lost 1.4 million lives is perhaps the right uh, topic, and it was a need of the hour. Pakistan, uh, like the rest of the world, despite the, the new uh, foreign policy challenges, has been uh, uh, dealing with this uh, challenge. And I would say uh, rather well, uh, in the sense that we were able to contain it to a large extent. Uh, we are going through our second wave uh, which is a bit of a concern because the numbers are rising. In the last 24 hours, we've had 66 new uh, uh, deaths in the country. Uh, uh, but on the whole, uh, we managed uh, uh, the crisis uh, reasonably well so far. Obviously, uh, uh, the pandemic has had an impact on how we conduct foreign policy. The fact that here, you know, through this forum, uh, three foreign ministers are engaging with you and are discussing uh, uh, regional, international uh, issues, uh, issues of global nature, issues of, uh, you know, the challenge of the pandemic, you know, its impact on uh, human lives, its impact on uh, international economy, the challenge of, uh, well, the, 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 growing challenge of climate change, which we are about to face, or we are facing and will be facing, you know, immediately after we have dealt with uh, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, uh, such interactions, uh, this virtual connection uh, is, is uh, useful. But when we talk of uh, uh, the new instruments for foreign policy uh, and our new approach, we also have to see the environment uh, that we are working in. Before the pandemic hit us, uh, one could easily uh, see uh, a retreat in globalization. Uh, the tendency of protectionism was on the rise. Uh, one uh, could see um, uh, multilateralism uh, on the decline, and as the Foreign Minister of Turkey just mentioned, uh, it is a challenge that we need to uh, deal with. And, uh, you know, uh, we are supporters of multilateralism. Uh, we saw and we are seeing uh, an increasing trend in foreign policy, unilateral trends. And these unilateral trends, uh, you know, in an environment where there's growing competition, 
where there's confrontation and divisions on the rise uh, can be very destabilizing. Uh, you know, uh, it can undermine uh, uh, global uh, stability, uh, security, peace. Uh, we are seeing uh, a resurgence uh, of old uh, conflicts. For example, you know, uh, here in this region in South Asia, you know, uh, the the Kashmir dispute is one of the oldest uh, on the agenda of the Security Council, but we have seen a new resurgence, you know, a new rise in uh, uh, concerns uh, in uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the atrocities being committed, the fundamental rights being suspended, you know, uh, the kind of military siege that, you know, over 8 million people are in, you know, living in an open prison. These uh, are, are, are the, the new uh, challenges we are seeing, and, and we are seeing some new uh, rivalries on the rise. And foreign policy uh, during the pandemic and post-pandemic uh, uh, will have to, uh, you know, many of us will have to deal with them. For example, you know, this rising tension uh, between uh, China and the U.S. Now, Pakistan. Uh, has had a very old uh, relationship with the United States. Uh, we also opened the doors uh, for the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, uh, for for the U.S. Uh, to Beijing uh, and helped uh, uh, develop this uh, new understanding earlier on. But we see a, a, a new uh, a rising tension, uh, and uh, we have right. an old ally in the U.S. and a strategic ally in in the China in China. So how do we how do we maintain uh, this balance, this very delicate balance? Then we see uh, you know within Europe, uh, the Foreign Minister of Turkey mentioned uh, uh, Europe. How Europe today uh, is facing new challenges, uh, and how Europe is dealing with those challenges. The challenge uh, the challenge of immigration. For example, uh, and uh, divisions within Europe, and you see, you see Brexit, and you see a very important, uh, you know, uh, country uh, departing from uh, from the European Union. So uh, the question is: international stability uh, is under uh, under threat, and how we have to see that we can collectively uh, promote. Uh, multilateralism and stability within our region and obviously beyond right. our region. Uh, one thing and, that has become very clear and, today and, and that indeed, is... Foreign Minister, if, if, I may, if, I may, if I may just so, jump in, because you have given us quite, quite a few challenges, quite a, a, a wonderful comprehensive outlook on uh, what the challenges are of conducting diplomacy in a time of pandemic. I want to build upon this and come back to you in just a moment. But first, for Minister Havisto, uh, again, the same question to you, obviously. Uh, if it weren't for the pandemic, as uh, for Minister Qureshi pointed out, we would all be on a stage in Istanbul probably right now, as it is. Uh, we have to conduct this panel virtually. Therefore, um, and many of the diplomacy that you have to conduct, I would imagine, is also done on a virtual uh, level these days. How challenging is it for you? Thank you, moderator, and first of all, thanking first of all Turkish radio and television for this World Forum. And I, I really agree that I would love to be in Istanbul instead of uh, my my office, uh, meeting my good colleagues, uh, Minister Savusoglu and, and Minister Kuresi. And uh, I, I just want to also confirm that we have been already so many times online during this uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, pandemic with my colleagues either bilaterally or in, in different uh, international uh, occasions and of course it's uh, uh, I, I would say that what is missing from these meetings is of course the very important corridor diplomacy that we, we, we of course can hear our statements and, and, and respond but uh, usually in the physical meetings then you can also have a more unofficial part and that is what is missing during the corona pandemic. I also appreciate, I, I just want to raise it in the beginning, that, that while we might have different views on, on this, I think Minister Savusoglu mentioned many uh, issues where Turkey is also involved, Libya, uh, Syria, Eastern Mediterranean, we, we might have uh, even totally different views, views, but we are always dealing in our communication these issues with respect and, and dignity, understanding it's 
others' viewpoints and, and trying to create compromises and and uh, and, and policies uh, ahead. And I think it's it's even more important during these times of uh, of, of pandemic and, and and when we have to deal or online. Maybe just on the Finnish situation, I I know that in the world news there is always that Finland is a moral country to treat the corona pandemic. We have had so far quite little cases on the second wave, but unfortunately, that that is even increasing in in Finland. So we are not. This is this is uh, this is not a safe heaven for in the in the middle of pandemics, but but also. Uh, the, the second wave is, is spreading, and, and we have to be very act very responsible way also also here. Of course, people are wearing the masks and, and trying to do the distant work and, and and so forth. But we are waiting with some uh, some even uh, raising and, and bigger concerns the, the Christmas uh, time. Let me also mention that I think the, the uh, my colleague, the, the Minister for Pakistan, Mr. Kuresi, mentioned many of those topics that that are at the same time on our table the climate issue, uh, peace and security issues. Let us just look at the Horn of Africa and what's going on in Ethiopia area today, increasing amount of refugees and, and so forth. And, and we have to deal with all these issues and these will be left even after the pandemic and after the uh, effective vac vaccination. Environmental issues are very, very burning at the moment. And what is uh, important, I think the, the idea that was also presented by my colleagues that in this crisis might be also some solutions and that's why we are very much looking at the green recovery and the circular economy and, and taking the environment and climate issues in, in all these uh, uh, funding projects that are, are made due to the corona crisis. Uh, I also want to agree what the Minister Savusoglu raised on, on WHO and its, its important role and the multilateralism was praised by, by both of my colleagues. Finland has a very similar uh, standpoint that, that we really need international community and, and UN here. And when US was cutting its funding from WHO, we also increased from the Finnish side our, our support. And hopefully now when we see the regime change in, in, in US, also these policies will, will, will change. Let me then, then just finish by, by mentioning the Eastern Mediterranean concern has been, which Minister Savusoglu mentioned, also a very big concern for us and, and in the European Union. We have been really, really asking for a peaceful, negotiated solution to this. I think uh, one-sided action is, is never never good on, in solving the conflicts. And, and uh, I, I very much appreciate also our previous uh, uh, cooperation with, with Turkey as chairing this uh, Friends of the Mediation Group in, in, in New York in the UN context as, as part of the multilateralism. Back to you. Thank you so much uh, for Mr. Havisto. But uh, Finland, you say, is no safe haven. But if we're looking at the record, it looks actually comparatively quite good. Uh, 25,000 cases, 400 casualties in a nation of 5.5 million people. That, that is, is not, obviously, is, is no reason to be jubilant, but certainly in a bigger scheme of things, uh, one can say objectively that Finland has done a good job of containing this virus. Uh, Foreign Minister Chawish Olo, let me, let me also bring you in again and, and uh, pose the same question to you, because obviously you're someone who's known to be on the roads uh, all the time, uh, traveling, conducting diplomacy on site, meeting your counterparts, something that uh, all of us and you as foreign ministers certainly are somewhat uh, feeling restricted these days. Uh, what challenge are you facing in exercising your duties these days? Well, of course, pandemic affected our work as well. That despite the pandemic, I uh, try to visit many countries. I uh, paid a visit to Latin American region. And uh, despite this pandemic, we played an important role together with the European Union uh, to bring the, uh, the government and the opposition parties and to resolve their many outstanding issues. And uh, it bears fruits, I, I have to say. I'm very happy that we uh, work with the European Union. So if EU wants to be a global actor, uh, they should rather uh, try to work Turkey uh, actively instead of trying to isolate Turkey. I don't mean Finland and the other countries who are uh, strongly supporting Tur Turkey-EU uh, relations. And I also visited uh, Africa three times and uh, second uh, two times to Niger. 
uh, and six countries I visited. And I also visited some European countries and the regional countries. I have, I was in Azerbaijan many times, but uh, like in all other scopes of our lives, the pandemic also affected the, uh, the way we work. And we also witnessed an accelerated uh, digitalization in our working lives, like TRT is organizing this uh, forum virtually is a good example. At our ministry, we are also adapting ourselves to the rapidly changing circumstances. As I underlined, we announced Digital Diplomacy uh, Initiative before the outbreak. So we were uh, prepared for the new normal, actually. Throughout the pandemic, I communicated, uh, in addition to those visits that I mentioned, many counterparts, mostly online, and attended a total of uh, six to eight uh, diplomatic video uh, conferences. And my ministry also moved its uh, events to online platforms. And this year's ambassador's conference was organized virtually. Actually, we tried new technology, and this is uh, the, the domestic technology, and it worked very well. We brought all the ambassadors from all over the world uh, on the, online, and uh, we, really, we were really satisfied with this. So I'm very grateful to Chuksa. And the annual uh, Istanbul Mediation Conference uh, also held online for the uh, first time. And now uh, this is, I mean, the technology that I mentioned is also the green box technology that also we uh, use at different uh, uh, platforms uh, during the webinars as well. So many webinars also we organized uh, virtually this year. So uh, yes, it has been a challenge, right. but I think as uh, the other ministries uh, did, we also uh, uh, tried our best to continue our uh, activities. Thank you. These are challenging times, uh, uh, no doubt, for everyone, not the least uh, foreign ministers such as uh, yourself. But as I hear, you are adjusting to the new realities, as, of course, are all other countries. Uh, for Mr. Qureshi, it's already been said that uh, multilateralism and international cooperation are needed more than ever. After all, this pandemic requires a global response rather than a unilateral one, and uh, Foreign Minister uh, Chojol already pointed out in his opening remarks that essentially no country is safe until all countries are. But what we're seeing in effect are responses that responses are largely universal, uh, aren't they not? Uh, some might even say that uh, we are seeing a new nationalism taking hold, and your preliminary remarks uh, indicated that as well. Would you agree that the pandemic has not fostered the kind of cooperation that is needed, but rather fostered and promoted and brought upon a new level of nationalism? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, let me comment that I think the world was not prepared for this challenge. Uh, as I said, you know, we were gradually uh, transiting towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, protectionism from uh, globalization, uh, you know, uh, multilateralism, was receding and you saw unilateralism on the rise uh, and it has had an impact. Uh, it has had an impact on how, you know, uh, states have responded to different challenges. Uh, what was required for this ch challenge uh, to be dealt effectively was a multilateral, uh, holistic, cooperative approach. But what you saw was a initial knee-jerk reaction and every country offending for itself, you know, uh, sealing borders, trying to protect their people, their economies, not realizing, as you know, as uh, uh, for Mr. Uh, Visto said, that nobody stay is safe till everyone is safe. That realization had not sunk in. Gradually, this pandemic has now made us uh, realize that we are a different world. We are an interconnected world, a world which has inter more of interdependence today uh, than ever before. You know, people, generations living before us uh, were dealing with a different situation. Today, if there is a, a contraction uh, in uh, the economy of Europe, or of, uh, of uh, the United States, I, sitting in Pakistan, am directly affected. My exports are affected. My remittances are affected. When 
50% of my you know, uh, foreign uh, exchange earnings are dependent on remittances. So it's, it's a different world uh, that we are dealing with. And that is why, you know, we need to change our approach and make it, uh, you know, uh, multilateral cooperative. And that is why Pakistan uh, undertook, uh, you know, three, uh, uh, you know, we made three suggestions. And we have said, since it's a global challenge, it requires a global response. Many countries, developing countries, uh, are at a disadvantage. They need help. They have limited fiscal space. That is why the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Prime Minister Imran Khan, uh, launched an initiative called the Global Initiative for Debt Relief, asking the world to help the developing world because if the developing world goes under, willy-nilly, you will get affected. So help, uh, help them, give them the fiscal space so that they can uh, invest in their fragile uh, health sectors and they can protect lives, you know, uh, one. The other thing that we have been advocating is let's drop the commercial approach to the COVID-19 vaccine. You know, many countries are doing research, but what we need is more of sharing. For example, we need more, uh, you know, sharing of uh, health data, uh, medical expertise, uh, you know, uh, life saving protective care. Initially, everybody was for themselves, you know, and uh, countries were desperate for ventilators, couldn't buy ventilators because they were not available. Even they were willing to pay, but they were not available. Uh, you know, uh, that is why uh, cooperation in scientific research is important. And that is why Pakistan has suggested that we need a, a, a you know, a, this vaccine for greater public good. Make it affordable, make it accessible for everyone. And finally, uh, let's right. not uh, get into uh, stigmatization. When we get into stigmatization, then we lose that cooperative approach. For example, you know, there were, there were, you know, initially in the initial period, uh, there were, fing there was finger pointing, you know, the Chinese virus, you know, uh, then there was some finger pointing, calling Muslims as uh, super spreaders of this virus. These were things that we need to avoid and, and uh, have a more cooperative approach to deal with this challenge. Thank you so much for laying out the Pakistani strategies and approach to this uh, pandemic and how to overcome uh, battling nationalism and fostering international corporations in time like these more than ever needed, Foreign Minister Havisto. Uh, what we've seen at the beginning of this very pandemic in the uh, U European Union was a lack of cooperation. No, we've seen unilateral uh, border closures. We've seen everyone was fending out there for themselves. The EU has now managed to somewhat come together, presented a recovery plan. But um, how challenging do you find 28 to now 27 EU member states, of course, coming together and, and uh, presenting a unified front uh, in this battle, uh, also considering that now the battle and the race for the vaccine is full on. No, no, thank you. And, and, and I, I think you, you touched a very important point of how the EU cooperation works in this kind of times of, of crisis. And, and certainly when you look back to, in the spring, there are many issues that you could do better. And, and exactly that happened, that borders were closed in an in, in uncoordinated way or, or uh, protective material was stopped at the borders and, and you, ventilators were also mentioned here. Many countries have shortage of those, but actually quite rapidly then after the first shock, also cooperation started to emerge. Of course, the issue that also Turkish minister mentioned that our citizens were brought back from different countries. Also, Turkish Airlines, you, you, you made, a, made a big effort to that direction. We got our citizens from different 
parts of the world back to European countries. Finland also made its part with our national uh, flight company Finnair and, and so forth. Uh, secondly, countries started to take the, the patients from other countries to their hospitals, showing solidarity through through that, and, and also they start to cooperate on all border issues in a more systematic way. So I, I, I think we are now on the better side of, of these things, and, and now we start to speak about the health union, that we need more comprehensive policies on health issues in European Union, and of course we have the, our own recovery plans and, 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 and recovery funds now now under under construction. I think that's important. And then we are what we are doing together is this team Europe approach, particularly with the African countries that we act together to to help and, and coordinate our efforts to help many African countries out of this crisis. What was mentioned here of course is then I, I fully agree that blame game is, is something that we don't need at this moment. Of course but we might might ask questions like like if there are these kind of wild meat markets uh, where maybe the the, the COVID nineteen started, can we do something together? Could uh, international community do something together to prevent similar crises to appear? What could be the role of WHO in in preventing these crises? And exactly the issue that was mentioned here, the vaccination issue. How do we get the vaccination to to people in the you know, so, so that all citizens of the world have the same rights to protect themselves from 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 this. Uh, maybe a joke uh, to 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 finish this part. When people are always asking, how did you in Finland manage with the with the two meters social distance? Because usually you keep five meters social distance here in Finland. So, so what's this? Uh, was this advice difficult for you? So we are actually this social isolation and keeping the distances is very much in our blood. So it was it was easier maybe here than some other European countries. But it's uh, it's important that we are now working together, coordinating our actions together. And I I, I think we are now on the better side, even if uh, even if uh, as we see the COVID nineteen situation is quite bad still in many European countries. Back to you. Right. Thank you, Foreign Minister. So if I understand you correctly, the Finnish people were uh, uh, made for social distancing. This actually works in their favor in this particular regard. But all joking aside, Foreign Minister uh, Chaosholo, this pandemic, and I think it's become very clear throughout this discussion, has shaken up the old structures. Do you believe that the new realities that we're facing in foreign affairs uh, these days will be reversed once this pandemic is over? Or do you believe that these changes, that the virus merely served as an accelerator for these changes that are already in motion? Yeah. Alibe, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, experts have speculated on a uh, post-pandemic world. Uh, most agree that this year will be a turning point and a year zero, if uh, you will. But what comes next? Some argue that the pandemic will bring the end of globalization. Others said it is the uh, first truly global development. Some claim that uh, the pandemic uh, will be a geopolitical uh, game changer. Others uh, argue it will accelerate existing trends. And I asked my staff to make an assessment uh, very early uh, this year. And we uh, conducted uh, two parallel studies. Uh, on the one side, we uh, compiled the view of uh, leading thinkers in Turkey and uh, then the, the, the world. I, I have two books here. I send the copies uh, of these two books to my dear colleagues, uh, Pekka and uh, Mahmoud Qureshi. And these books are covering the views of the uh, scholars and from all over the world and, and Turkey. And we, if anybody is interested, by the way, we have Turkish and English versions. We can also uh, ship that to you. And also we develop our uh, own foresight. Uh, we either identify the trends that will accelerate due to COVID-19 uh, first. As uh, also mentioned in my speech, you also underlined that the pandemic underlined the shortcomings of the existing multilateral system. And the current system and its institutions uh, couldn't respond to the pandemic in a timely and effective manner, unfortunately. For example, it took 100 days uh, for the United Nations Security Council to adopt a resolution on the matter. Second, the pandemic has worsened uh, fragilities and uh, conflicts. 
the mediation efforts uh, that we are co-chairing were also in pair uh, to be chairing with Finland and the importance of resilience and good governance uh, was reaffirmed. Third, geopolitical competition has increased. The rivalry between the US and China was already widening the deepening, but the competition is not only restricted to uh, great powers. Many conflicts are now uh, internationalized, unfortunately. And the rise of Asia was a fact uh, uh, long before the pandemic. And the signing, I'm talking about the opportunities, of course, right now, and the signing of the uh, RCEP as the world's largest regional trade uh, arrangement uh, show that Asia will continue its uh, upward trend. Last but not least, the pandemic uh, has uh, uh, push us into the, into the future. And this is a, a rehearsal for the uh, digital age and the fact that again, that TRT is organizing this uh, forum virtually is an example. So uh, I do not believe there will be a return to the uh, previous normal, but instead a speedy transition to a new normal that we should all uh, adapt ourselves. Thank you, back to you. So reversal to the pre-pandemic world, if I understand you correctly, is not realistic. Right. Uh, on the contrary, we need to adapt and adjust to uh, what uh, future holds, uh, which in a post-pandemic world, so for Mr. Qureshi, speaking Absolutely. of uh, the future, the presence and of the future, of course, do you as a seasoned foreign minister and diplomat, do you see an upside to the current situation? Of course, uh, the pandemic has affected us all profoundly, mostly negatively. But do you see an upside to this current situation? Has the pandemic perhaps the power to bring countries with diplomatic problems together in times like these? Certainly, uh, uh, yes, uh, there is a great possibility. But let me, uh, let me also share with you uh, some uh, of my thoughts. You know, uh, pandemic also uh, uh, highlighted one thing, the limitation of international institutions. For example, when we needed WHO the most, uh, some of us uh, were, you know, withdrawing uh, from uh, WHO uh, and sort of not cooperating. Uh, when the Secretary General of the United Nation calls for a immediate ceasefire in different conflict zones of the world and deal with this pandemic, nobody pays heed to his call. Uh, that was another challenge. And in our region, you know, uh, in, in South Asia, you know, across the line of control on the Indian occupied side of Kashmir, we see a new uh, a sort of uh, intensification of uh, ceasefire violations. You know, if you compare the violations that undertook, uh, you know, took place in 2019 and see the increased intensification of violations in 2020 during the pand pandemic, you see that, you know, they went the opposite way. You know, they paid no heed to what the Secretary General was saying. Now, obviously, there is another realization that the pandemic, well, these things were simmering. Uh, I'm not saying they've just born out of the pandemic, they were simmering, but they hasten. The pandemic hastened the process uh, and we are dealing with new challenges. For example, I feel intolerance is on the rise uh, and you see uh, Islamophobia, xenophobia, you know, uh, you know, uh, very much there and we have to deal with that. We see uh, discrimination. Uh, and discriminatory policies being pursued by many states. I'll give you a very good example of uh, here again of my neighbor in the East India. You know, they have a population of 180 million Muslims, right? They're a minority, but they're a sizable number, 180 million. But what do they do? They uh, bring in new legislation, Citizen Amendment Act, discriminatory in nature, for a large minority living within Muslim minority living within India. We see racism on the rise. And, you know, you saw what happened uh, in, in, in the US. Uh, 
uh, prior to the uh, presidential election and how that gave rise to right. a new movement, you know, Black Lives Matter and nationalism, you know, you see, you know, protectionism, immigration, how immigrants, economic immigrants have been dealt with very harshly, I must say, very harshly, uh, you know, in a very callous manner. And you've seen people dying, you know, uh, and s starving and suffering. We need These need to be addressed. Can I also uh, uh, one make one right. last point, and that is, during the pandemic, one saw, you know, you talked, you talked of geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, changes and conflicts. Here again, un unfortunately, some in our region, instead of cooperation, uh, went the other way and took advantage of international diversion uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of increase their stranglehold on disputed territories like Jammu and Kashmir. You saw new restrictions imposed. You saw a new communication blockade over there. You know, you saw how, how fundamental rights were, were, you know, just suspended and done away with. Uh, and uh, you saw new measures, uh, you know, uh, uh, announced, which were against international law. You know, demographic changes being right. sort of forced on people, uh, you know, uh, violating uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention, international law, the UN Charter. So, you know, where the world required more uh, uh, cooperation, there were tendencies of taking advantage of a situation uh, in a very inhumane, uh, you know, a very inhumane approach was adopted. Now, these are the new realities that we have to deal with in foreign policy and find a way What's the way forward? Obviously, right. interstate diplomacy is the way forward. Obviously, dialogue is the way forward. And Pakistan has been advocating it. For example, when the world was not paying attention to Pakistan, we were saying there is no multi-solution to Afghanistan and only a negotiated political settlement is required. And today, the world has finally converged to that point. Now, we are saying, please do not ignore South Asia. There are two nuclear states, right. you know, confronting each other. And if you do not pay heed, if you not pay attention to this simmering problem, this uh, you know this uh, dispute, then there could be a problem, and the world uh, will get sucked in. Even if you don't want to, you want to stay away. You don't want to take sides, but you will have to. You will have to jump in, unless and until right. you intervene in time through dialogue, through diplomacy, and resolve the issue. So, so, certainly, a region that we ignore at our own peril, for sure, but. Uh, for Mr. Haviso, I, I will give you the last word and come back to you in just a second, but uh, only because uh, for Mr. Qureshi mentioned the rise in xenophobia, racism, and Islamophobia. I just want to give Foreign Minister Chao Shola a chance, a oppor quick opportunity to respond to that, because I know Foreign Minister Chao Shola, these are all topics that are dear to your heart that you draw attention to wherever you go. Do you believe that the pandemic has helped perpetuate these negative tendencies? Indeed, indeed. COVID-19 Alibi started uh, off as a public health issue, but evolved into unfortunately global crisis with uh, severe social and economic implications as well. We discuss, uh, we raised some of the issues in our uh, previous remarks. Uh, the pandemic increased global poverty and inequality and eroded sustainable development gains. It's also exacerbated the already rising trends, as you mentioned, of xenophobia, intolerance, racism and Islamophobia. And unfortunately, unfortunately, Europe is the focal point of such uh, negative trends. And I don't include, of course, Finland, but in the Western Europe, we see this very clearly. And we are concerned that Europe is becoming hostage to populist, racist and uh, anti-migrant discourses uh, each passing day. Uh, offensive publications, defamation and hate speech against Islam and Muslims are on the rise, unfortunately. And the security and well-being of the millions of Muslims in Europe are under threat. Why? I see that. I see uh, the attacks uh, uh, towards Muslims and the, uh, the mosque and masjids in uh, the all foreigners in many different parts of the uh, Europe. 
unfortunately. Having suffered from different uh, forms of terrorism for decades, we know well how solidarity is, uh, is a mass in fighting against terrorism and solidarity must be uh, without ifs or buts. Why I mention this? However, nothing can justify the detainment of uh, at least 14 Muslim children, school age children, following a raid on their homes by French police under the pretext of counterterrorism. And these children were kept for 11 hours and were not allowed to contact their families. Similarly concerning is the ill treatment of asylum seekers by Greece and Frontex, and despite the practices such as pushbacks being clearly against international law, and Europe kept its silence for long. So what we need is vision and moderation. Populist and racist discourses will only serve to strengthen radicals and uh, terrorists. And political leaders have also special responsibility, and we have all, I mean, responsibilities to reverse this trend. But if mainstream politicians also support such racist approaches, this is actually what we see today, for small political gains, we will all lose. And I hope this pandemic will encourage more strategic thinking on the side of Europe uh, as well. Thank you. Minister uh, Havisto, uh, you will get the last words uh, before we conclude this session. But having listened to both Foreign Minister Chaushol and Foreign Minister Qureshi, one cannot help but be a bit uh, pessimistic. Uh, they, they see the negative tendencies. They've pointed out the many negative tendencies that have emerged uh, throughout this pandemic. Uh, how optimistic, how hopeful are you as a foreign minister of Finland, as a foreign minister of a European Union country, that the multinational system, that uh, the international order, that the community as a whole can come together in a post-pandemic world to, to move closer together and cooperate closer together rather than highlight these negative tendencies and accentuate and fall back on nationalism. Let me, let me react also to, to some of those comments by, by my ministerial colleagues, because uh, I see, of course, Europe as a, as a continent that has been accepted. A lot of refugees from other conflicts and other countries have been working decently to, to, to safeguard the rights of these refugees but also, of course, is working uh, strongly together against terrorism. I, I have my full solidarity and sympathy for the victims in France and in Austria and so forth. So it's very important that we also protect our citizens. And, and uh, I, I fully agree with the full rights of Muslim citizens, but I also want to say that our Jewish citizens in Europe, in synagogues and others, have been, had to be protected. So it's a, I think we have a common task to protect each and everyone in, in this. And I also want to say that these social movements, like earlier Me Too movement for the rights of women and now the Black Lives Matter for the rights of black people, these are changing the world in a very, very remarkable way and have full sympathy and solidarity for these movements. But then how the world is changing and, 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 and could we be optimist or pessimist? I, I think this, it's, it's interesting to ask what kind of geopolitical game change that the COVID-19 can be. And of course, there is a certain competition who can recover most rapidly out of uh, COVID pandemic and, and who can get their economy running. But instead of that, of course, we should have more cooperation on, on developing the vaccines, getting the access to vaccines to all, all citizens and so forth. And I have a certain optimism when I see the trends now in the US particularly on this multilateralism after the Biden uh, victory. Of course, there are signs that their cooperation with WHO would be better. U.S. cooperation on climate change definitely will, will, will change. Maybe even U.S. approach to the Human Rights Council in the U.N. and so forth. So it's, uh, we have uh, some positive signs. And I, I think even if maybe the appeal of the U.N. Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres to, to stop the wars during the COVID-19 and concentrated to COVID-19, maybe it was, it maybe it didn't stop all the wars and conflict as we saw, but it's very, very important that United Nations have this voice and we support United Nations and its appeals for the peaceful solutions of the conflict. And then maybe finally, uh, I would like to, to raise the issue that was mentioned by my colleagues also, how, the, uh, how this world has changed more digital and how do we use the new technologies to communicate and meet each other and, and uh, 
share information and so forth. I'm coming from a Nokia country, as you, you know, so these new developments and new techniques and new digital uh, solutions are very dear to us. And we, we see that actually through the COVID-19 pandemic, we see a lot of these possibilities developing also in, in, in many developing countries. And these can also contribute to, to peace and prosperity. And, and there are good lessons to learn also from uh, COVID pandemic. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we have all come to adjust and gotten used to virtual debates like these. Let's hope that uh, next year and before too long, we can all meet physically again on a stage. But I think one thing has become for certain throughout this discussion, the pandemic has shaken up the old structures. But one thing is also clear, listening to the three distinguished gentlemen, the three foreign ministers, multilateralism and diplomacy will continue to play a key role in a post pandemic world. Foreign Minister Chao Sholo, Foreign Minister Qureshi, and Foreign Minister Havisto, thank you so much indeed for joining us and discussing this very important and timely subject matter. And uh, this wraps up the very first session of day two of the TRT World Forum 2020. Stay tuned, much more to come. The next session uh, will uh, continue in 30 minutes, moderated by Rachel Rubel. All the best and have a great day.
Imagine a world without travel, a world where we can't just step onto an airplane and find ourselves a few hours later in a different country, immersed in a different culture with the sounds, smells, and tastes that come with it. It's a world none of us probably imagined until this year when the coronavirus brought that luxury of travel to a grinding halt. But travel isn't just a luxury, something we take for granted. It's something we need. It not only moves our bodies literally to a new world, but transforms our minds, souls, and connects us with people in a way we can't from afar. But of course, the cost of travel comes with a heavy impact on the environment, and for years we've known we needed to fly less to lessen that impact. Well, still, it didn't slow us down until countries began closing borders, airlines canceled flights, and cities locked down as coronavirus cases began spreading around the world. Now it's the reality we've faced for most of 2020 in a world we couldn't have imagined one year ago with significantly reduced travel has become our reality. While the environment thrived as humans around the world stayed home, many sectors of society were deeply impacted and industries forced to adapt. It meant millions of jobs have been lost around the world and a renaissance of sorts in the digital world as sectors ranging from arts and culture to finance and retail rushed to shift their businesses online. Well, now we can tour museums, listen to symphony orchestras, visit faraway places all from our living room. Deals that usually came over business trips from New York to London or Istanbul to Doha are now being made virtually. We saw Amazon turn unbelievable profits in just six months, and Zoom replaced business meetings, social gatherings, and family reunions. Almost no sector has been unaffected by massive and sudden disruptions to international travel. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll look at the impact of this disruption on a variety of sectors, with a particular focus on how technology is being used to make up for the lack of people-to-people -people contact, whether it has been effective, and how it might change the nature of how humanity conducts its affairs in the future. I'm Rachel Rubel. I'm a presenter for TRT World and the moderator for this panel discussion. And now I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished panelists. Joining me today are Julian Guerrero Orozco, Vice Minister of Trade, Industry and Tourism of Colombia. Federico J. Gonzalez, CEO of the Radisson Hotel Group. Tony Wheeler, co-founder of Lonely Planet. Balut Baja, president of the World Tourism Forum Institute. Lauren Upping Calderwood, Head of Aviation, Travel and Tourism Industries at World Economic Forum. Tom Lowry, Editor-in-Chief at Skift. And Tom Jenkins, CEO of the European Tourism Association. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Uh, Julian Guerrero Orozco, I would like to start with you as you're the Vice Minister of Trade, Industry and Tourism of Colombia. I'm curious as to what sectors have been most severely impacted by the lack of international travel in Colombia and which industries are better prepared to handle this new normal? Thank you very much and hello to everybody be here sharing with you this uh, very, very interesting discussion and, and panel. Uh, well, I think that similar to what happened, had happened in, in the world, one of the sectors that have been most great by, 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 by travel is in fact tourism. Tourism and everything that has to do with the hotel industry, with their hospitality, restaurants, uh, with the traditional culture industry as well, commerce, fashion, um, and uh, the automotive industry. But I would like to focus specifically on, on, the, on the travel and, and the tourism industry that has been greatly affected. As you know, the industry is uh, uh, a contributor to approximately 10% of uh, world uh, gross domestic pre global product, as well as w one in 10 employments in the world. So the impact has been huge as it is a service it is labor intensive and it, the impact has been very, very, very big. Um, now, as to which uh, sectors are better prepared for confronting the situation, 
Well, I think that we have to remember the, the, the phrase of, of Char Charles Darwin when he said that it's not the big fish that eats the small fish, it's the, it's the one that is able to adapt, that it will be the winner. I think that the, the industries that are most flexible and are able to adapt, this is not the moment to remain still or to hibernate, to wait until the pandemic passes, because actually uh, the pandemic will, will be the new normal. So I think that the industries that are better able to adapt, to change, to reimagine what they can do. And we have examples in Colombia of uh, companies in the tourism industry where they have adapted and changed their type of products. So that those that, that have a greater flexibility to uh, attend to the customer's needs. I think those are the ones that will be uh, coming like in a really good situation in the future. Adaptation really has been the key in, in the year 2020. I want to open the discussion up now to Federico Gonzalez, CEO of the Radisson Hotel Group. Uh, what impact have we seen on hotels and tourism in the wake of the pandemic? Well, I think obviously, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I, I think obviously the impact has been uh, very, very strong across the world and across all the segments, I think, in the industry. I think from a geography point of view, what we have seen is is after the first and initial effect that, for example, uh, China uh, had, uh, and we have seen that across all of our hotels, but actually China, uh, one year one year after, is nearly back to, to where it was, okay, one year ago. So I think we have seen a very, a very significant effect during the, the first months, as we have seen across the world, but actually the recovery also has been, has been extremely, extremely quick. And I think when we look across China today, most of the towns and most of the, of the markets are back to where they were before, before COVID. I think when you look when you look to the US, for example, the effect has been uh, slightly slightly worse than it was in China. But actually, we have seen some segments like the mid-scale uh, service apartments, and we have seen suburban. Okay, not not the big urban hotels, but uh, all all of those who are who are outside of the big towns. In in many of them that are more uh, reachable by car versus plane, uh, they have had actually a better performance than than the big uh, tourist destinations. I think across Europe and, and Middle East and Africa, we have seen a severe effect, uh, even even deeper than uh, than the one we have seen in the US. And, and I think that has been driven by the complexity of international travel. Across all the countries, we have seen, obviously, <clears throat> a significant drop across all the segments. But I think also we have seen that the sectors that have done best uh, has been, have been those that are reachable by car, so many, many consumers, many business travelers and tourism has re have replaced okay, plane or international travel by more local uh, travel and, 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 and travel that you can do by car. And I think also has been different by periods. We saw obviously a quarter to uh, April to June that was, uh, that was really, really significantly, uh, significantly bad. We saw a slight recovery during July, September, I think across the world. Uh, and actually driven by local by local holidays or local destinations. We had hotels, for example, in the south of France or hotels in Norway, uh, summer destinations that were at, at nearly peak, uh, and also in, in, in countries like Russia or in Turkey, where we saw hotels at a very high level of occupancy. And I think, I think after that, uh, October, December came back to another kind of second wave uh, shock where we have seen also the negative effects. So I think across, across all segments, Possibly suburban, uh, mid-scale service apartments have done better. And I think when we look to the coming months, uh, we see all will depend of when the vaccination is available everywhere. But I, I think, uh, to what was said before, I think the wish and the willingness to travel is, is still there. I think uh, following, following the metaphor of the fish that was said before by the Minister of Colombia, you know, the fish only, only realizes that they need oxygen when they are out of the water. And I think this is the kind of travel, okay, we have only realized of how much we really care and need to travel and meet people when suddenly we realize that we cannot do it. Yeah, I think you're certainly right that the wish and will to travel is still there. Um, and 
Uh, we want to, I want to talk a little bit later on, too, about the vaccine, which, of course, is, is going to be probably a key part of that. I'd like to ask uh, my next question of Tony Wheeler, the co-founder of Lonely Planet. Uh, you know, since some travel restrictions were relaxed around the world in June, how has the global tourism industry adapted to this uh, new normal that was brought on by the pandemic? And how is the industry preparing for a future that may be radically different? I think that's future is going to be radically different. But I think the thing is that there isn't a new normal. I, I just last week, I went around various friends and said, well, how has this hit you? How, how have you been affected by it? I'm, I'm living in Australia, where we have extremely low um, virus cases. I'm in the state of Victoria, where I am, we have not had a single case for over a month. There's been 33 days now where we have not had one single case of coronavirus. But nevertheless, we cannot leave the country. We cannot travel from state to state. There are all sorts of restrictions on our, our approach to travel. I, I contacted a friend of mine in Hong Kong a few days ago, and he said, well, I've been various places in the world in this past um, six, nine months. The only problem has been every time I return to Hong Kong, I have to go into isolation for 14 days. I've had um, 42 days of isolation, which is not what travel used to be about. I contacted a friend of mine in Tonga in the Pacific um, where they have not had a single case. There is nobody at all in, um, in Tonga who has had coronavirus, but he said, we haven't had a flight in for six months. And they're saying the first flights into Tonga are going to be in June or July next year. And I just think that we're not really going to find what the story is behind this for 12 months, 24 months. We, we really don't know who has had the right approach, whether the, the Sweden solution of just, you know, stepping back and telling people to behave themselves has worked or the US solution of do nothing and hope that things work out. We, we just do not know. And it's going to take a long time before we, we really find out what the answers are. But I think one thing is that we're not going to go back to the way travel was before. The idea that we can just jump on the plane and head off to somewhere else and not worry about it. There, there's been so much said about how we've been concerned about climate change and the effect of travel. And everyone has said, but you can't change it. That's the way it is. And suddenly we found we can change it. We can shut everything down and suddenly uh, start a new world. And I think that is going to be the real situation of what is the world going to be like when we come back? And it isn't going to be the world that was there earlier this year. Yeah, and I do want to get into that as well just a little bit later. But first, I want to uh, bring in Balut Baja, president of the World Tourism Forum Institute. Do you think that international tourism, as we know it, can survive the pandemic? And what is the sense among industry stakeholders of the possibility of a return to a pre-pandemic normal, or maybe not so much normal, but close to what we used to know uh, with regards to travel and tourism? So thank you very much. First of all, I want to say uh, when you are starting the program, you said tourism is the must or luxury. First of all, I can say this tourism is a must. This hundred percent sure. So if we if we turn back to pandemic, what we can emphasize when this pandemic start in March, the first first week of the March, I mean the globally. So all the all the countries closed their borders and they stopped to host the tourists from other countries. So what we see during the process in June and July, so they open the borders. So my call to the presidents and the head of states and the minister is on, online now with us. So my call to them, first of all, we have to be sure. I mean, we have to be careful when we are closing the borders because closing is easy, but it's too hard to open it back. So this is the first thing that I can emphasize. And the second thing, Especially in 2021, the yesterday we announced a report and the total cost of the coronavirus is $3 trillion to the worldwide. And our expectation uh, for 2021 is this number to reduce. I mean, again, 2021, the industry will suffer. 
but it will be like $1 trillion. But our expectation in 2022, all the industry is going to recover with the jump of 25% if we compare the numbers with 2019 before the pandemic. So this is the, our forecast uh, for the industry. And the most important thing on this, uh, to catch these numbers, to be minimum, I mean, they get the harm of this coronavirus on travel business. Uh, the most important thing is uh, the governments have to have to get a huge attention when they are closing the borders to another country. So closing the borders is it's easy to take the decision, but it's too hard to get it back. Thank you. I want to bring in Lauren Upping Calderwood, the head of aviation, travel and tourism industries at the World Economic Forum. I'm curious as to where things stand now for the aviation industry, because, of course, as we know, as the world went into lockdown in the spring and international flights came to a standstill, the aviation industry was hit particularly hard, but it already was struggling even before the pandemic. The aviation industry um, was actually uh, experiencing extreme growth and we were expecting international arrivals to meet 1.8 billion by 2030. The original forecast was 1.4 billion for 2020 and we met that in 2018. So we've only been seeing um, growth in terms of numbers and people moving across the world. And with that is access to the benefits that aviation delivers and that's a, in terms of jobs created through travel and tourism but also uh, indirect e economic development that is a result of travel and tourism of course it was uh, receiving a lot of uh, slack for you know flight shaming and its its carbon footprint but in comparison to many other sectors it's actually got a small carbon footprint but it is a very visible industry and it, that is no excuse for what, why it should not be addressing its its carbon footprint and one thing that this pandemic has served to do is actually accelerate efforts of the industry across the, the value chain to, to make uh, changes around uh, carbon intensity, uh, adoption of sustainable aviation fuels. And we've actually had renewed interest and in energy from our stakeholders to do that. I think important to note, though, is that many of the operators have been, you know, flying on fleets of, of 10 percent of that. And restarting again will will require an enormous amount of certification of safety accreditation and we what's great is that uh, stakeholders across the sector from the international regulator to governments member states to uh, carriers to airports are all working very closely together on the takeoff guidelines they're working very closely in collaboration with the world health organization and chief medical officers across the globe to make sure that as we open travel again it's and open borders, which absolutely agreed is necessary for economic development across the globe, that as we do that, it's done in a way that is not a risk to, to public health. And, uh, you know, responding to Tony, I think no one has an exact solution yet on what that looks like, but we really believe that, that governments in particular need to move from risk avoidance to risk mitigation. There is no zero risk and there are ways that you can reduce the risk to a, a level that is comfortable and, and protects the public health of, of uh, citizens. Tom Lowry, Editor-in-Chief at Skift. Uh, you know, we saw Zoom kind of take over business meetings this year, not just business meetings, but social gatherings and, and family reunions, as I mentioned in, in my intro. But I'm curious as to some of the stories that you've come across as Editor-in-Chief at Skift that have struck you about how the travel industry, and in particular business travel, has been impacted by the pandemic and some ways that innovation has changed that, not just temporarily, but probably long term. Well, let me let me start by making kind of a strange observation. And I think that one of the sectors that's been hardest hit is corporate travel. And I say that because of the ripple effects that cor the sort of standstill in corporate travel have had on airlines, on hotels, on the hotel business. Um, at the same time, I think one of the most resilient sectors has been corporate travel just because of the technology. As we're seeing today and at this conference, you know, we're able to talk to each other and we're seeing a lot of companies adapt uh, virtual platforms to be able to do business. But every time that we do a corporate travel story that says it's never going to be the same, 
there's always a ton of pushback on social media from folks saying that um, you have to be there in person to do business. So it's a it's a really vibrant argument um, uh, and one that we want to cover more fully in terms of you know how important is it to be there in person. Um, again, you know um, some of the platforms have made uh, uh, the fact that you don't need to get on an airplane and, and be in a meeting uh, in person. Uh, I think we'll we'll stay with us. So I think we're going to see a little bit of a hybrid model with uh, with corporate corporate business going forward. Tom Jenkins, CEO of the European Tourism Association, uh, what has been the biggest impact on tourism in Europe? Is it the virus itself, or do you think it's the fear that surrounds it and the measures that have been put in place to contain it? The second, um, the virus itself uh, has obviously had a tragic impact on those people who it's affected, but it's still affected a very small proportion of the population. Uh, the measures which have been put in place have been devastating. Um, we've seen a 95% drop in business in the European incoming industry, which I largely represent. Um, the one issue I'd actually quietly take with some of the previous speakers is that um, I think the current situation is genuinely abnormal. Um, I think what we're looking at is a situation which is created partly by the virus and partly by government's response to the virus. And I think um, this will pass. I think we're with a, with a um, vaccine, which I know we're going to talk about in a second, we will see a post-COVID situation. And a post-COVID situation will be what it says on the tin. Uh, COVID will be a thing of the past, um, and I think if you've adapted to the, what people are calling the new normal, which is the situation at present, you've adapted to the wrong environment. Um, we will be looking at something which will not be identical to the situation we had before, but it will not be radically different, and it won't be radically different because people's motivation to travel, the things that they want to see, the desire for personal experience will not change. Um, and if people's motivation won't change, and I'm pretty sure it won't, um, I don't think we're going to see a radically different environment for leisure tourism um, in the middle distance. Lauren Upink Calderwood, I want to bring it back to you. You talked about um, the global growth in travel before the pandemic hit, and obviously that is something people are looking to get back to is traveling. But is it conceivable that airlines can simply return to their previous levels of service, uh, of service once this pandemic has passed? take a staged approach you have uh, you know on one end of the spectrum aircraft that have been kept in in action and others that have been parked in the desert you've seen the photographs of hangars and deserts where planes are, are kept and, and are being held off and we've seen also the retirement of a number of, of aircraft so um, not only will they need to you know get these aircraft ready for flying but they'll need to make sure that crew and and um, crew and ground staff, etc., are all uh, recertified and, and ready to, to return. I, I thought it might be useful to respond to, to Tom on the, the new normal. I think you're right that there is pent up demand for travel. We may not see that, that same level of mass tourism until, say, 2024, if we're conservative. But the, I think where there's a new normal is the, from an industry perspective, uh, there is need to be prepared. There's need for preparedness and um, risk mitigation for future crises. And I think that's going to change the way that they do business. And I think that may offer up to tourism uh, more appropriate and better ways to, to travel. Tom Lowry, uh, you talked about how uh, business travel is forever changed, but it could be re rebound more quickly. How has the COVID-19 crisis uh, impacted the speed and direction of technological innovation? Uh, I mean, I don't know how many stories I've edited where uh, somebody is quoted as saying, you know, we've done in four months what probably would have taken 10 years. So I've, I've edited that story over and over again. Um, contactless technology. I mean, things that people were imagining a decade from now are being implemented at airports and in hotels. So, um, you know, the speed to delivery uh, has been phenomenal in terms of that. I mean, we did a story last week about 
a museum in Baltimore that is using the virtual platform Second Life uh, with avatars um, that you know would have been just unthinkable a year ago. Uh, and the museum is saying that it, that Second Life has helped save save our business. So um, you know, it's just it's it's incredible that there's this sort of um, I don't know what you would call it a silver lining to the pandemic in terms of technological advancements. Julian Orozco, with every crisis, uh, as we know, comes opportunity. Which sectors have risen up to fill needs created by the pandemic and, and the subsequent lockdowns that came with that? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your question right. I'm, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. I, I was um, wondering about um, sectors that have filled the need that was created by this pandemic and the lockdowns. Which sectors in particular have thrived uh, this year? Well, I think that, uh, that the sectors that have thrived uh, were the ones that were able to make use of the world and tools and internet and, and e-commerce to, to, to develop their, their activities. I think those are the ones that uh, are thriving. Of course, there are ones that are more easily positioned to do that, like consulting or finance or other sectors. But there are others that are that the situation is much more challenging, such as, as tourism, for example. But of course, I think that those that have been in, in, in a very digital focus are the ones that are are better positioned. Now, when it comes to tourism, uh, I think that. Uh, there are many tools that companies are making use of to make sure that they can be better positioned in the recovery stage. And I mean, tools such as marketing analysis, market analysis, we are moving from the forecast to the now cast to be able to have information in real time and make good analysis to make sure that we are focusing rightly on, on the markets. In that regard, Colombia has developed, for example, what we call the Tourism Visor, a tool for statistics and for analysis online available for local governments, but also for the private sector. Everything that has to do with the biosafety measures and the use of uh, technology as well. Uh, Laureen knows it well because the World Economic Forum has had an initiative called the, the Common Pass to facilitate international travel worldwide. Uh, also the marketing strategies have to be digitalized in a more extensive way to make sure that uh, we make use of this, this tool and to make sure that we invest every single penny in the promotion strategy for destinations in a good, in a good way. Also, when it comes to booking, there has to be more flexibility. People are starting to book in a, a shorter period of time before they actually travel. There has to be flex in changing itineraries and cancellations, etc. And we need also to those companies that are working um, better connected between suppliers and and uh, and, and companies are also uh, going to be, I think, the, the winners uh, when it comes to this. Let me finalize, and I think that this is the, the pandemic is also a huge opportunity, you know, to rethink. I don't like to talk about uh, recovery, but because that would be to think about being in the same situation as we were in January or February this, of this year. I think that there is opportunity more than recovery to reactivation, to reimagine the sector, the tourism and travel sector, and to aim at having a better type of tourism than the one that we had before. And of course, the issue of sustainability becomes a very, very central point in this effort to reactivate. Balut Baja, I'm curious as to your thoughts on uh, this year of, of, of um, the, of the pandemic, and have there been any countries in particular or industry sectors that you have seen that have really stood out in regards to their management of uh, this pandemic and their use of innovation? So actually, uh, what I see and I observe, uh, the, uh, I mean, the specifically Germany, Turkey and the uh, South Korea has managed this pandemic very well on also tourism business, uh, because as, as I see, uh, some some of the countries uh, in the world, so they did not close the hotels. And first of all, they start to write, I mean, the write the, how they can manage and operate the system. So because it's easy to close, 
But the thing is, it's it's too hard to operate the system again. So what we see, first of all, some countries are started to write the manuals. I mean, the hotel manuals, aviation manuals, airport manuals. After then, as we see, Europe and the other countries are follow that. So it, it's a it's a it's a it's a huge step during the pandemic uh, that have to be done. Now we can see this. I mean, the manuals and the protocols in all around the world. So and also uh, the WTCC are known some protocols and the governments are following that and the World Economic Forum also. So it's 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 good because when this when this pandemic started, nobody knows what they will do in the tourism business. But now even one hotel, I mean the the gentleman is working in the restaurant knows that what is the protocol and how they can apply. So this is the first first thing and the second thing is. Uh, I want to contribute to the excellency. Uh, all crises create an opportunity. After this pandemic, what we are observing and what we are seeing that, uh, especially the boutique hotels in the worldwide, and the, uh, the the protocols is created that the hotels are following, will be more popular than the others. I mean, the, in this in this situation, like about at the mid class hotels, like three star, two star, even. 2.5. I mean, the not like four star or between three star. So this hotels is going to be melted in the industry. This is our forecast. Thank you very much. Tom Jenkins, what strategies uh, must industry stakeholders use in order to attract travelers, particularly as the global economic slowdown continues and people don't have as much um, income that they can spend on travel? Well, I, I think the first thing to say is that our analysis in the short term is that the people who've been most affected by uh, the economic downturn are not the target market for European vacations. Um, so we're, we're quite confident that the demand and the ability the, the, uh, and the financial capacity to travel to Europe is there and remains robust. Um, I think the, 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 the short term question really is, is how far um, the supply line uh, within Europe is going to be able to meet demand. Um, I'm not saying that demand is going to wildly outstrip supply at any time shortly, but the state of the service economy within Europe as it emerges from what is a coma is, is, is an interesting question. You know, what, what do the shops look like? What do the restaurants look like? What do the entire um, menu of what we offer incoming visitors look like? As to how people should react to this, I think really this is um, a fabulous moment for intermediaries. Um, uh, intermediaries, tour operators, websites, wholesalers, they add most value when sales are most difficult to make. And at the moment, um, customers are very, very thin on the ground. And if you can, when your business is to find customers for suppliers, then you should be able to have a very, very good time indeed. So I think for the next six to nine months, those entrepreneurs that can link customers who we know want to travel uh, with uh, suppliers who I know need customers, then they're in a, they're in a very good position. Tony Wheeler, I want to get back to a point that you made earlier about the restrictions that are in place, uh, particularly you know, there in Australia where the number of cases are low, but you still don't have free movement. Uh, it was a couple weeks ago at the G20 meeting where Chinese President Xi Jinping suggested a global QR code where it would track people's health status. Um, as well as their travel. It's something that China's already using domestically. I know there's something similar in the UK, although probably not widely used. I know the European Union um, has some similar tracking uh, methods here in Turkey. We have what's called a HES code. Um, it's attached to a QR code. You have to have it to book a domestic flight, to check into hotels, and, and now just uh, in the last day or two to even enter a mall, you have to show this this has code and QR code. I'm curious as to what you think people are willing to accept for life to return back to normal um, or a version of normal, the, you know, these quarantines and these uh, big brother type tracking methods. And how much of this do you think will stick around long after the pandemic is over? I, I think a lot of the changes we're going to experience are going to stick around for a long, a long, long time. You know, after 9-11, we got used to airport security being 
much tighter than it used to be. And, you know, the idea of going in and not putting your your bag through the x-ray machine and not being checked out and so on, you know, is totally alien. And I think that'll be the same thing with um, travel post-pandemic. We're, we're going to have to prove that we're healthy to travel. I know Qantas has said that they're not going to accept passengers unless they can prove that they've been vaccinated when a vaccine comes in. And there have been people saying, oh, if you weren't, you know, I, I, I don't want to have the vaccination, I won't travel with you. Okay, then don't travel. So I, I think we're going to have lots of restrictions that will become part of everyday life. I think there are a lot of things that we, you know, we, we've been talking about the fact that we can do so much more of our business meetings on the internet. And, you know, we, we, we're used to Zooming and um, meeting, meeting in that way. But then people don't need to be living in the places they were before. So I think there's going to be major upheavals. Why live in the middle of a city if you can live out in the a village in the country somewhere and still meet just as if you were in the middle of a city? I think there's going to be lots of changes that we really haven't anticipated yet and are going to be bigger changes than we, we thought, were, thought were going to happen. Lauren, I want to ask you about that as well. Uh, Tony mentioned the, the Qantas CEO saying that people who fly internationally on Qantas will be required to have taken a, a coronavirus vaccine. Do you think this digital health pass is the future of travel, uh, not just during the pandemic, but beyond? Um, are these measures here to stay? And what about contact trace measures? I'm curious as to your thoughts on that as well. Credentials or passes, certainly more than the track and trace. The digital credentials is something that's been uh, on an upward trend with digital identity and and being able to share information about your or share proof of information about yourself without handing over your personal data. And the digital health credential is no different. It's a it's yes, it may be a QR code in format, if so, but it it's a, a credential that says. I meet the requirements of, for this flight or entry into a country, or I don't. It's a green or red light, and I'm not passing as a traveler any of my information on. If, if that's the way that it, it develops, then I think that, that is, it's on the same trend that has been happening with digital identity, with biometrics, with proving information about yourself as is, do you have a visa to enter this country? The track and trades, I think, is a little bit... Um, in, you use the word big brother. I think people are concerned about that and understandably so. Um, and so I think importantly is any of these technologies need to be privacy preserving. And I think that they are, they are here to stay. The international regulator has published specifications for new digital travel credentials. In other words, a digital passport that was underway before the pandemic hit and development of these types of, of technologies and digital wallets and health wallets, I think is definitely here to stay. Tom Jenkins, I'm curious as to about uh, movement within European countries, because that's uh, in the past, it was fairly easy, particularly with the Schengen zone. Uh, is it still possible to have free movements uh, with the pandemic and then in the post pandemic world? Well, I mean, in the pandemic, um, this is Countries have uh, reasserted their right to, to close borders and to close down zones within borders, um, even within countries. And we're looking at the UK where I'm based. It's now very difficult to travel around even within the UK. I think um, in the post-pandemic world, I think one of the first things that the European Union is going to be really keen on doing is reasserting uh, the Schengen area as a free travel zone. And I think this will be one of the first things that come into play. It's certainly very high on their priorities. Um, I also feel that um, there is, as someone's already alluded, a huge pent up demand for people to travel. Um, it's extraordinary that um, sectors which, in theory, um, should be highly resistant to um, people coming on board during a coronavirus pandemic, like coach tourism, domestic coach tourism within Europe, um, takes off whenever they're allowed to take off. So there is a huge demand for even quite high proximity tourism uh, within Europe. And we, and we saw in uh, August when the 
borders came down to a certain extent, um, large volumes of people, not the sort of volumes we usually see, but significant volumes of people traveling from Northern Europe uh, down to the Mediterranean for their annual um, summer holiday. So I, I think um, we will see a bounce back, certainly in terms of domestic and intra-European travel quite quickly. How fast long haul international travel recovers is going to be a really open question. And um, that is going to be an area where the industry will have to try and respond. And we'll, it's going to be very interesting to see what that response is. Yeah, interesting indeed. Uh, Tom Lowry, what have you seen uh, and, and heard about fears and anxiety that people have about traveling, uh, not because of the coronavirus, but because of the measures taken, you know, this track and trace of technology and privacy concerns that people might have? Well, it's interesting. We, um, you know, in terms of pent up demand, I mean, I, I think some of the expectations are a little overblown in that. And I think it all comes down to sort of traveler and consumer confidence. And I'll go back to something that Lauren was saying about digital health passes. I mean, I, I feel like, um, you know, there's sort of a double-edged sword there in terms of the confidence of the traveler. I mean, will a lot of travelers be deterred by the fact that they have to share that information or will there be kind of renewed confidence knowing that the person you're sitting next to uh, on an airplane or net or standing next to in a hotel lobby has had the same sort of health screenings that you have had. Um, this sort of came to sort of to the light for us at Skiff. We had our first aviation forum two weeks ago. Um, and I can say that there's sort of measured optimism uh, among the airline executives um, and that there's no expectation that even when there's a va vaccine, that the vaccine will be this panacea and we'll see a return uh, to sort of robust travel by the end of 2021. I mean, some airline executives are even saying, you know, we, we don't expect to see things return to pre-pandemic levels until 2025. So um, again, um, I, I think that it comes down to a measure of how confident consumers. And I think that consumer confidence comes from obviously national leadership on some of these issues. Um, as well as sort of, uh, you know, how well the vaccine is distributed and how efficient that distri distribution is. Right, and so I just want to ask a follow-up question, like as far as um, increasing that consumer confidence, because of course there are people who are concerned about their privacy and a lot of people who are concerned about the vaccine as well. If a vaccine, a health, digital health pass is required, uh, is this just a matter of those people don't get to travel if they don't do it, or, or we're just going to focus on the people who are willing to accept these new technological measures that are in place to keep us safe? right how, how you market the digital health pass to people as being sort of necessary to be able to travel um you know i saw a study over the summer that said that people that were nervous about traveling that finally got on a plane and traveled 80 percent of those people said they would travel again so it's just sort of like breaking through those initial fears so um i i mean i think a lot of this uh will be determined once we once we get the vaccine out and and people uh, feel comfortable with what they're seeing in terms of others traveling. Baluk Baja, Turkey reopened to tourism this summer and had a number of measures in place to ensure safe tourism. Talk to us about some of the measures that Turkey implemented to keep travelers safe and healthy while they were in the country, as well as how, to hand, how they handled outbreaks uh, in tourism hotspots. Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, I want to at some small uh, thing the, the, before me. So especially for the digital passports, uh, what we observe, because I'm traveling a lot to Africa and Asia, uh, what I observe, so a digital passport is applicable for the, some countries, it's done, no worries. But the thing is how it will be proceed to the, the other part of the world. So how the practice will be. So it's more important because the, the people are traveling all around the world. So it's it's okay for germany i mean it's okay for berlin it's okay bogota it's okay in istanbul but how this will be in practice in jamina or how this will be in practice in uh, in, in cambodia so this is the question mark that i mean that we are thinking also so on your question uh, when you come back uh, turkey achieved a good job uh, first of all they created a, a safe zone so like antalya antalya is the coastal area of the turkey i mean the resource area of turkey and they 
they they they they prevent it from the i mean they they create a safe zone and then uh, they give a huge uh, education for the t t terrain for the staff and also they there there were huge uh, inspections from the minister of tourism so uh, with the protocol so who follows the protocol the hotels are open and even if ju just one uh, small problem came and then it's already sorted so uh, so turkey managed very well so and also it's a good chance for turkey because uh, the the whole tourists are coming from just one source it means from russia ukraine cis countries and also small parts uh, from germany so it's it's easy to manage so if these things uh, if the source of the tourists can be maybe 10 or 15 different countries with a volume it will be too hard to manage it but the, the, the fortune of Turkey is uh, because of the charter flights and because of the uh, resort tourism. So it's easy to manage uh, a close one destination just for a touristic area and then manage it uh, with the COVID protocol uh, that the World Health Organization and UNWT and all, all the other uh, sector leaders are follow, follow, I mean, they described. So it's then the Minister of Tourism and the hotel associations and the tourism business partners so they manage very well so thank you yeah and i and i did yeah i did quite a bit of traveling throughout turkey this summer and i have to say that it was managed really well it almost felt like uh, there was no pandemic other than the fact that you were getting your temperatures checked and people were wearing masks. Uh, Federico Gonzalez, I do want to um, piggyback on that and ask about uh, what you see going forward with um, the hotel experience, because of course, uh, checking into a hotel now, there are the, the temperature checks, you know, biometric screenings. Mm. Uh, do you see a digital health pass and a requirement for a vaccine being part of the future for hotel stays as well? Well, I think I think when when if we if we keep some distance, the hotel at the end is only one small piece of the travel. Okay, is the plane, is the hotel, is the restaurants, is where you go, is the shops. So I think possibly there will be nothing that is extremely uh, different to the hotel to what is required to go to the destination. And actually, I I think one of the key areas of focus needs to be actually every destination will depending on what they do they will get whatever the future they will have i i fully agree with what has been said about turkey i think the the, the country did a phenomenal job in, in in trying not only to do the right thing but actually communicate to the right targets okay that what was being done so people understood and they they, they went there so i think uh, the destinations in the future are going to are going to have to prove to the world that uh, it's not only that the hotel is safe, but actually the destination on its own is well coordinated, is well managed. And, and, and we cannot forget that this crisis is a crisis of fear. So I personally believe that the moment the fear is gone, many people or most people will go into their normal habits. People is willing to travel. People is needing actually not only for tourism, but also for business to, to meet and to have discussions. I guess we all we all suffer from from this kind of uh, not 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 sensing, okay, the feeling of the people when we meet uh, via via this kind of new technologies that we are all using. So I think I think at the end is is the hotels, and I think that's good by the way for the hotels. I think all the hotels worldwide will have to increase, and the, most of them have done it already, increase the quality and the safety standards. And I think that's a good news. It will not only prevent COVID, but I think it will prevent many other diseases. And I think it's going to focus the consumer more on quality and less on price picking, no matter what happens with hygiene. And I think that's a good news for the world. I, 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 it's, not, it's not in hotels, but also in planes. I personally, okay, uh, when I was traveling okay, before the COVID, you know, sometimes I wondered if they had really time to clean the plane because it was like 10, 15 minutes in between people exiting and myself going into the plane. And you know what? I would have paid even a bit more for that or for feeling that actually there was enough play, enough time to clean the plane. So and I, I, think, I think that is one of the big benefits, I think, of this crisis. The level of quality and the level of safety that all over the, all over the world and in hotels in particular, all the protocols we have put in place, the protocol of the World Travel and Tourism Council, the ones that uh, Radisson has done or many other chains, that are going to benefit not only to avoid COVID, but actually to make uh, the health and the safety standards in the hotels 
much better. And I think the consumers will look at that and will see it. Yeah, I think certainly no one is upset about uh, safety standards such as uh, cleanliness uh, being part of everyday life. I do want to ask you another uh, question. Uh, I was traveling recently in Turkey and I had uh, booked uh, a room at a hotel and I got an email uh, a few hours later saying that I could check in with my mobile phone and could use my mobile phone as a key so I wouldn't even have to interact with a person when I went to the hotel to check in. How are mobile phones becoming key components in delivering a safe contactless experience. And what I'm also curious about is how does it affect people whose jobs would normally be that person who would check you in? I mean, doesn't this mean that yes. some people will be losing jobs? Well, I, I think I think no. I mean, the first to, to the second point, I, I don't think people will lose jobs, but possibly the nature of the jobs will change. Okay. I think one of the things we are seeing in the hotels is uh, we, we are asking people to be a bit more flexible and because different needs in the, the hotels may happen at different times of the day. So you may be in the reception, you may have to be in a restaurant, you may have to be in another division. So I think that will change and there will be more flexibility. Now, to, to your point, you know, is uh, I, I think we in the hotel industry, what is going to happen is that there is going to be, and I think everybody's working to get that, is, is a much higher level of personalization and a much higher level of uh, diff bringing different solutions to different people. To your point, I think we are all advancing uh, to have a contactless experience for those consumers who want it. But I can tell you, even today, we have many consumers who still want the contact, they still want to get the human, the human welcoming, the human information. And I personally, personally, I always uh, prefer the consumers to have a human contact because I think this is what makes us as a company different to other companies where you could be checking in. It doesn't matter if it's a human being or a machine. It's the same treatment. I personally believe that in the spirit of service, uh, the experience should be different when you are welcomed by a person who worries or is able to adapt their behavior to, to your wishes than if you do it through a machine. But that said, I think the mobile technology is there to stay. Uh, everything will be seamless. And I wish not only the hotel, but actually the travel worldwide would be seamless. So I don't have to show so many papers to so many people in so many different uh, instances when I travel. So I think that seamless, okay, a hotel stay or check in, check out is going to happen. And I think many consumers will welcome that. But I have to say that many other consumers still will welcome the human touch, the human welcoming, making the right questions. Okay, and, and making and trying to get contact with the person. But as I said, I think the critical point is going to be there is no longer one solution in a hotel. We, we are working to make sure that uh, not only in welcoming, but even in food. Okay, there has been a moment where everything has been individually packed. Well, there are consumers who are asking back to, hey, I want to steal my buffet okay, in, in, my, in, in the hotel. Now, deliver it to me in a way that I feel safe. So I think individualization, tailor-made tailor solutions, and an increased complexity in the execution of the solutions for the hotels is going to be there and, and is going to be the key for the future. Yeah, I, I know I personally still like to meet face-to-face -face with someone when I check in because yes. I like to ask questions, but it is certainly nice to have the option of a Me contactless <laughs> uh, check-in if it is there. But I think you're right that it is it is the future. Um, Julian Orozco, I know the country's Ministry of Commerce, Industry, and Tourism launched a biosafety certification for the tourism sector that allows tourism service providers to demonstrate compliance with mandatory protocols issued by the national government and their efforts to comply with COVID-19 pandemic health standards. Can you talk to us about what some of those measures are? Yes, thank you. As uh, other countries did, uh, we adopted uh, biosafety protocols that were compulsory for all the tourism sector to adopt in different fields like restaurants and hotels and the aviation industry, etc. But we thought it would be useful to complement that with a voluntary stamp uh, that is, we call the check-in certified. And uh, we followed a route that was a little bit different from what other countries follow. This was not a certification or a stamp uh, developed or uh, given by either the Ministry of, uh, of Tourism or the private sector itself, the different associations of sector, similar to what several other countries did. 
we followed the different paths and we what we did is that we used the uh, uh, conformity evaluation organisms uh, such as you know bureau veritas sgs in the case of colombia econtech but these types of organizations because we thought that it was it was better to give enough trust to the stamp in the sense that it was a third party independent government with the credentials and the experience to do this type of assessment and to make sure that the protocols adopted by the government were being put in place in the correct manner and it proved to be a quite good road or path that we used actually there are more there are approximately 2000 companies that have adopted the, the check in certified stamped and uh, that includes the mayor the larger or all pretty much the all the airlines in colombia the airports um, many many hotel chains uh, in colombia as well restaurants it has even been expanded to include not only the tourism sector as a result of the of, of the good experience that we've had with the the stamp but also um you know uh, shopping uh, uh, different uh, yeah, uh, shops and uh, and commercial uh, centers have also adopted this check-in certified and we're really really happy and i think it has been a good reference for the region as well but we needed to complement that with uh, a standard or a mutual recognition between different countries so that we'd only incentivate not only incentivate domestic travel but only international travel and we have been leading an effort in the framework of the oas uh, to make sure that countries have a, a similar type of standard it has been it has proven to be quite quite difficult but we have been working hard in trying to uh, make some progress in that regard at the end of the day the seal aims at building trust and that somebody mentioned it before but the key word for the recovery phase is trust we can build we need to build trust in every single decision that we made as government of, or as private sector has to uh, contribute to building that trust that we need to incentivate demand Right. So I, I want to piggyback on that and, and ask, as far as the building trust from tourists, are you seeing a resurgence in tourism there in Colombia? Because I know that is it is a very important part of the sector, uh, the economy there. Yes, fortunately, we are see, seeing a rebound and we are seeing that uh, tourism is starting to be reactivated and we have uh, several decisions in place. We had uh, uh, st strengthening the budget for, for promotion, for marketing. We, had, we have a, well, an international campaign. For the moment, we are focusing more on the domestic campaign, but we have seen travel increase and there is a recognition uh, by IATA, mainly in the region, that Colombia has been a, one of the countries that has been able to reactivate uh, more speedily, of course, not to the extent that we would want, but more speedily uh, travel uh, domestically. So, yeah, we're seeing a, a good trend, but uh, we need to emphasize every minute that this is not the time to relax the biosafety measures, but to the contrary, we need to have more auto control, auto protection, etc., to make sure that we don't go, we don't have the need to go back to further measures that limit the mobility of people. Tony Wheeler, I, I'm curious about the role that you see Lonely Planet playing in the future of travel post-pandemic, because I, like a lot of people, have traveled with a Lonely Planet uh, tucked under my arm uh, when I'm traveling. I mean, as far as developing a more sustainable model for travel and tourism, uh, how can Lonely Planet partake in, um, in that? Look, I, I'm, I'm no longer part of Lonely Planet, so I'm only guessing what they might do. But I, I think it's going to be very difficult for a while to, um, to know what's, what's happening. It's hard to write about places if you don't know if they're going to be reopening, if they're going to be back in action by the time your, your new, uh, new edition of the guidebook, whatever, comes out. But I think we are going to see a lot more 
of um, of local tourism. We, we've spoken about that, about how people want to drive places rather than fly there. I think there's going to be a lot more interest in, in for example, walking tourism. The last time I was in Colombia, I did the walk up to Ciudad Perdida, the lost city. Now, that, that that's the sort of local tourism where you're you're not having to worry about um, interacting with large crowds. You're you're off by yourself on the walking trails. I've been talking to friends of mine in Europe of when I can get back to Europe, what I'd like to do. And one of the things I've never done in Spain is I've I've never walked the Camino Santiago, the, the famous pilgrim walk there. And that's something I'd really like to do next time I get back there. And again, that's something that you're doing by yourself, that you're, you've got a little a little isolation there. Um, friends in Italy, there's a new walk developed between um, the town of Ravenna on the um, Adriatic coast, a week or so walking up to, to Florence, to Firenze, uh, Dante Walk it's called. And I think that's another example of this sort of local tourism that we hope will develop. But I, I, I'm really, one of the things that's concerned me during this whole pandemic is regions of the world which may not necessarily have been hit so badly by the pandemic and i think africa is a case of this that the the pandemic has really not apart from in south africa and even south africa has recovered to a large degree has not been hit as badly as south america or europe or and the americas but the tourists have stopped going there and you know it's had a huge impact economically and I'm really hoping that, you know, we, we will see some bounce back when people can start to travel again. They will look at places which, you know, need tourists coming in. They need to have that um, economic activity that tourism brings. And I hope that does, does return very soon. Yeah, you talk about uh, local tourism, people staying closer to home, doing more road trips. What are some things that countries can do to entice people to do more domestic traveling? Because, of course, you know, international travel sounds more glamorous. But, you know, as far as uh, countries getting people to rediscover where they're from. Look, I, I, one of the things I've been doing, I, I've been talking with people in New Zealand and just before the pandemic hit, New Zealand was another place that was worrying about over-tourism. And over-tourism, we see it in lots of different, different ways. We see the situation in, in Barcelona or in, in Venice, where the, the local population is almost overwhelmed by the, the number of tourists. And in, in New Zealand, the situation was a lot of tourism in New Zealand is based on walking activity, the walking trails, the outdoors, the nature. And people were really concerned that they were they were losing that um, that isolation, that feeling of freedom by the fact that there were simply too many tourists. And um, you know, there's been discussion in New Zealand that as to and you know, New Zealand really has been cut off, like Australia. It's it's fine to have no no coronavirus, but if you also have no visitors, you know, you you know that's that side of the picture isn't so good. And in New Zealand, they are saying, well, when we restart. We really have to look at this in a different respect. We can't just go back to the way things were before. If we were worried about there being too many tourists on the walking trails, just like people in Barcelona might be worried about too many tourists on Las Ramblas. You know, do, do, is there some way we can approach this in a better way after the pandemic? Yeah, I remember over tourism was, was always such a concern. All right, uh, Federico Gonzalez, the COVID-19 pandemic has arguably acted as an accelerator for this ongoing digital transformation of both business and society. What does this mean for the hospitality industry um, as it relates to business travel in particular and the potential for companies to increasingly move meetings um, and conferences to digital platforms rather than booking space um, at a hotel? Yes, I think I think actually what uh, how, how we see how we see the future is as you are right as you are saying right is that there is an acceleration of technology implementation and and, and actually uh, we were working before covid okay and actually that's why we introduced them already last month okay we we have introduced something we call hybrid solutions is hybrid rooms or hybrid um, hybrid uh, meetings and i think it's a combination i think we are going all to see uh, first 
people is going to come back to meetings, I think, and, and, and corporate meetings as they did before. But I think this, this level of easiness in connectivity uh, has enabled us to think on solutions that we didn't think of before. You, you may go to a hotel because you're having a meeting with your sales force in Istanbul, okay? And at the same time, okay, you may want to connect with another meeting that is happening in Ankara, okay? And at that moment, you, you may want to give a message to the two organizations at the same time. Uh, and then I think in the hotel industry and what we have introduced as e uh, hybrid meetings, I would have the possibility to, meanwhile, I'm in, my, in the hotel in Istanbul, to get a very instant connection Okay, thanks to the new equipments that are available or that we, ins we are installing, that it would allow me to give the speech not only to the people who is present at that moment in Istanbul, but actually also do it in Ankara. And I, I think those kind of hybrid solutions are going to increase. I think also whenever you go to, to rooms, we are equipping, uh, we, we are putting equipments in rooms where you could use the room also as an office. So m many of us may have gone to a hotel room where for whatever reason we only think about the sleeping in the room okay and during the day the room the room is empty or we are not using it i think in in those in all those rooms or larger rooms junior suites we are putting the right equipment so you could use during the whole day the the, the room as an office to have your video conference you, you need you may go later on to an event and then come back to the to, to to the room or to the room office so i think those kind of solutions are going are going to be there i think also technology in service apartments that I think is a segment that is going to keep growing okay in the, in the coming in the coming years is going to be there and I think those solutions uh, why and one question is why why are we going to implement them now why we are implementing them in hotels now is because I think one of the effects of this crisis is last minute booking for many times these kind of ideas may come in the last minute so I think uh, those equipments will have to be there and you will not be able to wait okay or you will not be willing to wait one week Till you have the setup of the of the equipment to have your your contact. Many of those things may come as you are doing the event, and I think hotels will adapt and will start implementing those solutions across the globe. We have it now in 50 hotels. We are implementing that right now in 50 hotels, and our plan is to have it in all the chain in the right business hotels by the end of 2021. And I, I think that will continue, and that will be all over the industry. To help, I don't think that will kill many meetings or replace many meetings, but I think it will make many of the meetings to have a larger reach in terms of how many people you can talk or you can interact with. Tom Lowry, we heard from Tony Wheeler talk about uh, tourism moving more toward domestic tourism and smaller groups and people staying closer to home. Do you see that uh, a rise of localization in other um, sectors of travel, particularly as it relates to consumption and production patterns? Well, I'm glad Tony brought up over tourism because that's certainly something that we've written quite a bit about over the past few years. And um, I mean, we're asking ourselves questions now about whether under tourism is going to be the new over tourism. Um, and it was it was great to hear about sort of you know, these trips to remote areas. Um, I mean, in the last several months, we've launched a series here at Skift called Second City Survival Diaries, where we're looking at what sort of second tier cities, not the sort of Paris's, London's, and New York's, uh, are doing in terms of facing the challenges of the pandemic. And a lot of those stories focus on the small business owners and really doing inspiring and innovative things. I mean, the first two that we've done were in Jacksonville, Florida, and the other one was in Durban. And in South Africa. So I think there's there's real efforts to try to promote local tourism. And I think there's a real opportunity. I mean, I know colleagues that I work with uh, at Skift here in New York who have done last minute uh, bookings because they've got so much cabin fever. They've gone out to the TWA hotel at JFK and spent the weekend out there with their kids. So I think there's real opportunities for that kind of sort of localism. Lauren, up in Calderwood, I want to get back to how technology can get us back to um, a normal version of what we used to know with travel. Because, of course, uh, traveling by airplane was one of the main causes of how the coronavirus spread around the world. It certainly got a bad rap for that. Uh, and many people I know are afraid to get back on airplanes. Talk to us about how technology has improved uh, the flight experience uh, and, and made it actually safer to travel, uh, you know, and how, how, you know, just 
getting, getting on board is a much uh, safer health experience now because of the pandemic? Well, I mean, aviation and traveling by plane is one of the safest ways to travel um, and has always been uh, because of the safety accreditation and certification um, rules that are in place globally. Um, actually, the, the study that came out by many of the manufacturers that showed that actually it was a very low uh, risk of transmission of COVID uh, in aircraft is not due to any you know, increased or new procedures around their air filtering uh, systems, etc., but actually through their existing system. However, of course, in, in travel, the, the assumption is that you will be around crowds of people, and so you do need to make, take extra measures to improve, um, to ensure that, you know, risk of transmission is low. I think that an important thing to remember is while technology is an enabler of many things, it's not the only thing that has to be unlocked for, for travel to reopen and for people to feel safe. And one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing, and it's been touched on by some of these speakers, is that travelers are less fearful now, but actually more frustrated. And the reason that many uh, surveyed travelers are not traveling uh, especially internationally, is because they're worried about being quarantined unexpectedly or not being able to, or getting trapped somewhere. In fact, just yesterday, my father-in-law was unable to catch his flight because of um, the, a change in the in the testing requirements for the country he was traveling to. So we're, we're experiencing that uh, firsthand, all of us, the, the, the confusion and the, the frustration and actually to unlock that is not as much always a, a technology uh, question. In fact, when we speak about the technology that's being developed in, for health credentials, a key piece to that is a global registry of, of accredited health labs and a global registry of the entry requirements in an interoperable format so that when someone, a traveler is looking to go somewhere, that they're able to access what those entry requirements are in a very easily um, understandable way. And so, yes, technology can enable that, but that requires a, an enormous amount of global coordination, of public-private um, interaction and cohesion, so that, that private sector, industry, and governments are all speaking the same language and able to provide that seamless um uh, you know, the seamless experience for a traveler and technology can enable that, but it can't be solved just by technology alone. Right. So how important is it to have a standardized system uh, around the world? And is, is that even possible? Because on one hand, we have uh, the Qantas CEO saying, yes, you will have to have a vaccine before you fly on our airplanes. And uh, some countries require having a coronavirus test before you enter. Some countries require a quarantine period. Some countries don't require anything. Uh, and so people are just, I think, really confused more than anything about what are the standards? What do you have to do? Do I have to get a vaccine? Do I have to get a test? Do I have to quarantine? You know, how important, and, and, and again, is it even possible to have a standardized system in place? Uh, I think you raise a good point. I, I would maybe use harmonized rather than standardized. So you're never going to have a situation, especially with sovereign member state, you know, sovereign states, that they will be exactly the same rules for entry. That doesn't exist today with border entry and visa requirements, and that won't exist for uh, health passes and credentials. However, what works with the passport is that it's a harmonized system, that there are, sta there are standards for what a passport needs to look like, what a visa needs to look like, how they are used, and then government and industry can make their decisions on their level of risk acceptance accordingly and make the rules of entry. What needs to be, the, the part that needs to be standardized is the way in which people can an, access that information in the way that they can uh, share their information and, and understand the system. So it's, I, I think I'm using standards again, but harmonization of that process rather than uh, the exact same process in every single uh, country or, uh, you know, industry experience. Uh, Tom Jenkins, how might the lack of internationally agreed upon standards and measures to deal with future health crises impact the ability of the travel and tour tourism industry to offer a consistent product to consumers? Well, I mean, we, we don't offer a consistent product to consumers. That's part of the virtue of it. I'm sorry to retort quite like that, but um, the great virtue of tourism is its variety. Um, I think um, 
reassurance is going to be important. It's going to be vital. But um, I think, as people have mentioned before, that with a with a vaccine, I think that reassurance will exist. And I think um, we are uh, trying to plan for the last crisis uh, out of place here. I think what we shouldn't be doing is fighting our last battle. Uh, we need to initially to try and reassert confidence and get things going again. Now, whether that's through new products that pander to people's fears or whether it's old products that um, answer and address people's desires. It's really, uh, it's an open field in terms of discussion. But I think that we need to have a consistent um, a consistent line on this. I don't think it's ultra necessary. Uh, one thing's for certain is it's not unusual to have a vaccine before traveling. Um, any of us who go to equatorial regions know that you really have to have a vaccine before you travel. And um, this is not unusual at all. So I, I think this will be part of the new normal. Uh, I can see. Um, but uh, I, beyond that, I can't see a major change either in um, travel patterns or trip people's desires. Yeah, a good uh, point to bring up about the vaccines because I remember when I moved to China, I got maybe five or six rounds of vaccines before I moved there. And I think that's something that people forget when it comes to this uh, coronavirus vaccine, especially because there's been so much publicity around it. Uh, Balu Baja, I want to turn to you uh, again because, you know, tourism is about more than just people going on tropical vacations or not being able to go on tropical vacations this year. It does affect a lot of people's jobs. Uh, what kind of financial and political support is needed uh, for the tourism recovery industry? Again, uh, first of all, tourism is not the, I mean, the, uh, just, it's, it's, you cannot think about tourism like a foreign exchange, or you cannot think about tourism uh, like a job creation. Tourism is all together. Tourism is, means experience. Tourism means feel. Tourism means so socialization. So, uh, for example, I want to give just one example. Last week, I mean, the, uh, we organized Global Tourism Forum event in Istanbul. For the attend of the program in Istanbul, we received more than 1,000 people physically who wants to attend. So, if you want to get the information, it's easy to access right now with this technology. You can Google or you can do YouTube and get all information about the destination. But the tourism is like a feeling, like an experience. So we have to think just this. After then, as previously I said, the government, the, the major role of this coronavirus pandemic on the effects on tourism is directly related with the governments. Because like the Radisson said, uh, two minutes ago. So they are managing very well. All the hotel groups, all the private sector is managing very well the tourism, that the protocols. But the thing is, the most important thing is these protocols have to be, for example, if I am injected or if I am, I, I get the P all so right, the, it looks like we've we have lost our connection with Balut Baja, so I want to... In their mind. Yeah, we have to clear the mind of this complication that the, uh, some countries are creating in, in the tourist mind. So tourists are ready to fly, tourists are ready to eat, tourists are ready to shop. So th th this is the thing that I see. And the, on, on your question, what I see, uh, of course, we, we, we get lots of lots of loss on the i mean the decrease on the job creation during this pandemic so because the, tour, the the employees of the tourism sector is you can separate two one is the full-time the other is the part-time so all these part-time employees staff is fired or uh, they get the vacation etc etc so the government did some subsidies for them give half payments of their salaries etc but the, the most important thing is this cannot be continued like this so the governments, first of all, have to focus how they can uh, organize these standards of the airport when a tourist is coming a country. Because Radisson is ready to host the tourists, or Marriott is ready to host the tourists, or even a taxi driver is ready to host the tourists. But the thing is, all the tourists are not like the uh, all the infected the coronavirus, so the people are ready to travel. So this is this is my comments. Thank you very much. Julian Orozco, uh, 
you know, when the, when the pandemic is over, how do you see tourism, not just in Colombia, but in Latin America and worldwide, adapting to the needs and challenges that have arisen because of the pandemic, you know, one that's more responsible with the environment? Well, I think that the Latin America and Colombia, I have to say in particular, is well positioned for what we would call the post-pandemic type of tourism. I think several of you have mentioned that uh, there will be a increased interest in travel that uh, supposes a less level of contact among a high number of, of people. And that uh, relates to issues like nature travel. Uh, it was mentioned walking in the Santiago and Camino de Santiago and the, in the lost city, adventure travel, nature travel, those type of uh, activities that, uh, again, suppose a, a, a less contact with a, with a high number of people. So I think that the region in general, Latin America, is well positioned to attract those type of tourism. Uh, Colombia in particular is a country, a large, relatively large country, one million square kilometers. It's the size of Spain, France, and Portugal together with a, a variety of um, uh, ecosystems and, and different landscapes. But as you mentioned, one of the key elements um, of the future tourism will be sustainability. I think that there is a higher degree of uh, conscience by consumers that we need to better protect the, the planet. And I think that will be uh, maybe not the only, but a quite important uh, decision-making um, criteria for, for future travelers. And we need to, to enhance that discussion that is being made in different forums like the World Economic Forum at the UNWTO, WTTC, but we need to make sure that we put the right measures in place. We are actually uh, publishing in a week's time the first uh, sustainable tourism policy of Colombia. And we have really, really looked into detail uh, into the best practices, <coughs> both uh, of countries of the OECD, but also worldwide. And we really have to hope to have in place one of the best sustainable tourism policies that there exist and we are discussing their issues related to climate change the use of uh, non-conventional and renewable energy resources the administration of the water resource that is scarce uh, in different places and it's one of the challenges the world faces in the future we're talking about the the the, the disposing of um, solid residues of liquid residues, and finally, the protection and conservation of our biodiversity of flora and fauna. So I think that this will become an increasingly important issue that countries need to address. And uh, sustainability is no longer a philanthropy. It's no longer a responsibility for future regeneration, no longer love for nature. Of course, those are the issues that should inspire us to be sustainable. But sustainability has become a central, a crucial aspect of the competitiveness of different destinations. And I'm sure that the ones that invest in sustainability are better positioned to attract travelers from around the world. Federico Gonzalez, how can the sector ensure it is more resilient to crises in the future? It's on two things. One, one is the work we do ourselves. Okay, how 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 do we build more flexibility and how how do we become more uh, agile? Okay, into reacting to the different situations. I, I I mean I think the sector has been has been used for many for many years to be, if not full, fully occupied, nearly fully occupied. So now now I think we need to 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 build more flexibility in in the economics, uh, be more agile to change. And I think we have learned. How to do it painfully, okay? During this crisis, I think part of that knowledge on flexibility, how to adapt, will stay. But I, I think, uh, however, the the future of the sector also depends on the work that the institutions at global level do. I, I think uh, it has been mentioned before. Uh, if this crisis has shown something, and when we talk about flux, uh, sustainability, I think if we want to make the solution sustainable. We need the right global, regional, or whoever authority to talk with authority. 
uh, if you if you think, for example, the work that the WTTC organization has done with the standards of safety, I think has been fantastic. They have come with a lot of clarity saying these are the protocols we have checked, validated, and we advise these protocols to happen. And even the smallest hotel of the world, if they want, they can go to the WTTC uh, web, they can check the protocol. If they fulfill it, they will get the stamp. I, I think one of the still big questions on how sustainable the recovery will be is if, if we are able to get any organization to speak with clarity and with scientific support about the solutions. Because imagine that we get the vaccine, the, the vaccine, and one month into the vaccine, and once people feel there is no fear, news start to come of any kind. And then different regions take different measures. This is what is creating a huge confusion in the consumers. I mean, I'm, I'm today, for example, in Paris. The, the situation in Paris of what is open and closed is different to what is in London. It's completely different to what it was in Brussels, where I was last week. And it's absolutely different to what it is in Madrid. But the worst is not that, is that Madrid actually is different to Valencia or is different to Barcelona. So one of the things that I think is happening to the operators or to the, any economic operator and to the consumers is who on earth is taking which decisions based on what? And I think we as an industry, we need to try to get someone who would take one orientation that would make us consumers or uh, business people really have and, and, and believe that whatever decisions have some base. Because even with all the respect for the aviation, I read that I, I, I was safe to travel in a plane and that I would not con uh, contaminate it in a plane. That's why I keep traveling, by the way. You know, and then suddenly one airline says, well, if you don't get a vaccine, you will not get into my plane. So I wonder, hey, does he know something that the others do not know? Okay, it's, it's the same question when I travel from one country to the other one. So I think looking to the future, I think the hotel industry will do. And I think all the hotels uh, and I think more individual hotels will come to change to ask for support in operations and in safety and, 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 and in protocols. But I think unless one authority okay, uh, takes this seriously and start sending or proposing worldwide protocols or regional protocols, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not asking even for EEC protocols because I think the EEC has shown that they have no ability to come this time with a protocol that everybody will, will impose. But I, I think if we don't clarify this mess, uh, vaccine will not solve the issue, okay? After the vaccine, whatever, something will happen, a country will take whatever decisions and the consumer will be confused. So I think the global institutions or the regional institutions should take this more serious and agree to protocols or to measures that are science-based or judgment-based, but at least with transparency so the consumer can take the decisions or the, or the hotel companies can take decisions to invest. And, and I, I want to use the example of Turkey. We are very confident with, with, for example, all the measures and the approach that Turkey had this year. That's why, for example, in our five years plan, we have reinforced our bet in Turkey, and we want to grow even more than we, we, we have today. And I think more, more operators will do the same with those countries and destinations that take this seriously, shares concrete measures, and communicate those measures in the proper way to the key stakeholders. All right, and we are going to leave it there because we are completely out of time. I do want to thank my guests today, Julian Guerrero Orozco, Federico Gonzalez, Tom Jenkins, Lauren Uplink Calderwood, Tony Wheeler, Tom Lowry, and Balut Baja. Thank you to our panelists for joining us today on this discussion. And with that, I will conclude this panel and hand it over to TRT World's host of Showcase, Elif Barrichetli. Hello and welcome to TRT World Forum 2020's reflection session about the pandemic's effect on the art industry. Today, I will host important guests to discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the world of art.
to give us an overview about how the art industry is faring on the COVID-19 restrictions. Georgina Adam is here with me. She is the editor at large at the art newspaper. Hi, Georgina. So now, Hello. obviously the art world is in a crisis. But would you say that it is the worst crisis to ever hit the art world? Because in cinema, this is what uh, the experts say. Um, as far as the art world is concerned, um, I think that to say it's the worst, it's too early for us to be able to say it's the worst uh, crisis. Um, but we certain, because we have to wait for a little bit longer uh, to see exactly the full extent. But uh, what has it's hit terribly hard all aspects of dealing in art. I'm talking about the art market now. So it's hit art fairs dramatically bad. They've all been had to be closed and very few have actually held, been held in real life. Um, China, which of course went first into the pandemic, is beginning to come out. So there have been some art uh, fairs in the real life held there in Shanghai just recently. But um, the big ones here in Europe, in America, have all had to be postponed, moved. Uh, they've just, uh, in fact, cancelled um, the March edition of Art Basel Hong Kong. It's been moved to May. We're crossing fingers that'll be able to help. Uh, that'll be able to be held. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, this has a big impact <laughs> on art galleries because a lot of art galleries make. Um, sometimes 50, 60, 70 percent of their annual turnover at art fairs. And of course, they've gone. Um, as far as the art fairs are concerned, they have um, put, they've used, they've gone digital. They're using um, what they call OVRs, online viewing rooms, as a way of art dealers to show their wares. But it's proved not very successful at all. Art dealers say that they make perhaps 25% of the sales through OVRs that they would have made in real life. Mm -hmm. So the art galleries have been terribly badly hit. Auctions as well have been hit because um, they've had to go, they've had to move massively online. And we don't know the final figures yet, but we suspect that um, auction sales will be down by over 30% this year compared to next year. So the picture isn't great. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, art galleries are surviving, auction, auctions are surviving, and just all crossing our fingers that things will go better towards probably halfway through next year. Okay, Georgina, this was really helpful. Thank you so much for going uh, one by one on the different elements of the art world. But um, I want to focus on galleries for a second. Do you think they are hit the worst by uh, the pandemic? Because according to Art Newspaper's recent survey, 75% of medium and small galleries could close or um, face severe hardship. Um, it's not easy to say all galleries, because galleries come in all shapes and sizes. So you go from the very big mega galleries like Gagosian or Pace or Hauser & Wirth. They're huge. They have networks around the world. Uh, they have sacked people. There's no doubt. There's been sackings everywhere. But then you go from these big galleries right through to the very small galleries, the ones that are just basically a gallerist, perhaps his girlfriend, perhaps one or two employees. Um, and so obviously it is very different for them. What I think has been very difficult for the smaller and the medium sized galleries is that um, selling online, if they sell less known artists, lesser known artists, they've got less presence online. The big galleries are selling artists who've got a presence already. You know, they've had cultural validation either through museum shows or through biennales. So these are better known artists and it's e easier to sell them online. So I do think that the, the smaller and the mid-sized galleries are the most threatened by this crisis. So as far as I understand, you're saying that big actors will stay and the small ones and the medium-sized ones will go and the gap will really widen. I mean, obviously, I'm generalizing here a little bit, but um, do you think this will be the case, more or less? No, I think that that is too... I mean, for the, the very big ones, there really are only about five or six in the world. Um, and I don't think all the small and medium will go. Uh, but I think that it will amplify a trend that we'd already seen, 
I mean, this crisis is amplifying a lot of trends, but a trend that we've seen is that there have been smaller galleries closing or smaller gallerists possibly moving into a bigger gallery, working, closing their own space and working for a bigger gallery. And I think this will happen more. They're not all going to go, obviously not. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be terrible. It would be terrible for the art world. It would be terrible for artists. But I think we will see some of the smaller and medium ones close. And I think that the big ones will survive, but everybody's operations will be a bit smaller for a while. Okay. Well, there, there is so much to uh, talk about here, but unfortunately we have limited time. So I want to talk about whether you see recovery in the foreseeable future for the art world. So recovery in the foreseeable future in the art world or anywhere in any other sector of business is obviously going to depend on, on the vaccine. And until people can travel again, until shops can open, until gyms, until everybody, the hospitality industry, until everyone can reopen, we really can't say. Um, so I think... The art world is in the same situation mm -hmm. as the rest of the world, waiting to see how soon we can safely go out, open, travel, go to museums, go to art galleries and just live the life we had before. And whether that life that we had before will ever come back in the form we knew it before. Exactly. So you said, for example, is that China is beginning to come out of uh, the restrictions. So, for example, do you think that it is easy for them to just go back to what the normal art world was before COVID-19 or um, will we need all around the world more state funding and more funds really just to come back to what the normal was? I think that the museum world is going to need state help. You can't allow museums to die. It's just not possible. And they've been terribly badly hit. And remember that museums also bring tourists here in London, somewhere like the National Gallery. I think 65% of its visitors are from abroad or were from abroad before the crisis. So there has to be state support. And, um, you know, here in the UK, I'm speaking to you from the UK, we have a furlough system. So mm -hmm. people are paid uh, e even if their job, their, their place of work is closed. And we really won't see the full impact until the furlough system comes to the end. Sadly, I think a lot of jobs are going to go in the art world. All right, Georgina Adam, I really appreciate it. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have, but thank you so much. To talk about the future of museums, curator and writer Vasif Korten joins me now. Hi, thanks a lot for being with us today on TRT World Forum. So, obviously, the art world is in a crisis moment at the moment. Is it a bad thing? Are you anxious about the breakdown or are you one of those people who are cheering on it because the old normal wasn't sustainable anyways? Well, I don't know if the old normal was sustainable or not. I mean, that's a longer discussion, perhaps. Uh, but I'm also not rushing to decisions uh, because of the crisis itself, which will be over in a few months. Um, so I would rather not make very large statements about it at this, at, this, at this particular time. Whatever was wrong with the art world, uh, it's been wrong for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Especially museum. Okay, what would that be? Because a lot of people are voicing this concern about art world needing a break, really needing an interruption, and this COVID nineteen restrictions being that you know savior for a lot of people. I don't know if you'd agree or not. Well, I mean, I I wouldn't put it this way because many people were put out of their jobs. Many people have lost their jobs. Installers, translators, designers, uh, back office people. You know, it was it's a huge ecology. It's actually it's a huge economy, and this this huge economy has been disrupted, which is very very serious. People because people can't take home uh, bread. Yes, this is one aspect. Uh, so that's something we really, I think, have to talk about on the side. The second aspect, I mean, may, perhaps the larger part, is that this is not a global situation. 
uh, COVID-19 has uh, basically bypassed the, all of uh, Sub-Sahara. The there are also institutions there. There are also contemporary art practices there. Uh, there are also museums there. Uh, it hasn't affected certain parts of the world as hard as it has affected India, US, Turkey, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, uh, there are many countries in the world that has uh, truly public support for, the, for its institutions, such as Germany and, and quite a few others, or, or South Korea. You know, and these is the institutions in these countries have not been affected either. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about something which is which is really global, but the people who are speaking about it, who are talking about it, as usual, as it has always been the case, are talking from a US and UK <laughs> perspective. And I'm I'm kind of tired of this yeah. uh, because it kind of throws a cover all, all over the world, which is a cover that's not really uh, the world is not really deserving that. Um, that being said, you know, the art world is a huge ecology. You know, museums are only a small part of it. There are initiatives, uh, contemporary art centers, smaller institutions, under the radar institutions, uh, artists initiatives, and et cetera, et cetera. This is really what I'm much more interested in. And that's the part of the art world that is really the buttress, the, the the, the, the fundamentals of the of the art world. Okay. And that art world has been affected radically. Okay. These are really good points. Thanks a lot. Let's break it down one by one together. Thanks a lot for bringing that post-colonial perspective because this is what we're trying to do here as well. Uh, you know, it's not only about what's happening in Europe and the US. But as for museums, would you say that this has been a time period where the importance of state funding has been highlighted in the museums that have been in trouble? Absolutely. You know, uh, without st in the institutions that had no state funding or very little state funding or very little endowment uh, are in crisis. Uh, more. Uh, and but I mean I should I should also say that the, the malaise, if we may say it so, about the art world that it always lives in the present time, uh, the museum practice these days. It tries to save the day constantly. It really does not have a long term plan. It doesn't have a big horizon. Um, so in terms of um, you know, in terms of its exhibition practices, in terms of um, getting the money, it's always year to year and year to year, year to year. So there is really, without a horizon, without a place to go to, without uh, getting your fundamental needs uh, or addressing your fundamental needs in the long term, we have been kind of the, the, the prisoner of the present present time. And that's the fundamental reason of the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, because the present has, it's like a carpet that's been pulled uh, from under you. And the present suddenly said, you know, your audience is going to go down to 25% of what it was last year. Uh, <laughs> your shipping costs are going to be four times as much. Your insurance is going to be complicated. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I can list all of these things, and then suddenly you're in this kind of uh, economic uh, crunch, you know, downturn. But this is much more so for uh, larger institutions in tourist cities, yeah, mm -hmm. because they rely 20, 25 percent, maybe more, on on uh, on uh, revenue from attendance. Uh, what about institutions that don't really rely so much on uh, revenues on uh, attendance? Mm -hmm. You know, smaller t smaller towns, smaller institutions, smaller okay. museums. This is uh, this is a good point. Sorry to cut you off there, but I really want to talk about attendance and audience going down. Uh, the role of the local community is rising at the moment, and I think huge institutions actually are realizing that they need people and their local uh, community to survive. Do you think this will potentially lead to more approachable and relevant projects? 
Look, I mean, if you are built as a uh, as a general audience uh, institution catering to massive tourist uh, capacity, uh, and if you are in those centers or, or in those power corridors in the world, you never. I mean, local audience is an afterthought. It's secondary. It's, it cannot be fundamental. Uh, your fundamental audience. And by look, and, and the idea of a local audience uh, means a different kind of programming. I don't mean provincializing your uh, practice, but it needs, a, it needs a different vision. And I hope, and I mean, I hope at least in part, uh, certain institutions will take that into consideration. In any way, they have to dig deep into their uh, collections to save the day mm -hmm. uh, for the next one, two, three years. And it's going to be collection. Boss, if this is an interesting point. Do you think relying more on collections will mean that we will see less blockbuster shows? Um, if you are, a, if you have a fantastic and deep collection, you can still do a blockbuster. <laughs> uh, if, you, if your collection is, is, is a little bit weaker and more, let's say, local, um, you won't do a blockbuster. You cannot do a blockbuster. Which is, I, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not propagating, I'm not promoting uh, blockbusters here, obviously. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, but don't forget, you know, the moment. COVID goes, the moment money begins to flow, the moment economy runs, give it, you know, a year, give it two years, it's going to be back to blockbusters for sure. Well, that is an interesting point, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Let's talk about it another time. Pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. To hear an artist's perspective, let's turn to Tom Young. Hello there. It's good to have you with us on TRT World Forum today. So, Hello. why don't you tell us how you were affected as an artist by COVID-19? Well, I mean, in many ways. Um, I mean, both positively and obviously the, the negative effects on, uh, you know, the city that I live in, Beirut, um, which is already going major and political crisis. Um, so, you know, the coronavirus has just hit, hit the city so, so hard. Um, and so there's a lot of suffering around. Um, um, and, you know, I'm aware of that. And of course, as an artist, I, I pick up on the energy that's around me um, and use my art to, to channel that. Mm -hmm. um, but on a, on a, I think on a personal level, um, it had a kind of quite a positive effect on me as an artist in that um, <laughs> I had a lot more peace and quiet. I mean, Beirut is often a really loud, busy city, you know, with construction, beeping horns, you know. Um, so there was a lot more peace and calm and much less pollution, much cleaner air. Um, and just more time to reflect, more time to think, more time to sort of notice the change in the seasons, you know, the beautiful sort of phases of the moon from my rooftop terrace in the middle of Beirut. And a time to sort of reflect on the, you know, the sort of beauty of Mother Nature. Um, you know, as you see behind me, you know, the famous cedar trees of Lebanon. Um, so I was... Yeah, I, I think it, it changed my work. Um, my work had been uh, going through a very political phase mm -hmm. with the uh, with the attempted revolution in Lebanon that began last October 2019, um, where there were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets, um, you know, protesting uh, against the dreadful corruption. Um, and uh, in in amongst the political elites and demanding change, and they, you know, I was I was immensely inspired by energy. So I was painting, you know, scenes of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on the streets, um, protesting and partying. You know, mm -hmm. in that sort of true Lebanese spirit, there was a lot of 
I mean, the atmosphere was 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 really sort of positive as well as angry. Um, okay, Tom. So, sorry, sorry to cut you off there, but I'm curious about whether you um, kept painting political, uh, you know, artworks even after COVID nineteen. Yeah, well, I think I did. I mean, I mean, I instead of painting streets full of people, I was painting streets. So I was painting absence, the absence of life, um, and that in itself, you know, is is it's recording a, a social moment, um, a feeling of emptiness, absence, and also concentrating on other subjects like surveillance cameras. Um, I think that COVID's 19 and, and, and the isolation um, has made us all obviously much more dependent on digital technology, uh, such as using right now. Um, so that I became aware of, of this sense that, in, in, you know, we're all being watched um, and has sinister Im implications for the future. Um, and so some of the paintings included uh, paintings of CCTV cameras um, sort of scanning empty streets. Um, and then I was sort of painting shadows on the streets as if there is a presence of something, but we're not quite sure what it is. So it's, it could be a spirit, yeah, someone watching us. Um, so I think, yeah, my, my work on different, different subjects. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, I mean, we've been talking about COVID-19, of course, but I wonder how you were affected by the explosions in particular as well. I mean, you mentioned it briefly, but how have you responded to the explosions by your art? Yeah, suddenly, you know, out of this quiet came this moment of trauma um, that came out of nowhere. And so it was a for everyone and everyone people in the city are still traumatized so yeah to press my own i live in the area so this example was smashed to pieces that i um and i lucky i went out that and otherwise i may well have been injured or killed so the explosion sign, the destruction on the streets, and trying to um, those feelings of anger and grief, uh, and something um, to share with. We can share our pain. You know, a, attempt at some kind of healing. Um, it, it, yeah, I think art can play a part in the healing process from whether it's COVID-19 or the crisis or the explosion, all of these different catastrophes can be channeled through art um, and painting, you know, as, as an artist, I can continue working as usual, um, whether there's a pandemic or not. Um, yeah, having but, said um, that, I mean, would I'm you... Sorry, do you have any plans for uh, when the restrictions are, if they're ever lifted once again? Well, well, I actually um, opened a big exhibition, you know, just after the explosion and before the new lockdown. So this for about three weeks in a beautiful old Turkish hammam. Uh, of Beirut. It is a place of healing. Symbolically, the history of this building is um, it's been empty and disused until now. Cultural sense. Yeah, you know, Muslims and Christians and everyone else are welcome. Um, I mean, this is my response is to do something hopefully positive. And, um, you know, people are coming, children are coming, orphans are coming, refugee kids are coming, um, Lebanese people are coming. 
uh, to this exhibition in the Hammam. Um, and yeah, and, and, and begin the process of, of, of some kind of positive response, you know, reconstruction. And, and I'm also involved with projects in Beirut mm -hmm. to restore actual damaged buildings um, and to do projects and exhibitions in these places. Um, Lovely. To bring, bring them back to life again and spread some positive energy. Lovely. Out, um, that we can do. All right, Tom Young, it was lovely uh, having you with us on TRT World Forum today. Thanks a lot. That's it from me, Elif Pereketli, for now on TRT World Forum. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and sharing their thoughts with us on how the art world was affected by the pandemic. Whether it is the beginning or the end of an era in contemporary art, what will happen to small and mid-sized galleries, and whether digital is actually the feature for the art world. TRT World Forum 2020 will continue to discuss shifting dynamics, the international order, in a post-pandemic world. Do stay with us. assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. of Europe from the virus continues to rise at an alarming rate. The U.S. now has more reported cases of the coronavirus than any other country in the world. Turkey has delivered personal protective equipment to the United States. Turkey has delivered the medical equipment to three of Europe's worst hit countries. Doctors say treating COVID-19 is like piecing together a potentially deadly jigsaw puzzle.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session on the second and final day of the TRT World Forum 2020. I'm Oscar Sabakti, anchor of TRT World's international business program, Money Talks. I hope you've been enjoying the forum so far. We'll now be taking the discussion further with this next session called COVID-19, an impasse or an opportunity for a sustainable global order. Well, the world continues to be faced with a profound crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This extraordinary situation poses a major challenge for governments and multilateral organisations by deepening inequalities between developing and developed economies, giving a boost to nationalist ideologies and disrupting global supply chains and economic relations. The crisis has exposed the failings and shortcomings of existing local and international institutions in protecting people in the face of both natural and human-made disasters. Although the current crisis is still playing out, it's increasingly clear the pandemic is advancing the call for a reordering of global institutions. But the direction of this transformation remains an open question. This session explores the potential pathways that global economic and political institutions may take in the near future and how policymakers can turn the COVID-19 crisis into an opportunity for positive reform. Well, to discuss these issues and more, it's now my pleasure to introduce our panel of esteemed speakers. Gamal Mohamed Hassan is Somalia's Minister of Planning, Investment and Economic Development. Prior to this, he served as the country's ambassador to Kenya. Before joining government, he was a political specialist to the US Special Representative for Somalia. He has also worked for the Government of Canada and Carleton University in Ottawa. And Celso Amorim is Brazil's longest serving Minister of Foreign Relations and also served as Minister of Defence. A career diplomat, Mr Amorim remains active in academic life and as a public figure. He was a visiting fellow at Harvard Kennedy School and a distinguished fellow at King's College in 2009. Foreign Policy magazine referred to him as the world's best foreign minister. Karen Kniesel is Austria's former foreign minister. Ms Kniesel joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1990, serving in Paris and Madrid, as well as the ministry's legal office. In 1998, she left the Foreign Service to work as an analyst. Since then, she has authored several books on geopolitics and the Middle East and has lectured at various top universities. Masamichi Kono is Deputy Secretary General of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. Mr Kono currently oversees initiatives on infrastructure and sustainable growth and also represents the OECD at the Financial Stability Board. He previously served as a vice minister at Japan's Financial Services Agency and was a committee secretary at the World Trade Organization. G. John Eikenberry is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. Professor Eikenberry also serves as a global eminence scholar at Kyung Hee University in Seoul and is a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a former advisor to the State Department and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on US-European Relations. And Akim Steiner is the Administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Mr Steiner is also the Vice Chair of the UN Sustainable Development Group. He previously served as Head of the United Nations Environment Program, Director General of the UN Office at Nairobi, and Director General of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, Mr Steiner, if I could begin with you first. Uh, you have worked for many years in a multilateral environment in the United Nations and many organisations. But historically, when we are faced with crises such as a pandemic or an economic crisis, uh, for that matter, in this case, we're experiencing both, uh, they often lead to ch reforms, changes and even a paradigm shift. Is that your view? Might we see a, a fundamental change 
in the way the international global order is currently taking place uh, when this pandemic is finally over. Thank you, Askan. It's a great pleasure and honor to join you and such a distinguished panel. And at a moment like this, you quite rightly pose the question, is there a fundamental change that appears on the horizon or are we really in a mode of crisis management trying to get back to where we were before? And I think COVID-19 has not yet changed the future. That is quite clear. I think we are in the midst of a terrible and sometimes terrifying struggle of how to balance the containment of a virus with that economic freefall that is happening across the world. And in many ways, what COVID has done is it has revealed a great deal. And I think it is out of that understanding and appreciation of inequality, of vulnerability, of unpreparedness, and also of a relationship between people and the planet, that I think there will be significant shifts towards a different kind of future. And it is difficult to imagine that right now because we are simply in crisis management and the stimulus packages that you see at the moment only have, let's say, glimpses of what the future may look like in different terms. But just take the issue of climate change and green recovery. Compared to where we were perhaps in December 2019, I think it is fair to assume that we will see greater action on climate change, greater investments in green recovery than we perhaps would have expected in the political reality of 2019. Digitalization is another area that has you know, been fast forwarded significantly. Connectivity, the digital gap, but also closing it, creating entirely new opportunities for development, for addressing poverty, for addressing the economy of the future. These are just two glimpses of possibilities, but I think much of it will depend on how people in countries across the world are engaging with governments to look at different futures. So from the perspective of an economic development paradigm, I believe that there will be very significant changes. And history teaches us that out of deep crises, usually come big transformations. And you know, one example being the United Nations, it celebrates its 75th anniversary. It was born in the midst of the darkest moment of the 20th century. So we do need to look forward. That is why I believe firmly that building forward better will become a guiding motto for, I think, virtually every citizen across the planet. But the risk is that we always go back to where we were before, and that, that remains a very real risk. Hmm. Minister Hassan, if I could turn to you now. Somalia recently benefited from a couple of multilateral institutions, namely the World Bank and IMF, because in March, before the pandemic really took over the world, um, Somalia was granted some significant debt relief, and Somalia had been calling for that for quite some time. Do you still have faith that multilateral institutions like the IMF and the World Bank still have a role in terms of helping emerging economies such as Somalia's? Uh, thank you very much, Oscar. Uh, very pleased to be joining this team with uh, panelists. Uh, very good question. Uh, you're right, Somalia reached the decision point uh, in, in the process, the IMF process, the, the SMP process, which we have been uh, going through over the last few years. We reached them a milestone in March, right before, uh, in the middle of, as soon as the pandemic hit uh, globally. Uh, this process helped us reform the country, uh, the institutions of the country uh, over the last few years. Uh, when we reached that point, which meant that uh, Somalia was able to access grants from the IMF and the World Bank and African Development Bank and other institutions, uh, the global pandemic hit Somalia like um, uh, like uh, the rest of the world, and we're still hopeful that despite these challenges, Somalia will continue to benefit from these multilateral institutions. Uh, definitely, uh, we would see more uh, access, uh, not only for Somalia, but for uh, the developing countries, access to, to finance. Uh, there have been uh, discussions in the recent G20 uh, that took place in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. So. The discussions are ongoing, but we're hopeful that uh, despite these challenges, uh, we'll be able to benefit a lot going forward. Mm. Celso Amorim, and as I mentioned, you served, uh, you were officially known as uh, the longest serving foreign minister is in Brazil. I should point out that you served as foreign minister under previous administrations, but I'm wondering, as a Brazilian citizen, looking at your current leadership under President Jair Bolsonaro, who really has questioned uh, the validity of some international 
organisations. He's questioned uh, the way things are currently done uh, in terms of uh, not only in Brazil but uh, around the world. Uh, what's your view on Brazil's path right now under Bolsonaro? Do you think we can see uh, Bolsonaro perhaps uh, emulate what Donald Trump has done by pulling out of organisations such as uh, the World Health Organisation? Uh, well, I think in our case, sometimes the, the bark is, is stronger than the bite. In any case, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure also with such distinguished colleagues, including an Austrian foreign minister. I, I studied in the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, so I would like to mention that. Uh, let me just say, uh, we are living under totally abnormal times in Brazil. I mean, I've served different governments. I was foreign minister with a left, center of left uh, president, President Lula, for eight years and with President Dilma for four years. And before that, I had been with a more centrist government, and I have been ambassador also with a, well, you would call a center, maybe center right, center left, I am not sure, depends on how you look at it, governments in the past, as ambassador at the UN and, and, and WTO and so on. So, and I never felt that I was, uh, uh, let us say, being, I, I, I never felt a violence uh, against my convictions to serve under those governments. They had maybe different leanings. One were more keen or keener, more keen on social reform, on a more independent foreign policy, so to say, uh, more South-South cooperation as the last governments which I, with which I served and to whose party I do belong. Uh, so this is my view. But even if, the, if I compare with the other governments that I served as ambassador or in which as I served as a career diplomat in the past, Never, even during the middle dictatorship, Brazil had such an abnormal government, which is a poor imitation of Trumpism. So I only can say that I hope, when Trump was elected, actually I said that the worst thing about Trump for Latin America, at least, is the example. So I hope the fact that he was defeated, not that I have fantastic hopes about Biden, but I hope we're, go we're coming to a more normal times and that will also bring Latin America and Brazil to more normal times. And in, in more normal times, it means also more attachment to multilateral, uh, multilateral area, more attachment to, inter, uh, to Latin American integration, more attachment to the idea of multipolarity as a basis for multilateralism. Mm. Karen Knisel, can I move on to you uh, next? You were foreign minister in Austria and in a, a center right wing government. Uh, previously, you've been critical of leaders such as uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who's seen as a great supporter of multilateral institutions. Do you still have faith that these organisations still have a role, particularly in this uh, pandemic and post-pandemic world? Well, uh, to, um, thank you very much, first of all, also for the invitation and um, delighted to be in the same panel as former minister Zezo Amorim. Uh, so uh, regarding the role of bilateralism and multilateralism, having been teaching this topic also over the past two, three decades, uh, it didn't start yesterday. It has really developed at least over the last 20 years. Uh, the eminence of bilateralism. We just have to look at the development inside the World Trade Organization. Ever since 2004, ever since the Doha Round talks and their breakdown, uh, bilateralism has been moving on to the detriment of multilateralism. It started with the trade agreements and it has ended up in all different fora of diplomacy. And uh, the problem with today's uh, craft of diplomacy, I wouldn't even dare to talk about the art of diplomacy because only a handful of people still master the very old art. But the craft of diplomacy is about seeking for consensus. It's about not polarizing. And we are today, unfortunately, in all sectors of international relations, not only in positions of right or wrong, it's about good and bad. It's a highly polarized world. And in such a climate, it has become very difficult to bridge rifts um, and to talk to each other. Uh, having been a career diplomat, having stepped out for 20 years and coming back uh, in particular to the 
European Union way of decision shaping and decision making, I was uh, deeply intrigued and irritated by the fact uh, that we do not anymore use proper tools of diplomacy, which is time, building of trust, and really talking to each other and putting oneself into the position of the other. What we have seen over the last 20 years, unfortunately, is a rise in unilateral position pronunciation. Uh, it's, 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 uh, we, we, we do not really call each other. We make our unilateral positioning via a press communique, via a tweet, via a post. And uh, the, uh, the bilateral or the even multilateral decision shaping is losing ground. It has been eroded. And, uh, this, and then up to that, you have to bring in the, the whole financial issue. How many countries are still able to finance the general budget? What is financed over special program budgets? And which countries can then thereby um, play their interests also to a certain extent? Uh, there, there is a tremendous change going on in the multilateral world. Um, the, the role of traditional contributors, such as the European Union, such as North American countries, is losing ground uh, to other players. We have other international organizations, big regional organizations, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, which has been in the shadow for the last 20 years. But I always uh, told students and I always had a careful eye to what is happening in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And uh, this is a place where a lot is going on. And um, to my analysis, it's not really uh, taken to the extent serious that it should be taken by, for instance, various EU uh, member states. So uh, we see a more regional multilateralism uh, arising. We see a lot of bilateralism, but ab above that, unilateralism. And each and every one plays it, in particular mm. also within the European Union. Yes, uh, Masa Michi Kono, I'd like to bring you into this discussion now because you are Deputy Secretary, Secretary General of the OECD, an intergovernmental economic organisation which mainly uh, represents nations uh, that are relatively high income countries. It does exclude major economies such as China, for example, which is now the world's second largest economy. Uh, it excludes uh, some significant emerging economies uh, such as India, uh, Brazil. So I, I want to sort of reflect on what uh, Karen Kniesel just said. Uh, when organizations like the OECD are seen as an exclusive uh, membership uh, organization, do you believe that after this pandemic, perhaps, organizations like yours might reconsider uh, their membership structures and be more inclusive of those uh, other emerging nations, which really are now quite significant economies. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my uh, great uh, honor and pleasure to be here today with you. And um, before I uh, um, try to answer your question, um, just um, as background, um, the OECD uh, just published its um, economic, uh, most recent economic outlook. Uh, and in that outlook, actually, we um, have a few uh, observations and findings to uh, present. And uh, um, in this context, um, uh, we do um, acknowledge that um, while the pandemic is the first fully global um, crisis since the world uh, since World War Two. Um, uh, international cooperation has been weakened in recent years, and uh, that um, um, we must um, find ways to um, restore uh, uh, and um, reinforce. Um, international cooperation in um, all areas, not just healthcare, but uh, um, um, all across uh, our um, uh, economic policies and uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, development finance and so on. But um, there are um, signs of hope. And uh, first, I, at the OECD, the, our ministers actually agreed for the first time in four years to um, uh, actually work towards uh, this goal of building back back better and uh, uh, enabling a um, global, a strong, resilient, inclusive and sustainable recovery 
from COVID-19 and uh, um, that uh, uh, we should uh, uh, work together in areas, um, uh, uh, for example, uh, such as science and technology. And in fact, um, what I, um, in response to your question, um, the OECD uh, works much more with our um, non-members uh, than before and, uh, and perhaps uh, it is not uh, well known, but China, India, uh, Brazil, they all uh, come to our committees um, um, uh, to uh, uh, join the discussions. We also have uh, 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 joint work programs with many countries, including uh, countries such as Indonesia. Um, and uh, um, actually, when um, you were discussing Brazil, actually Brazil is now applying for membership with the OECD. And uh, with China, uh, we continue to um, uh, uh, engage and uh, they take part in uh, some of the key uh, uh, committees uh, that we have. So um, the OECD itself is now um, trying to uh, um, develop global standards which will be adopted by a much uh, a much uh, a wider uh, range of countries than our uh, membership uh, but having said that of course our members are key in actually making those standards and um, uh, policy guidances recommendations um, strong and also of course all in the uh, um, um, in support of multilateralism and and so of course um, uh, um, they are uh, bilateral uh, plurilateral um, and uh, regional uh, uh, initiatives but at the same time uh, we would really want to call on countries to um, uh, strengthen uh, our uh, multilateral framework and to build on what we actually have uh, have built um, over the years uh, with a lot of uh, effort um, um, and uh, um, make this uh, recovery really, uh, as I mentioned, um, strong, uh, resilient, inclusive and sustainable. Thank you. Professor Eikenberry, uh, even before this pandemic uh, began, there was one man who really did look to blow up the international order, and that was the outgoing US President Donald Trump. Uh, he pulled the US out of, say, the, uh, the Paris Climate Change Accord. He's pulling the US out of the World Health Organization. He's, cri he's criticized other UN organizations as well. Uh, of course, John, uh, Joe Biden will be the next US president, so presumably he will reverse those decisions. But do you believe that such uh, an act from Trump was needed to perhaps shake things up a little and really force these multilateral organizations to, I guess, display their worth, really clarify to the public why these organizations are needed? First of all, thank you for including me. This, this is a terrific panel, and the, in some sense, the most important question of the day is really before us. Uh, the answer to your question, I think, is no. I don't think that uh, Trump was necessary. I think that, in fact, uh, he's taken us as a country and as a global system down a very dangerous road. I, 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 uh, as you just mentioned, uh, the U.S. has, under his watch, uh, pulled out of international institutions, uh, made itself less of a leader uh, in all the different zones of international uh, cooperation, arms control, environment, uh, uh, human rights, uh, economic uh, relations. So I think uh, we have seen in some sense uh, an experiment of how the world operates when uh, the most powerful country in the world doesn't tie itself to to the global system. And so I do think uh, there will be a, a some um, lesson drawing that we can take a kind of a cold comfort from perhaps, but we will be able to draw some less lessons from the Trump administration for how we move forward. I think for the United States, uh, there's a sense that uh, the US over these four years has become less uh, influential, less respected, less uh, vital to problem solving. And so uh, I do also think that uh, President-elect uh, uh, Biden knows that. Uh, if, is a, if, you might, if you say a kind of true believer in the, the longer term American approach to international relations that we trace back to the dark days of World War II of building and putting its weight behind building international institutions 
uh, uh, seen its own national interest advanced through uh, commitments uh, with other countries, alliances, multilateral institutions, uh, um, doing well by doing good. Uh, and that uh, overall 75-year uh, playbook, I think, is, is needed more than ever. Uh, so I do think uh, we have uh, seen ourselves come off and look over the cliff, and we, what we see down below is something we, we want to avoid. Uh, and so uh, my uh, fervent hope is that the new administration will uh, redouble an American interest in diplomacy, multilateralism, cooperative security, uh, global problem solving. Uh, and if you look finally uh, at the world today beyond the, the COVID, you see um, uh, really a, a emerging geopolitical uh, 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 drama unfolding with the rise of China. And the United States cares a lot about that. There's a lot at stake. It's not just power politics. It's also about values and what kind of international order we want to give to our children and grandchildren. And that uh, struggle, you might say, for the world, for how we uh, build a better world, uh, could be a kind of motivation, as it was in the 1950s and 60s, for a uh, competitive um, race to the top as opposed to racing to the bottom. And uh, so I think uh, while we're at a kind of dark moment, uh, like other dark moments in world history, there is a kind of silver lining that we should search for and try to to encourage. Uh, Mr. Steiner, the UN Development Program, which you had, wasn't in Donald Trump's line of fire, but most other UN organizations were, including the World Trade Organization, uh, various climate change initiatives that fall under the UN's purview, as well as the World Health Organization. I'm curious, as someone who has close contacts with, with people in those organizations. Was there a genuine fear among uh, people within the UN uh, organization as a whole about the threat that Donald Trump posed to uh, not only the UN, but also multilateralism in general? Well, Oscar, I think as my fellow panelists have already alluded to, um, multilateralism is a constantly evolving organism. And I think the the reality is that we live through many periods. Remember the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I mean, there are periods in which polarization, different views, um, the willingness or um, unwillingness of nations to work together through the United Nations platform have been with us before. And while President Trump was a particular voice, I think it is more the concern that a you know real world power of the significance and magnitude of the United States would continue to withdraw from the United Nations. At the end of the day, the effectiveness of the United Nations is principally determined by the willingness of countries to use that instrument, to be committed to it, because it ultimately makes sense to them. And I think clearly for us, beginning with the Secretary General, when he um, took up his office, the first priority was not to let the politics of the day um, essentially weaken a fundamental and 75 year long relationship with the United States. That is not a singular relationship, but it is a critical part of the way that, first of all, in global security policy, the Security Council either is able to operate or not operate. And I think what you have seen because of a very polarized view within the United States that expresses itself across many different arenas and the UN fora and platforms and mechanisms were only one segment, I think, of the current administration's view of taking the US um, out of, of these arenas. I think we have actually been able to maintain a very constructive relationship with the United States. And I think in the new administration, you see that pendulum swing back. And I think what is quite clear and what this period has taught us is that the United Nations is vital for the smallest nations because they have a seat in that General Assembly Hall they have a voice. They're often overlooked, small island states, poorer countries. That is one vital function. At the same time, the superpowers must believe in the value of the United Nations. And as my fellow panelists have said, there are flaws. Um, but I think the idea of the United Nations inherently remains even more relevant. And that is why you see a new administration returning into the international arena and hopefully also with new impulses to evolve 
the instruments, the institutions and the agendas for cooperation, cybercrime, climate change, pandemics, extremism. Uh, I mean, you could go on if ever there was an age where we needed an institution, not singularly, because cooperation happens at many levels, um, regional, um, bilateral, but ultimately the challenges we face right now are fundamentally dependent on collective action. And that is why I believe the incoming administration will provide a very positive impulse and we will see a number of critical steps to um, bring the multilateral uh, agendas up to date and into a modus operandi that allows the world to find more common ground than that which divides it. And that has always been the assumption underlying these institutions. There will be failures along the way. We will have elections. There will be extreme positions. Um, Celso Amorim spoke about the current administration in Brazil. But that's why I want to remind people 75 years is quite a long time. And this ingenious construct of an international body where every nation is heard and represented, I think remains even more important today than perhaps after the Second World War. Minister Hassan, you're a leader in Somalia, which is considered a low income emerging economy. Do you believe that countries like yours uh, do have a voice uh, on the world stage? Uh, Mr. Steiner mentioned that every country is treated equally in forums such as the UN General Assembly, but in almost uh, every other organisation out there, countries like Somalia don't have a seat at the table. Do you think a, a change is long overdue, that countries like Somalia should be recognised more in an official capacity and have membership to other international and multilateral organisations? Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the call for reform in the international uh, institutions have been, has been reverberating across the global uh, the developing world. Uh, having said that, uh, there's no substitute uh, for the multilateralism to unilateralism. Uh, we have seen uh, what's happening now uh, in many parts of the world, the populism and, and, and the change of uh, critical uh, policies, the withdrawal of the U.S. from the uh, uh, the Paris Club, uh, I mean, uh, from the climate uh, uh, change conference. Uh, what's really undeniable and that the pandemic has exposed now is the fact that these multinational institutions will only be uh, or will be more responsive to the needs of the low income countries when more of their top management and the decision makers are more intimate understanding of the situations on the ground. Have been, um, as a Somali, uh, come from uh, Somalia, I think we can see that here on the ground in Somalia. We have very strong relationship with the UN uh, and many other institutions, but sometimes it takes a while uh, to have the real impact of these institutions on the people uh, when a uh, crisis like this pandemic or poverty or a famine or uh, I mean, a drought or uh, issues like the climate change related issues take place. So it's really important uh, to consider the voice of the development world when making these tough decisions. Uh, it, when it comes to Security Council, you know, uh, calls for reforms have been uh, happening. Uh, African countries and many other developing countries have voiced their concerns uh, with the setup and the structure of the, of the Security Council and many other institutions. Uh, case in point is the last uh, WF, uh, WTO um, at the DG uh, position for the WTO, we know there's, uh, there was an issue there uh, when uh, the final uh, candidate that uh, won the, uh, the nomination was a former Nigerian uh, Minister of Finance, and we had some countries trying to block that. So uh, a real change is needed now in those multinational organizations, but that cannot be uh, substituted for uh, uh, unilateralism uh, and, and countries going bilaterally. We need the system, but we need to reform it. Hmm. Celso Amorim, we know uh, Jair Bolsonaro has been described as the Trump of the tropics, and it certainly seems that Bolsonaro has emulated many of uh, Trump's actions. For example, uh, he's opened up uh, the Amazon rainforest to development. Uh, he really denied the threat of the pandemic for a very long time, even after he contracted COVID-19 himself. Do you believe that this crisis really 
expose the, the fact that uh, multinational institutions are only as powerful as their member states, that all it takes is for a populist leader like Bolsonaro to come, al come along and rip up various agreements and undermine these organisations, and there's very little that these international organisations can do to counter that. Well, thank you. I, I, I would hope would leave Jair Bolsonaro for a moment. I'm try, all the time trying to forget about him, so you, you bring him back. I'll, I'll just mention to you that uh, Jair Bolsonaro is not doesn't appear like that. I mean, it's not. It, 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 it's a, it's a caused by several factors. It would be too long for me to go on that. Would have to do with internal internal changes, of course, but it have to do also with some international situation. But I won't not go into. I don't want to go into that because that would be too. I want to just to stress, as others did, the value of multilateralism. But I don't want also to. I want also to underline that there is a confusion. For me, OECD is not multilateralism. It's okay that it exists. It's okay that it it, it, it it's their members. Uh, uh, its members can discuss several things. I was there for many times as. As uh, you mentioned, Brazil has a kind of special relationship. I hope Brazil doesn't become a member, by the way. I mean, so I hope the OECD, the bureaucracy OECD is slow enough so that we have a change in government in Brazil and Brazil doesn't need to become a member. No other BRICS country is a member of the, of, of, of the OECD and for good reasons. But I don't want to go into that. But uh, OECD is not multilateralism. NATO is not multilateralism. It may be useful. I'm not discussing that. Multilateralism for me is the UN and the really multilateral bodies. And they, especially the UN, is in need of very important reform. We need to reform the Security Council. I mean, we can't have the most powerful body in the world, the only one that has decisions that have to be complied with, paralyzed in the case of the pandemics because of the veto power. I know it sounds a bit utopian. I, have, I was ambassador in the UN for four years and discussing reform. I know it's not a simple thing, Mr. Stein, I know it's not a simple thing, but we have to look, I mean, you have to be a bit utopian in order to make change happen. And I think we need to change the Security Council. We need to have a body more or less along the lines of the G20, maybe with some improvement, more African presence, less European presence in a way, and uh, so that it can be more representative, which also can help in questions like climate change, in questions like global health, it can't go all everything to the Security Council, because in the Security Council, everything is seen under the light of peace and security. And so I think all these changes are necessary. I'm not I'm just mentioning them. So I think an important thing that we should do, maybe we, we need a new, a new process, a San Francisco process, to discuss deeply all the bodies of the United Nations, not just not just perfunctory reform here and there to make better the administration here and there. I think it's a deep reform. Well, it will take time, but you'll have to take into account, I agree with uh, Professor Eikenberry, it's very important that the United States, the most powerful, still most powerful country in the world, uh, uh, goes back to multilateral system. That's very important. But we cannot deny, as he doesn't actually, that China will be, it's a new factor. So it's an, in a way, it's a new world. It's a, a different form of organization of life with bad things and good things. I, I'm not sure, I'm not, it's not for me to judge. But in any case, these are things that cannot be, uh, cannot be left aside. And uh, so I still hope that we can, in, in the case of Brazil, I think we have to do much more for uh, regional integration, for Latin America integration, so that so Europe also is very important in a more multipolar world. So all these things, all these facts, Africa, of course, which is the fastest growing continent in the world, if you, accept, if you make the exception of China. So all these things together, you know, have to build a different world. We cannot find that we had a world, a system that was created 75 years and which showed a lot of resilience, which helped avoiding maybe worse situations than we find. But it also has shown in that in many cases it is powerless. So what we need, it's not an international organization to substitute for governments. Governments will, will continue to work on that, but we need a more, a really multilateral system, which more, which more fair, which is a more reflection of the present world. And the present world after the pandemic will be very different from the world before the pandemic, with the crisis in globalization, mm. the crisis in neoliberalism, uh, with many other questions, the crisis of populism also, 
maybe the rebirth of democracy, and all that has to reflect in a world body. I'm sorry, the law, maybe, sorry. Okay, uh, Karen Kniesel, I want to talk about the European Union now because I think this pandemic really exposed uh, some of the weaknesses that the EU has. Uh, indeed, some of the strongest criticisms came from its own members, namely countries like Italy and Spain, which were the hardest hit by this pandemic. It, it took EU leaders many months before they agreed on any sort of financial help aimed at countries that were hardest hit, including Italy and Spain, uh, but these countries won't see one euro of these funds that were committed until next year, so more than a year after the pandemic really took hold. So do you believe that the EU, when this pandemic is over, will be forced to self-reflect and perhaps change to cater for those who do need help the most in a timely manner? Are we going to see a, a paradigm shift within the EU after all this? Thank you very much for this very pertinent question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, reconstruction fund money that was decided theoretically in mid-July in a very long, cumbersome summit. But uh, the big uh, question mark is still what will happen next Tuesday, Wednesday, because we have two member states of the European Union having put so far a veto to the entire budget not just to the reconstruction fund. So everything is right now in total limbo. And there is no plan B if the veto uh, is upheld uh, by these two member states. Uh, so um, there's really a huge question mark over the Europe, hanging about the European Union right now uh, on all uh, levels. Uh, we had in the first uh, wave of the pandemic, the countries you mentioned, Spain and Italy very much hit. Right now we can see uh, that countries like the Czech Republic is, is, is tremendously hit, very high toll of, uh, of people who were killed. Uh, so uh, the second wave is not yet um, taken into account for this uh, contingency planning, the, the financial contingency planning. Uh, so this is only the money question, which is a very important one. But beyond that, we have, of course, the issue of how to coordinate very basic topics such as what kind of travel restrictions are taken along which kind of parameters and here unfortunately each and every eu member states handles its priorities in a different way uh, in summer it was the summer tourism right now it's the winter tourism it's it, it might sound banal but unfortunately it catches the agenda uh, the Austrian government was warning against traveling uh, to the neighboring countries to the Mediterranean. And right now, uh, the Austrians would like to have a winter tourism season taking place, uh, while the rest of the European Union countries is very, very prudent and for good reasons, very prudent uh, to have winter tourism. So uh, in, the, in the middle of tremendous unemployment, social unrest, we are discussing tourism. Uh, which I think is uh, well, it's it's it 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 gives a it gives a, a, a strange flavor to to the whole topic. Even so, of course, I'm very much aware of the uh, economic role of tourism. No way about uh, no no doubt about that. Uh, but um, the, the 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 fundamental issue for the European Union now, apart from solving the very uh, important issue of can we pass a budget next week. Uh, is um, uh, how to how to run such force majeure, which in the end is not really force majeure, because uh, when you go to the the, the various uh, imminent threats to global security, whether it was uh, the Davos Forum that has been discussing it or other international uh, organizations, uh, pandemic uh, was always among the top issues next to climate change, next to uh, global inequality, income gap, etc. These are the three main threats to global security. Uh, so uh, we could have been aware of it. Uh, and I would say after seven months when the whole thing started, unfortunately, the lessons learned are not yet applied. Now, what could that mean for the way EU, EU decision shaping and EU decision making is happening. Uh, I think there is a sense of uh, 
there's a, there's a rising sense of alienation between uh, the political class and citizens. This is definitely felt. Mm. Okay, Masamichi Kono, Professor Eikenberry raised the issue of China earlier, the fact that it was really emerging as, as a disruptor of the international order. Let's look at China for a moment. We know it was the world's first coronavirus epicenter, but it did manage to handle that outbreak uh, relatively well. It's now handling its economic uh, recovery relatively well uh, as well. We're seeing indicators uh, coming out of China that economic growth is happening uh, that I guess most nations would really only envy right now. Given the fact that China economically appears to be really threatening or at least rising to the point that America is at right now, do you believe that at some point organisations like the OECD will need to consider having China at the table instead of China joining other, uh, I guess, rival organisations. Is it worth having a country like China in an organisation like yours? Thank you. Well, the short answer, of course, is yes. And actually, I should have mentioned this in my first um, uh, uh, intervention that um, uh, China, Brazil, um, and other G20 non-OECD members are already our key partners. And by key partner, um, by being a key partner, uh, uh, those countries get invited to our committees. They also have, um, uh, in many areas, uh, MOUs uh, um, uh, to work together with the OECD. And um, all this um, is really um, on the recognition that uh, global issues do need global solutions. And the OECD doesn't claim to be the center of multilateralism. No, it's that actually um, in many areas we um, uh, support the UN to develop uh, uh, new standards. And uh, for example, um, concerning the Paris Accord, uh, we want to be uh, what uh, uh, can be called the best supporting actor in the sense that we can provide data, evidence-based analysis, and um, sound policy recommendations that um, uh, can be agreed on in a bipartisan manner. And so in a way, um, in many areas, actually, um, uh, China and Brazil are already uh, uh, working constructively with us. Um, uh, one example is in digital taxation, where we are now negotiating a, um, a, a global um, uh, agreement on how to tax uh, digital uh, companies and digital uh, services. Um, in this uh, arena, 137 countries take um, a part, and um, particularly India has been playing a very constructive role in this uh, forum. So, um, uh, and this is called the inclusive forum, by the way. And so, um, uh, what I uh, would certainly like to suggest is that um, um, if you can't have an almighty um, global um, institution top down, uh, I think there's a way of working bottom up that is uh, um, uh, uh, for on each subject. There are uh, places where good work has already been done. In our case, we have, uh, for example, the uh, anti-bribery convention, and we want uh, G20, all G20 countries to be members of that convention. And this was recognized by the G20 because, of course, we work together very closely with the G20 and the G7. So um, that uh, certainly in that uh, respect, uh, um, China, um, uh, we will continue engaging with China while, um, of course, not diluting our standards, but we would like China to um, join uh, as much as possible uh, our standards and be part of uh, the global uh, system. And um, for that matter, um, actually, uh, China has really been promulgating uh, their support for uh, a, a multilateral trading system, a multilateral rules-based trading system. And of course, uh, it's um, easier said than done, of course, but uh, we want to help China uh, live up to that uh, commitment. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Professor Eikenberry, can we continue this uh, discussion on China, which you talked about earlier as well? Because China, on the one hand, has been praised for how it's managed to lift millions of its own people out of poverty through its economic development. But on the other hand, it's been criticised for its values as well. It's not a democracy. Uh, its human rights record has been questioned. Uh, when we look at uh, the way 
uh, it's trying to impose its values on Hong Kong at the moment. That's really uh, sparked protests from uh, leaders around the world as well. But in the wake of how it's handled uh, the outbreak, how it's handled its economic recovery, do you believe that uh, the perception of China will change after this pandemic? Might countries like the US, the UK, even Australia, which have been really resisting China's rise, might they be more open-minded to perhaps including China uh, in the way decisions are made around the world? Well, that's a great question. And let me just say that um, as we discuss China and the reform of the global system, we should keep in mind that there are, in some sense, three global challenges that are simultaneously putting themselves in front of us. One is uh, the shift in the global balance of power, which is really the story of the rise of China, but more generally of Asia, the relative decline of the West. And we're trying to sort through that. We're trying to, uh, to uh, struggle over how to redistribute authority and votes in international institutions, perhaps reform the, the UN Security Council. The last time that was attempted was in 2005 with the high level report. Uh, it didn't work so well, but it, this crisis of power transition is creating struggles over authority, but also over values. China is rising, but also putting before the international system uh, illiberal, uh, authoritarian, and drifting towards more uh, kind of neo-totalitarian kinds of domestic political values. So there's a challenge there. The second global crisis is the crisis of modernity. That's the, we've entered the Anthropocene era. This is global warming. This is the pandemic. This is the, the, the proliferation of of, of weapons of mass destruction. And this is a global problem that will require global solutions. It will require a stronger United Nations, more multilateralism, and, and it will require China and the United States as the two largest countries, they emit 27% of carbon into the atmosphere. The US emits 15% of the global total. That's 42%. The US and China have to work together on global warming. And I think there's an opening that uh, the Biden administration can uh, help trigger. Uh, it's going, the U.S. is going to return to the Paris Agreement on, on January 20th. So there's a real opportunity there. So there's the power crisis. There's the modernity crisis. But there's also a crisis of liberal democracy. The liberal democracies who have been at the center of the international order for, for 100 years um, are, are not doing so well. And uh, this is not a problem that relates to China. It's a problem of how we build and rebuild our liberal democratic uh, societies. And this is where I think there's a role for the, for the democracies, uh, the G7, and what, what some people are calling the D10, which includes uh, India and Australia. Uh, South Korea is very important. So a subset of the international order that that want to preserve and advance values that China doesn't stand for. And so that's a struggle that will involve um, efforts that China's not in and that will, that will make the relationship with China more complex. So we've got to be able to envisage a future where it's going to be both competition and cooperation. It's going to be global, but it's also going to be sub-global. And that's just the world we're just going to have to evolve into, I think. Okay, uh, Mr. Steiner, I, I want to talk about one of the points that Professor Eikenberry raised, and that's the reform of not only the Security Council, but also the United Nations as a whole. UN reform is a perennial topic of discussion among members who aren't part of the Permanent Five. Indeed, countries like Turkey, the Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has repeatedly said that the world is bigger than the Permanent Five members of the Security Council, which seemed to hold all the power in that decision-making forum. As a leader of in the United Nations system itself, do you recognize those calls to reform elements of the uh, United Nations, including the Security Council? And do you also recognize the fact that uh, when countries like Saudi Arabia, which has a, a questionable human rights record, finds itself on the Human Rights Council, that perhaps uh, the UN is exposed 
to uh, descriptions of hypocrisy itself and therefore really does need a, a root and branch reform. Thank you, Oscar. Let me make it very clear. I consider myself part of a generation of um, UN leaders who joined the Secretary General Antonio Guterres precisely because we recognize, we embrace this notion that the UN has to evolve. Now, um, you know, reform is often reduced to bureaucratic and administrative and organizational reforms. And I want to, first of all, you know, simply say to anybody who is listening today, I am amongst those who would absolutely recognize the limitations, the deficiencies, the challenges we have. We are not machines. We are, a, uh, you know, organizations composed of people um, governed by member states who often have very contrarian views. It's a complex field in which to operate, but it's never an excuse not to rethink, revisit, and evolve the model. And I think all of us on the panel recognize that whether you call for another San Francisco moment, whether we call for reform of the Security Council, the United Nations will only continue to be a dynamic and attractive proposition to the world in the 21st century if it can evolve with the way that the world is evolving. And I think whether you singularize it down to the emergence of um, you know, major new players, China, the emerging economies, shifts in geopolitical uh, symmetries, I think um, there is no question that the UN must evolve. Now, the challenge we have is that it is only the member states who can actually do the real reforms, the real leaps forward. The Security Council reform proposition has been, as Celso Amorim knows better than anyone, on the books for more than 25 years. It is obviously the challenge that those who currently hold the veto do not see a way forward that does not diminish their role. And so we must come to a moment where countries recognize that the value of a reformed and evolved United Nations reflecting the state of our world um, becomes so critical that there is a, a degree of trade-off that becomes feasible. It's very difficult to do that when you have an extremely agitated and polarized G2 world, so to speak. I think we are moving to new territory. I think we need to learn to recognize China as a new superpower. That is challenging to many uh, countries across the world. On the other hand, the world has been asking China to step up as a major economic power to contribute financially with um, peacekeeping troops and others to the capacity of the world to act. So that's one side. But let me also be clear. What we saw in the first 10 months of this year was very sobering. The inability of the Security Council to convene and agree of the General Assembly to come together, the political organs of the United Nations have been struggling because of the deep divisions that some countries have essentially brought into the fora of multilateral and collective ability to act. But let me also say, and I do this with deep conviction, the operational side of the UN, often not seen so clearly, not perceived to be so central, whether it is UNICEF, the World Food Programme, UNDP, uh, UNAIDS, UNFPA, the World Health Organization, we were the backbone of a global community in free fall, in extreme distress, and with many countries basically not even having the basic means to protect themselves. We set up air bridges. Our staff continue to work. We are part of stabilizing, helping countries to manage the crisis, keeping governments open, and now also providing a vaccine platform that simply doesn't determine whether you have access to it because you're rich. That is the United Nations at work also in the year 2020, and that operational side of the UN is as vital, if sometimes not more real, as my colleague Minister Hassan will confirm, in all its imperfections to countries who look to the international community to get through these crises. That is part of the promise of solidarity and of multilateralism. And so the reform of the UN has to happen in the political arena. For that, we need a new political consensus. We also have to evolve the machinery of the United Nations but I think precisely in the midst of this extraordinary crisis, simultaneously affecting over 190 nations, the UN was there. It didn't leave, it didn't close down, and it kept going. And that is part of the promise of multilateralism that we also need to protect by evolving it. Okay, Akim Steiner, thank you so much for your contribution. We understand you, you do have to leave our discussion early, but we do thank you for uh, joining us uh, up until now. So thank you very much and good luck with your work at the UNDP. Now, Minister Hassan, can I bring this discussion back to you now? Uh, Mr. Steiner, 
did mention the issue of uh, a coronavirus vaccine. Indeed, today the United Kingdom announced that it had approved one of those vaccines, the, the Pfizer candidate, which could be rolled out in the UK as early as next week. Uh, I'm wondering, do you believe that uh, this issue of coronavirus vaccines will really test the metal of these multilateral organisations such as the World Health Organisation to ensure that countries like Somalia that don't have the buying power of the United States and the US and the EU, do you think these organisations will be tested in terms of ensuring that these vaccines are distributed fairly around the world, including into countries like Somalia? Absolutely. Uh, I think that will be uh, the biggest test case for the multilateral institutions, uh, in case in point, the WHO. Uh, I think what will happen and what we really need to see happening is to create some sort of platform where African countries, uh, most of the older developing countries can access the vaccines on time uh, without any delay, uh, because we have uh, the pandemic is global. It, it doesn't discriminate. Uh, we have uh, uh, most, the, some of the most vulnerable communities in our countries. Uh, lots of uh, uh, people uh, that their lives have been impacted. They're uh, completely uh, dependent on uh, very meager social safety nets. So we need to make sure that the vaccines reach those who need the most. And how do we do that? I think that's the challenge. I think we need to make sure that the UN system works for all of us. The multilateral institutions work for all of us. The reason we've been calling for reform is precisely because issues like this can happen any minute. And when this happens, uh, there will be the issue will be who can afford uh, to survive. Uh, so that's why we need to have uh, the voices of the developing countries at the table. And when we're making these kind of decisions, people should be there. All of us should be there. I believe uh, the UN and the, uh, the international community will uh, make uh, the proper decisions when uh, deciding who gets the vaccine. We understand uh, some of the uh, uh, countries have already introduced it uh, and, uh, and approved uh, the Pfizer and, and bi biotech uh, vaccines uh, like the UK. Uh, we're looking forward to the rest of the world to uh, uh, expedite the process of approving uh, these vaccines so we can get them as early as possible. Definitely, I, I believe um, mm. things will change but we, we would like to see uh, uh, the reforms taking place simultaneously as we face these challenges together. Hmm. Now, Mr. Amorim, you have been critical uh, of uh, several international organisations. Uh, you mentioned earlier that your hope is that Brazil doesn't join the OECD. But do you believe that this COVID-19 pandemic will uh, be a good reason to change things up in terms of the international order? Or will it be business as usual once vaccines are rolled out and this pandemic is quickly forgotten about? Well, uh, I'm not an epidemiologist myself, but from what I, I hear, uh, the pandemic is not will not be a passing phenomenon. Even the vaccines, even of course, we have a lot of hope on the vaccines. There are several being tested. Uh, they should not be politicized. We should work with all of them in a, in, a, in a technical and scientific way, which is not being done in Brazil, by the way, by a populist right-wing government. So uh, we have to look uh, from this point of view. We have to ensure that they are available uh, accessibly uh, to all countries, including poor countries. And I think Brazil worked a lot for that in the past uh, when it held, uh, for instance, just to mention something that everyone knows here, certainly Mr. Steiner knows, which is the famous flexibilities of the TRIPS agreement in order that uh, uh, the poor countries can also have, uh, if necessary, compulsory license, but if not, at least cooperation to have uh, in an accessible way. No, I think it's not a passing phenomenon. I think it's a very important phenomenon. I think it's a big change in the world. And I think it comes, as, a, as mentioned before here, coupled with other phenomena. I think it comes coupled with the rise of China, whether it's good or bad, it's another matter, but it's, uh, I think it's better to have more plural. But anyway, uh, you have the rise of China. Uh, you have an attempt, you know, 
despite all the difficulties of having a more united Europe with fiscal policies also. I mean, at least the reconstruction fund with all the difficulties. But anyway, this is something new. The, the, the novelty about the new Marshall Plan is, is that it will be a Merkel plan or it will be a Xi Jinping plan. It will not be a Biden plan. That, that's something we know for sure. So the world is changing. In a, in a very important and, and structural way. In Latin America, for instance, the big protests against the excesses of globalization and new liberalism in Chile started before the pandemic. But all these things now come together and the pandemic is a big catalyzer. And we have, I mean, I don't like this question of opportunities because it's, the pandemic is bad, so it's bad. And we have to deal with something that is bad. But having said that, we have to use this moment in order to try to make the world more cap able to respond to big global changes. And I, I don't want to go much further, but let me let, say two things. First, when one speaks of democracy, you have to th think of democracy taking into account, it's not expanding what we have in the United States. The United States has produced Trump, has produced Guantanamo, has produced many things that are not totally democratic, have produced reactions in relation to immigrants, which are totally against human rights also. So I'm not against the United States. I actually have great admiration for the affirmative action that the United States have produced, the, the, the role of women, the role, what uh, uh, the advance of black, uh, black population in spite of all the problems. So I have great admiration for the US democracy, but I can see the, the flaws also. So I think you have to have an inclusive world in which all the countries can bring their contribution from Africa, from Latin America, from Europe, based on their experience. And that's what I see as an important thing to happen in the future. And I think the pandemic, if you wish, I don't like the word opportunity for good reasons, but if it is an occasion in which you have to discuss all these things in a global way, with a, with a broad-minded way, I think that's, that, that's necessary. That's what I think it's necessary. I would have one word about democracy, but I want democracy and corruption, but I, that would take too long. Just, I'll just mention one word, and if you wish, I can elaborate on that. It's a word that Pope Francis has been using very much, which is lawfare. So I'm very skeptical also of how, how the fight against corruption can be used to topple progressive governments. Okay, and now, uh, Karen Kniesel, can I bring you in again? Uh, we spoke about the challenges that the EU faced in helping those countries hardest hit like Italy and Spain, but even before the pandemic, uh, we saw the advent of Brexit, uh, which was a direct challenge to what the EU uh, has uh, really stands for. We have leaders in countries like Hungary, Viktor Orban, who's also challenged uh, the concept of the EU. Do you believe that after this pandemic, uh, under Ursula von der Leyen's leadership, will the EU take those criticisms on board and really look to genuinely uh, self-reflect and perhaps reform how things are done in Brussels? It's the, it's the issue of the day, of the, of the next decade. Um, and uh, the self-questioning, the self-reflection um, by member states of the European Union uh, is something that should have started at the latest in June 2016, when the Brexit referendum uh, resulted in the, in the no vote, in the leave vote, as you just mentioned. Uh, but instead of really taking up that issue and reflecting on what went wrong, why was there this vote? Not just uh, uh, doing an, analy uh, an analysis, uh, uh, analysis that was uh, a pure domestic uh, British discussion. No, it should have happened also uh, in, in, in some sort of, of self-criticism by the others. But instead of doing that, what happened in summer 2016, four years ago, was the following. Uh, it was more a kind of, well, uh, the, the way we, we, we will now handle the, the whole technical performance should be done in such a way that no other EU member states would be tempted to take the British example. Uh, so uh, as a minister, I followed Brexit uh, fairly closely and I was always skeptical whether there will be an agreement, even so the draft agreement uh, negotiated by uh, Commissioner Michel Barnier uh, was a very, very elaborate one, but the entire way of handling it with the various prime ministers 
uh, was not uh, the, the the best one. It could have been done in a different way. So uh, I would say uh, in a conclusive note, no, we did not learn anything from the 2016 situation. And four years later, the overall atmosphere is even more difficult. I mean, Brexit now appears like a footnote uh, against the backdrop of the long list of problems that we have right now. Budget is one, uh, the, how to, to deal with, uh, with, with uh, member states such as Hungary, the, the internal debate in Hungary and Poland, there is a tremendous rift. And uh, uh, so I, I think uh, debates should have happened much more earlier at the latest 2016 and they were not done. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you permit me one small word on vaccination, because uh, I listened carefully to, to what uh, um, uh, our colleague from Somalia has stated. Um, vaccination rates are very, very dense and highly respected in countries like Bangladesh or Rwanda and many other sub-Saharan African countries. Why? Because people are aware of the misery an infection can bring along. In vaccination rates are very low inside EU countries. The lowest rates you have in Germany, in Austria. Take the regular influenza vaccination. Only 6% of Austrians take this vaccination. Uh, about 60% uh, do it in France because it's, uh, there have been, 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 there's been a rise in, 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 in also certain government obligations. But, um, <laughs> When I come back to the German speaking world by and large and also reflecting on some Scandinavian EU member states, it's not only about alternative energy in our countries, it's also about alternative medicine. There's a very strong uh, criticism of conventional medicine and talking about vaccination, it's very conventional medicine, if I may say, but it's a very effective one. And there's a tremendous hope now linked to vaccination. Uh, but there's also at the same time a very strong debate, a very strong uh, rejection of any kind of government prescribed vaccination. So this is still a debate to go on. I personally uh, have still my uh, World Health Organization passport from 1970. Ever since I was a small child, we, we were traveling a lot. I know about infection. I've always been vaccinated. I've never been a, a critic of, of vaccination. Uh, but I know about the strong degree of criticism that we have, in particular in the German-speaking world. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, the, the higher education rate that you have, the more critical people are of conventional medicine, such as vaccination. Uh, so this is still something to, to bear in mind. And we will see, I've, I've been reflecting on that in my recent book on mobility, will the vaccination passport uh, become more important than the regular passport. I, I worked in Angola a few years ago and I observed with interest that at the border control, uh, my vaccination passport was, uh, uh, was checked first before my passport. And uh, that, that I saw with interest uh, five, six years ago when I traveled to Luanda and this is a development that could move to other countries mobility linked to your vaccination passport and uh, there i think we will still see a very strong debate in the german speaking world uh, along the lines of this rejection of conventional medicine Mr. Connor, can I continue on that thread of a potential coronavirus vaccine? Uh, the OECD's economic outlooks are highly regarded, highly influential. I've been following every one of them myself. And each of them released during the crisis uh, has changed depending on when the OECD thinks normal economic activity can resume uh, during and after the pandemic. How closely linked is the rollout of a safe and effective uh, vaccine to the resumption of normal economic activity in any given country and indeed around the world? 
Thank you, and uh, thank you for your interest in the economic outlook. Now, um, um, our overall observation in this latest economic outlook is that um, uh, it is um, for the first time actually since we entered this crisis that the outlook is looking brighter uh, with vaccines in sight. And um, of, there is strong and continuous policy support for its um, um, uh, uh, development and also for its distribution. And um, I'm now looking at the uh, leader's declaration of the G20 that uh, was uh, um, uh, published uh, uh, in October. And um, it is clearly stated here that we will spare no efforts to ensure uh, uh, the vaccines affordable and e equitable access for all people. And um, we have to mean this. I mean, uh, having an agreement is of course important, but at the same time, uh, we really have to make this happen. And and if actually we make uh, our maximum efforts um, over the course of next year, um, we do think that uh, um, there will be a significant change in the uh, um, economic prospects uh, and that uh, um, uh, we already project as a central projection um, an average uh, um, a growth rate of 4% uh, over next year and uh, the following year, that is 2021 to 22. But this is very much based on, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, uh, the um, well, plausible, I would say, assumption that we will have uh, those vaccines uh, deployed and that uh, um, this will be uh, globally uh, um, available and affordable, accessible. Um, and if this doesn't happen, of course, um, it's, it doesn't work because it is very clear that um, um, this is a, a, a not only a grow global crisis, if we don't have um, eradicate this virus from um, all corners of the world, we will never re have a really functioning uh, global economy. And of course, uh, we are so interconnected that um, there is no um, other uh, option. So, um, uh, but, but then um, I, I would like to add uh, that um, I spent most of my past career fighting financial crises, the Japanese banking crisis, the Asian financial crisis, the uh, global financial crisis. And of course, every time we make mistakes, there are uh, so many uh, tensions, there are um, deaths, there are tragedies, but uh, in the end, uh, we somehow found ways to work together and collaborate. And even after the glo uh, great financial crisis, um, actually, I found that uh, governments uh, had closer communication uh, than uh, before the crisis, uh, uh, and of course, a cl closer collaboration also. So this time, um, certainly we have to make that happen. And of course, that's a challenge, but uh, um, I, I want to be really uh, working on that. And uh, we are all committed. And uh, um, as Akim Steiner mentioned, it's not just the UN, but all international organizations rallied together to work towards that. And we haven't closed shop despite all the uh, difficulties of uh, mobility, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Eikenberry, can I continue that discussion uh, about a vaccine? Because really it is seen as uh, something that will restore some level of normalcy during this pandemic. Uh, we know that the World Health Organization has developed uh, their so-called COVAX initiative, which aims to distribute any successful vaccines uh, to poorer countries who perhaps can't afford to be spending billions in buying up potential vaccines now, as we're seeing countries like the US, the UK, uh, the EU, Australia do uh, at this moment. But are you worried that uh, in effect though, we will see this world where it will be split into two, those who can afford to have a vaccine and those who can't, the have and have nots of a coronavirus vaccine. And what will that do in terms of uh, the reputation of uh, organizations like the World Health Organization. A very important worry. I, I, I do worry about the, the, we'll call it the geopolitics of, 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 the, of the vaccine and the, the scramble for a national, uh, uh, national uh, control, uh, the uh, rich countries looking after their own first, um, the the uh, exacerbation of uh, long-standing uh, divisions and inequalities and hierarchies in the international order, and I do think there's a there's an opportunity to 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 use the the more enlightened ideas that I think the 
WHO stands for, the, the inclusive, uh, expansive provision of, of, the, of the vaccine as a way of, of signaling and reinforcing uh, a kind of new era understanding of where we are, that we're all in it together. Um, and I, I think that that's, as we come, this panel comes to an end, I, I do think that 2020 will stand out. A hundred years from now, I think historians will look back and say 2020, that was one of the big years, uh, not necessarily for, a, for good reasons, but I do think that the, the possibility is that we will have uh, revealed to, our, to, to ourselves as human beings that we are all in it together, that uh, there's a, a fragile and fraught common existence uh, that re require competent government that there are costs to failed international cooperation, that there is a fragility to democratic governments, and that our, we'll call it enlightenment values about openness, rule of law, freedom of information, accountable government, all values we care about are very fragile, uh, and that ultimately uh, there's an inescapability uh, to our common uh, existence uh, as, as people. Uh, working together, uh, and that in the end, the the last age of multilateralism, the great explosion of multilateralism after World War II, came from a, a very simple insight uh, that uh, we're only as safe as the weakest among us. Uh, uh, at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, the the uh, argument that FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, made was that. We are in an era of interdependence where we are uh, um, uh, we are uh, 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 at the mercy of the contagion of bad economic ideas, and so too, um, 75, 80 years later, we are only as strong as our weakest link. The healthcare and public health capacities of our weakest and most vulnerable society. Um, uh, uh, are, we're, we're implicated in their success. And so I think that's the message that uh, I hope 2020 will stand for, uh, that uh, you can't be secure alone, you can only be secure together. Hmm. Now, Minister Hassan, uh, at a time when organizations like the WTO, uh, international trade were being undermined by the, the Trump administration. It was interesting to look at the African continent because uh, 28 countries have managed to sign the African continental free trade area of which Somalia is a member. And I guess it goes back to Karen Kniesel's point about regional multilateralism in the absence of uh, more broader cooperation. How important is uh, a free trade agreement in Africa in terms of helping Somalia uh, really boost its economy at a time when the pandemic has hit not only its economy, but, but economies around the world? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Uh, as you know, uh, most of the top performing uh, economies in the world were uh, in Africa uh, before the pandemic hit. Uh, although the loss of human lives were not as severe as many parts of the world, but the socioeconomic impact uh, can be felt and seen clearly across Africa. And that had an impact on the, on the trading uh, activities in Africa. Having said that, uh, we have, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the Af inter-African uh, free trade agreement that uh, most of the African countries now, I think, have signed and deposited the ratification instruments with the African Union. Uh, we are not, uh, we're looking at trading amongst each other, but we're not uh, doing it at the expense of the, of the global trade. Uh, for instance, in many country, we are located in the Horn of Africa, linking the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden to the Indian Ocean. And, and you know, that area, uh, the maritime trade uh, that takes place in that area is huge globally. And we position ourselves to take advantage of that, not as a Somalia only, but as an African country. And, and this uh, trade agreement is giving us that access. Locally and regionally, uh, we are seeing countries uh, creating blocks. For instance, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and other countries are creating this Horn of Africa uh, integration 
agreement, which means uh, economically we have to be able to work closely uh, and, um, and remove all these trade barriers, uh, remove, make sure that we have access to each other. On the other hand, uh, not that far from, from, from us, the East Africa, we have the East African community and we have SADC, we have the ECOWAS, uh, we have COMESA, which brings us together. So there are many different regional organizations that we use to trade with each other. But this pandemic 2020 taught us uh, that unless you, we come together globally, unless we come together and reform the institutions that we all belong to, it would be very difficult to do things silos. Uh, and and uh, whether it doesn't matter whether you're a very rich country or a very poor country, we are in the same boat. And these organizations that we create in our instruments to enhance the global partnership, to enhance the multilateralism. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, we see the opportunity, but also need to be mindful of the real work that needs to be done after 2020. Now, Mr. Amorim, you touched on the BRICS organizations, which include uh, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa. Uh, in the wake of this pandemic, what role will emerging powers have in the international order of things? Do you think they'll emerge stronger and more influential uh, when this pandemic is over? Yes, I do think so. I think BRICS had already an important role uh, at the, after the, in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008. It was fundamental to have for the first time, not enough, but a significant change in the quota system in the IMF. So in a way, it improved the distribution of power to some extent in, 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 in the economic institutions. And I think it will go the same way. I agree that there are different values. The countries don't have all the same kind of organizations. Uh, but I think it is important for the multipolar world we want to live in. We don't want a hegemony from any country. I don't want an, a world that is under United States hegemony, but I don't want a world which is under Chinese hegemony either. I want a world which is balanced, in which Africa, Latin America, Europe, all of us can also have our say and influence in the world. And I think this is, this is as far as we can go in terms of democracy in the international system. We cannot uh, hope that we'll have an international system, something that we can, we are still grappling with in internal, in internal governments. But anyway, I think BRICS is important. Uh, it, it represents an enormous, I don't have all the percentages here, but it's, it's like 40% of the world population, 25% of the world uh, territory, 20% uh, or so of the world GDP. So it's, of course, very important. And it includes countries from all regions. It is very important, the presence of South Africa there, because it's not only the voice of South Africa as such, but it's the voice of Africa that, to some extent, is supposed to be heard through, through, through South Africa. So I think it's very important, and it's part of the uh, world in which the globalization, which, of course, is in crisis, but it's an inevitable tendency, becomes more fair, more equitable, and more balanced. So I, I, I put my bets there. Okay, Karen Kanisil, can I ask you a similar question about the European Union? You mentioned earlier that you believe the EU really missed an opportunity in the wake of Brexit to uh, perhaps self-reflect and change some of its ways. But do you believe that after this pandemic, will the EU emerge weaker or stronger? It will be very different and I, my gut feeling is that uh, it will be different. I cannot yet tell what is, is weaker or stronger because uh, uh, what would it mean to have a stronger European Union? It would have, uh, according to, to President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, a geopolitical European Union, one that is not sandwiched uh, between uh, China, Russia, the, the United States, etc., but one that would be able to act out of its own interests. And so far, we have not been yet able to formulate interests. We focus around values, but an interest-based foreign policy, an interest-based uh, uh, foreign trade policy has not yet emerged, uh, whether it's in the automotive sector, whether it's in, in, in energy, etc. 
So it will be different, but I don't see it on the way of becoming that what President von der Leyen has pronounced for her commission, namely a, a, a geopolitical European Union, a, a power by its own. That I don't see in the making. So uh, to respond to your question, it, 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 uh, I would have to end on, 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 on that. Remains to be seen. Okay, Karen Kniesel, and you will have the last word in this discussion because it does bring us to the end of our panel. Thank you all to our guests, uh, Minister Gamal Mohamed Hassan, Celso Amorim, Karen Kniesel, Akim Steiner, Masamichi Kono, and Professor John G. Eikenberry. And thank you to you all who have tuned into this session. I hope you found it as interesting and informative as I did. But do stay tuned to the TRT World Forum 2020 because coming up, we have Elif Veriketli who will present a reflections discussion on the future of the film industry. Hello and welcome to TRT World Forum 2020's Reflections Session on the changing face of the publishing industry during COVID-19. Today I will host esteemed guests to discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the world of books. To talk about what's been happening to the publishing industry, I'm joined by Murat Arayici, the founder of Domingo Publishing House here in Istanbul. Hi, Murat. It's lovely to see you join us today. So before we start Hello. talking about how you were affected by COVID-19, I think it uh, wouldn't hurt giving a little bit of a context uh, for the people who are not from Turkey and who, who are not familiar with your publishing house. So why don't you tell us what kind of books you're publishing and um, a little bit about Domingo. Okay, um, I will do this uh, as briefly as I can. Uh, Domingo is a 12 years old <laughs> publishing house. Uh, it is it, it it has nonfiction, fiction, and in children uh, it, it books uh, in his portfolio. Uh, it, we are mostly a nonfiction based publishing house, I can say, and it's purely translated works from abroad. Uh, from Argentina, Argentina to United Kingdom, Spain to France. Uh, I mean, we uh, it's been five years that we added children line to the to our portfolio, and we are proud to be a some proud to be a publisher of some of the great names like. Uh, as an example, I can say uh, Patti Smith or Siddhartha Mukherjee or Atul Gavan, uh, David Eagleman, Jeffrey Eugenides. Uh, so it's it's not been a long, but we have a nice portfolio, I can say, which we are proud to have. Okay, lovely. And that nice portfolio, how was it affected by COVID-19 in terms of uh, sales? <laughs> It is effect. It is effect. I mean, it, uh, we when we were we still trying to understand how it had affected. I mean, we were lucky, as I mentioned, that we have children line for the last five years. We will. We, I wouldn't think that uh, that will be that critical, especially during the pandemic. It is because uh, once once everything started. Our first reaction was to stop everything uh, because we didn't know what, how the site would go. So our first reaction, like most of the publisher, I guess, was to diminish the cost. So we postponed some of the new books, which we are planning to uh, print. Uh, but with April, we saw a big, uh, at least unexpected, uh, inc increase in internet sales. And it, this is also true for the most of the publishing house, mainly in children, uh, which, which, which has a children's segment on it. So I, I'm stressing this uh, repetitively because uh, I don't want to give an impression that things go well 
for any uh, circumstances. We were lucky to have this children online, but I know sort of that, like some of our friends from all the publishing houses had more difficult times because mm -hmm. um, it. Um, they, they first fully they don't have children line and it didn't help to them and uh, or they were uh, maybe well established relations with the internet uh, okay. bookstores so yeah, uh, but for Murat, us, sorry yeah, to cut yeah, you off yeah. there, but I just want to clear it up for, for everyone. So you sold more children books than usual during uh, lockdown. It is the case. It's 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 not easy to believe, but it is the case. Uh, it, it, our children books sales increase a lot, especially with the lockdown. People, I mean, it's not only about the children books. Stuff, it's about anything which is related with the family uh, in the internet. People were looking for things to do as a family in the home, mm -hmm. at the home, and and that. That motivation help us a lot. I mean, it is, it is. It's not from nowhere. I mean, we, we the thing that we saw is mostly focused on the things that we build with time. Maybe it was time to collect the result at mm -hmm. that time. I mean, people go with the specific addresses uh, with the books or uh, people. Uh, uh, I mean, with the books which has more reputations because they heard somewhere and now they need a book and they look what they heard mm -hmm. before so, exactly uh, that was helpful yeah okay i wonder how you responded to this content requirement did it make you publish more children's books and uh, maybe cut back on other types of content it is uh, yeah it, it is just like you said i mean we we with the start we start to postpone most of the books uh, because we we didn't know how the new books are gonna sell or how we're gonna market them how we're gonna launch them and what we learn uh, what we learn is something that we learn within this few months uh, is that we need the bookstores whatever uh, at least for the marketing and the launch of the book. You cannot, especially for the adult books, you cannot pretend that you launch a book through the internet. It, we need the bookstores to make them visible, to make, to, to create that hype, as we can mm -hmm. say, uh, uh, to uh, to launch a book. But in the children's side, it is, it is different than that, because the, the children's segment in Turkish bookstores are still premature. They never been good. There are some uh, attempts to create new bookstores, great with the children's segment, but it is still uh, premature. So, internet has always been the, the critical, and uh, is, uh, then the social media marketing always yeah. been a critical for the children books. So, in the children's segment, we didn't stop. We mm -hmm. keep on printing the new books. Yeah. And so, uh, in terms of what you ask, yeah, we we pushed more children books. Then we will do uh, uh, in other case, yeah. Uh, normally, yeah. And uh, before uh, we wrap up, as we're coming to a close, I'm happy that you mentioned bookstores because I focused on sales. Uh, but then, what do you think was the biggest challenge for you that COVID nineteen brought? Uh, well, to, I mean, it, uh, as a firm and as an industry, maybe. Uh, we were lucky that we, we the things that we are dealing is words and the words are look quite same on paper and on screen so we were quite uh, good to adapt to the to, 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 to this new situation uh, and our editors uh, and our graphic people were always working uh, cooperatively from their home so it didn't affect that much. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, the industry, I mean, that we we had already the existing problem with this uh, bookstores, and then especially independent bookstores uh, uh, versus internet sales because of the uh, really uh, offensive uh, discount rates in mm -hmm. internet mm -hmm. bookstores. Yeah, uh, they had the bookstore. The, the independent bookstores had. Uh, hard times to live with yeah. it. So with this new 
uh, reality they, they, they share they, they share increased even more and the bookstores uh, have uh, we know that they have difficult times so we don't know how this was gonna end and how it's gonna uh, how when, when we back to normal how the shares again shift one way or the other but We'll all have to wait and see that, Murat. Um, unfortunately, yeah. our time's up. But it doesn't sound all that bad uh, on your behalf. So I'm happy for Domingo Publishing House. It was lovely having you. Thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts with us today. And now, also Matt Strandberg is with us. Hi there. It's lovely to see you join us on TRT World Forum today. <clears throat> so... Yeah. You wrote a book in which humanity is going extinct in one month. So I wonder how does a pandemic affect a writer who wrote about the end of humanity, really? Yeah, good question. I mean, I've heard from so many viewers who have, uh, sorry, from readers who have thought a lot about my uh, book in these crazy, crazy times. And of course, I have as well. Um, I don't know. I feel like I was strangely prepared for this. <laughs> era after, after writing okay, this you, book. Even you might though... be the only person who's prepared for this, Matt, <laughs> so good to hear that. <laughs> exactly. Of course, the pandemic is not as serious as an actual comet coming down to Earth and destroying us. But, uh, but, I, but, I, but I have been grappling with a lot of these issues that have become very uh, apparent these days. Mm -hmm. So what you had in mind, how a pandemic or a story that might uh, you know, end up in humanity going extinct would be experienced and how you actually experienced it. When you compare these two, what do you think mm -hmm. is the biggest difference? Well, of course, like I said, the situations are very different. This is not the end of the world, even though it feels <laughs> like it sometimes. Um, but I think the big diff, I mean, something that I've really thought about is when I talk to the Swedish um, government and, and people who would be in charge of a situation like a comet, um, I was asking them, like, what would the biggest challenge for society be? And I expected them to say that, oh, we need to get food into the country or we need to, you know, make sure that people go to work and, and take care of the trash or whatever. But they said that the biggest problem would be to actually reach out with correct information in, in a big, you know, uh, chaos of conspiracy theories and uh, and stuff. So I had a lot of fun with that when I wrote the book and, and, and made up all these strange rumors and stuff. Um, and, and I thought I maybe was exaggerating and had a little bit too much fun with it. But then COVID <laughs> happened and it was apparent that, okay, people are quite stupid <laughs> and, and are prepared to believe in the most outrageous things. So, you know. Okay. Okay. So I think your book toilet paper to be to be such a big thing though. That's one thing I missed. Okay. <laughs> so it, this actually is, brings me to my next question because I think your book is also about how maybe actually about uh, how you find meaning in a situation mm -hmm. like that in life. What is the yeah. meaning of life when it's all ending? So um, yeah. <clears throat> what have you learned, do you think, about the way people were trying to find meaning uh, during mm. COVID-19? I mean, yes, stocking up toilet papers and you know, uh, yeah. making homemade <laughs> breads at home all day. Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you for, for saying that. For me, it's also very much about a book that is about um, finding meaning in life. It's not a book about actually dying um, and I I just I'm sorry do you hear me because I'm I'm not hearing you at the moment oh I do hear you, you I do hear you uh, no there's okay. no problem okay, <laughs> okay great um, no I was actually thinking a lot I talked to psychologists also when I did my research and I, I was thinking a lot about how if something of this magnitude would happen that would affect everyone in the world. We would have something big in common for the first time, maybe, in human history, something that actually was um, affecting all of us, even though it was in slightly different ways. And, and that reminds me a lot about this COVID era, that we're sort of alone, but together, if you know what I mean. And there's this huge thing happening to all of us, and it's um, something that sort of permeates all of our conversations and all of our relationships at the moment. And I think that if 
it also sort of stops the regular hamster wheel of everyday life and it's forced us to sort of take pause and withdraw into our homes a bit more and we have more time to maybe think about what's important to us and you know what we want to do with our lives mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay in your book you kind of ask the question how would you spend your last days if you knew that you were going to die so uh, stemming mm -hmm. from that I wonder why you wanted to focus on that in particular as a writer, because what do you think it says about us human beings, how we would mm -hmm. spend our last days on Earth? What does it say about us? Well, I think that everyone would react very differently, of course. Um, and I tried to show that by having a lot of diverse characters who would react in different ways. Um, I mean, for me, this book is... I wrote it very much as a as a way of dealing with my own um, anxieties, really, about the climate crisis, <laughs> but uh, because we are living in sort of a disaster in real life. But I wanted to make it very concrete and very, um, you know, very. Uh, I, I wanted a disaster that would that would happen that w that had a ticking clock, so to speak. Um, I found found that to be really interesting and. Uh, I mean, we um, we are all dealing with the fact that our time might be limited mm -hmm. here on Earth, even though we may be more or less prone to believe that or, you know, think about it. Yeah. Um, and, and in my book, I really wanted to write about teenagers because I found that to be extra interesting to, you know, when you're sort of in the middle between a child and a grown-up. When I was 17, I felt so grown-up. I've never f felt as grown-up in my entire life as I did when I was 17, but I also sometimes wanted to be a kid and go back to mom and be really scared. Um, so what would that be like, to be 17? And, and would you want to be with your friends or would you want to be with your family on the last day, for instance? So, so yeah, I tried to... Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, uh, this is getting emotional. So uh, for the genre you're writing, what do you think yeah. you've learned uh, during the process of COVID-19? I mean, did you, you know, gather a lot to write about? Uh, you mean if I had something, because I wrote the book way before COVID-19, yeah. obviously. So, so um, Exactly. Mm. Sorry, Matt. Uh, what I mean is that I know that you wrote the book way before that, but... What are you working on? Do you think uh, your um, your thoughts and your topics sort of changed or you know shifted in in, mm. a, in a particular direction because of COVID nineteen and what it brought to uh, our world? I see what you mean. Um, I was actually had already started on my book when when COVID happened, but but COVID has definitely affected me as a writer because I think when you when you when you're a writer and you're writing a novel, you have to sort of create a new world out of nothing, out of thin air, and and in order to do that, you have to sort of shut out reality for a while. If that makes sense, you, you can't really be too, too distracted by what's happening <laughs> in the real world. And that's been really, really difficult for obvious reasons, this era, um, to not think about, you know, to not start, like, as soon as you wake up, like, check your phone and see what's happening and see the statistics and how many dead and stuff. It's, it's um, and also all the political impact that this pandemic has. So that's been quite difficult. And also the book I'm writing actually takes place on a conference, uh, a work conference. So it's like Friday the 13th, but instead of silly teenagers, it's a bunch of co-workers who, who go to a conference in the middle of the forest. And and that's been really difficult to write a book that it comes out in April here in Sweden and not knowing if are people going to be back at work when they read this book or <laughs> are they going to look like nostalgically back on the days when you could be at work and be really annoyed with your co-workers <laughs> so but that's also quite surprisingly difficult actually yeah yeah well it's all been difficult for all of us i guess matt strandberg yeah, yeah, i'm absolutely one of the lucky ones so no complaints because you were partially prepared for this as you said in the beginning of the interview it was lovely having you yeah. on tlt world forum today thanks a lot But how about indie bookshops? I'm joined by Jessica Graham, the owner of Primrose Hill Books, to talk about how her business survives the lockdown measures. Hi there. Thanks a lot for joining us today on TRT World Forum. So um, you have more than 30 years of experience in the sector. 
and you've seen many crises before, but do you, do you think you've seen anything like this pandemic? No, not at all. Um, it was so different and so unexpected and everything happened so very quickly. Um, it was it was just a whirlwind, really. Mm -hmm. um, we had to change things very fast and um, we all had to start thinking very quickly and learn to do things in different ways. Lovely. OK, tell us how that all unfolded from the very beginning. How did you deal with the crisis? Well, from the beginning, we were we had the suspicion that a lockdown was coming, but we didn't know how long it was going to be for. Um, we didn't know how severe it was and what it would mean in terms of whether or not we could trade at all. We knew we couldn't be open, so the bookshop was closed overnight. Um, but we weren't sure how the supply lines were going to work. And that was a little problematic initially as warehouses and all the delivery people tried to make all their processes compliant. That meant things were very slow. Um, books which normally arrive every day were taking a couple of days, three days, a week sometimes to come. But they were coming and everyone was trying very hard. Uh, although we couldn't let people into the shop, uh, we had people telephoning us asking whether they could still get books. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to order things by phone and people were able to come and collect at the bookshop door. Or mostly, actually, what happened was that we did a lot of delivering and posting to them. That is so very we interesting. Do... Sorry, uh, Jessica. So do you think, uh, I mean, overall, did you have a huge drop in sales? We did, yes. Overnight, our turnover halved because um, a lot of our uh, turnover is from live events. Uh, we were doing many events a week um, in all different venues all over London, some little local ones and some very big ones in big halls and so on. And because people couldn't gather together, we could do none of that. Uh, so overnight, 50% of our turnover just disappeared. Mm -hmm. Some of it came back a little while later, but that was a, a very big shock for us. OK, so um, you said that some people were telephoning you or, you know, you were taking books uh, to their places. Tell me why a reader chooses to buy a book from uh, Primrose Hill Books or any independent bookstore in London or anywhere in the world rather than buying it, uh, you know, with a huge discount online. I think what we realised um, during this pandemic and what we've probably always known is that People like a sense of community. People like to know one another. This is a very sociable business and we like talking to each other. We realised that our customers were our friends. They were people we saw very often and regularly. People that we got to know over years, people I'd recommended to uh, books to because I knew their tastes or their interests or knew about their families. And people like that personal touch, you know. It's different to uh, order something anonymously online. It's, it's nice to have someone recommend something that they've been enjoying or something that they think a member of the family might like um, and people were very keen to be loyal they could see that small businesses were suffering and they didn't want to put their business somewhere anonymous on uh, online they wanted to still if they could support us and also other local shops in our area mm -hmm. and are you hopeful about the future of independent bookshops do you think that personal touch or the sense of community is sustainable under such circumstances Yes, I am. I'm very hopeful because um, people that people showed us that they could really rally round. We ourselves learnt some new things. We learnt that we can be resourceful and inventive. Um, people, I think, spending more time at home began to appreciate the neighbourhoods, began to understand, you know, how small shops worked, and really were very keen to maintain that. They didn't want to lose that in their area, um, and people pulled together. You know, there was a, a, a lot of community spirit during the time of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And. Uh Overall, what do you think was the biggest challenge uh, Primrose Hill Books um, faced uh, over the um, lockdown uh, measures? Uh, I think it was getting the message across that we were still here, that we were still trying to do what we could, um, that people could still support us, keeping our spirits up. Um, initially, I had to uh, furlough my staff, so I was here on my own, which was a bit lonely, and I realised how much I do spend talking to people all day long and how much I value what they give me as well as what we can provide them. Mm -hmm. And um, so what are the steps you think you're going to be taking uh, this point on uh, to stay in business, really? Uh, well, we'll be doing more deliveries, I think. Uh, we've been doing that again over this second lockdown, more posting, um, more certainly more online um, sales. We have our own website and we're also part of bookshop.org, which is a, a platform for all independent bookshops in the UK. Um, and that represents for people an alternative to shopping with bigger online retailers. And 
that the response to that has been really encouraging. People like that very much. They like the idea that even if they're not in London, if they're perhaps isolating somewhere else, or they're away, or they've got family out of London, those people can still buy through us, but at a distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned uh, that sense of community a few times during the course of the interview. That's why I'm asking this question. Do you think there is anything that could be done, or that should be done, really, uh, to keep that spirit online? I mean, you said that you're organizing a lot of events, so maybe, you know, having online events. I don't know. Yes, certainly. We could, we've been doing online events and that's been working quite well. It's not quite the same as being in the room with an author, um, but it, it is good and we varied the format. So we've been doing some events which have interviews, which have people in conversation. And the nice thing about that is that anyone in the world can join in. So you can have a much more varied debate sometimes. Uh, we've been experimenting with different formats, but sometimes it's a conversation, sometimes more of an interview. And, and that's good. That's interesting for people and it's something different. And for us, that's a challenge mm -hmm. okay so um when this whole thing is gone hopefully when covid19 ends if it ever ends which it will um do, let's not jinx it here but um what do you think what kind of a lesson you'll be left with when it all ends because you've been in business for 30 years and if you learned something new uh from covid19 then that should be a very important lesson <laughs> Absolutely. You have to learn to just keep going and to never give up and to, to trust people that they will do their best. You know, my staff came back to work hugely enthusiastic. Um, we learned that our suppliers were inventive too. Um, our customers were very appreciative of us. Um, they still love personal recommendations. We've just done a Christmas catalogue with all our recommendations in and people have been very excited about that. So we learned that continuity and just keeping on was really very, very significant. Okay. Keeping on is the message here, Jessica Graham. It was lovely having you. Thanks a lot. That's it from me, Elif Bereketli, for now on TRT World Forum. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and sharing their thoughts with us on how the publishing industry was affected by the pandemic, why people turn to dystopias, what steps to take in order to stay in business and whether independent publishers and bookstores are likely to be able to survive COVID-19. TRT World Forum 2020 will continue to discuss shifting dynamics, the international order in a post-pandemic world. Do stay with us.
Welcome back to the 2020 TRT World Forum. I'm Efnan Han. Over the next 90 minutes, I'll be joined by four guests from different parts of the world to unpack the effects the coronavirus pandemic has had on countries most in need. Politics and pandemics, humanitarian aid during the time of COVID-19, a topic that has often been swept under the rug because of maybe how uncomfortable it may make one feel or because it's not an issue that directly affects us and our daily lives. However, it is a discussion that needs to be made more now than ever because people who were already facing unbearable living conditions have found themselves in a worse situation just when maybe asking themselves, well, how worse can it get? I'd like to start off by introducing my guests. I am joined today by Francesco Rocca, who is the president of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. I'm also joined by, economic, uh, by uh, the special representative on migration and refugees for the Council of the European Secretary General, General Zdravoslav Stefanak, the assistant uh, executive director of the United Nations World Food Program, Valerie N. Guarneri, will also be contributing to our discussion today. And last but not least, we are expecting Jorge Moreira da Silva, who is the Director for Cooperation and Development of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development to join us later in the program. Now, thank you all so much for joining us today here um, at the 2020 TRT World Forum. Now, the coronavirus pandemic has without a doubt affected our lives one way or another. And there are people across the globe that are feeling the consequences of this pandemic uh, much worse than we can ever imagine. Francesco, I want to begin with you. You're leading a prominent uh, organization that provides aid to people in need. How has the coronavirus pandemic changed the way your organization operates and the amount of aid that it's been able to deliver? Uh, thank you for the question, and first of all, let me thank again uh, the, the World Forum to, uh, for uh, having me and inviting me and, and uh, making it possible to, to represent the, the Red Cross Red Crescent family in, uh, in this uh, important event. So uh, the, the, the situation is very dire, it's very difficult on the ground. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, we are uh, in, in a very difficult situation. I want to give you some example of how difficult it is in the situation for us uh, without uh, repeating what we have heard in many occasions uh, by, by the media, by, the, by our colleagues uh, about the facing the pandemics. Uh, I want just to refer about what has happened just in Central America a few weeks uh, ago with uh, the two hurricanes, one after the other, Ita and Yota, that uh, struck in countries uh, that was heavily affected Maybe in other periods we had uh, these, uh, we would have uh, these, uh, these news on the headlines of many newspapers on the media, but unfortunately, it's not, we don't have um, enough coverage and uh, more important than this, uh, uh, enough uh, uh, support from the traditional donors uh, and uh, impacting uh, the most vulnerable, the, the most vulnerable community when you are trying to respond in the poorest area, the most difficult areas uh, in that countries like Guatemala, Honduras, uh, uh, this is Nicaragua, uh, which are uh, paying a high price to the, to the pandemic, a high price to the socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic. Our work, I can say, this is very, very difficult, uh, and uh, we, are, we are missing, uh, badly missing the support, because, of course, many of the donors, uh, the, the traditional donors, the governments, of course, have turned... Uh, uh, to, to, to support uh, internally the needs of their own country. So we are uh, not only the Red Cross, Red Cross and family, but the entire humanitarian system in this moment is heavily underfunded uh, to cope with the several uh, crises, protracted crises uh, or multiple crises, uh, like I mentioned uh, in that area, but we can give you several other examples. Uh, so this is, uh, this is in this moment uh, is our uh, biggest challenge that we are, uh, we are, passing, uh, we are passing through. 
Right. Um, now, Europe, particularly Italy, uh, was quick to become one of the epicenters of the pandemic. And according to the UN Refugee Agency, more than 85,000 uh, people fled into Europe this year alone. Is it fair to say, Drauslav, I want to continue with you, is it fair to say that the refugee crisis was not a top priority for leaders across the EU once the pandemic hit the continent? Yes, uh, yes, yes and no. Uh, migrants and refugees are, are, are vulnerable group of population in any case, in any case scenario, even without, 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 without pandemics. Uh, so now with, with COVID-19 and, and uh, Corona uh, time and epoch, uh, they became even more vulnerable and, and this situation was exacerbated. Uh, what, what we could see at the beginning and in the, in the first wave in the, in the, in the spring of Europe, uh, of course, the, the national governments were, were trying to protect their, their population. And we saw the, the, the rise of, I would say, negative narrative or, or, or perceptions of, of migrants even more because they could be then seen even as uh, potential COVID carri carriers. <clears throat> At the same time, if we speak in the situation in the camps or, or uh, centers, they are quite packed down. Usually, usually they, the capacity is, is uh, uh, not sufficient for, 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 hosting, for hosting them, for hosting those those crowds so it's difficult it was difficult to to manage the situation in in those uh, centers or in the, in those uh, facilities how you can do social distancing when when you when you have uh, 10 more people in the in, in the in the center or in the facility than you should you should have so uh, i think in the in the meantime the situation has, has changed and i'm i'm saying that uh, every time every crisis is also bringing its opportunities and today I, I, I heard some news from Italy and there were some, some good news also from, 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 other from the other European countries to engage actually the, the, the Bangladesh refugees in providing the services in the, in the healthcare. Of course, it, uh, provided they have proper uh, background or, or, or education or, or other, other, other services to help, to help people uh, or, or population in the, in, in, in the pan uh, pandemic. So we should, also, we should also think about this positive kind of angle that how to how to engage migrants and refugees into addressing the crisis right uh Draslav, i'd like to um pause you there for a second because it seems like george moriera da silva uh, has been able to connect with us here on tr2 world let me just remind our viewers that he's mm -hmm. the director for cooperation and development of the organization for economic cooperation and development thank you so much sir for joining us on the program uh, today. Draslav, uh, if you would like, I'd like to continue with you. How about the treatment of uh, refugees and migrants since the pandemic hit? Yesterday, um, during the opening session of the forum, uh, the Turkey's communications director, Fahrettin Altun, uh, mentioned the harsh sentiment Europeans have towards migrants and refugees, but also mentioned the two Turkish-German scientists that came out with the vaccine that could potentially wipe out this virus. And he mentioned how in some countries, refugees and migrants are treated so poorly that they're even blamed uh, for the pandemic. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, again, I'm coming to the narrative which, which has been negative even before, before COVID, COVID crisis, uh, unfortunately. And also, this is one of my, my tasks and the task of the international organizations to change it. Of course, they, they have, they, they are, there are many issues uh, involved, uh, including the, uh, in, in some of the European countries, including the security issues. On, 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 on the vac vaccine and vaccination, I would like to recall the, the statement made by the International Orga Organization on Migration, IOM. And that, that's a, that's a, that, that is a good point, and I, I think you have raised it, because now I hear more and more statements about, about the vaccination of the population, but we don't hear much about the vaccination of, of migrants. So uh, I would like to make also take also this opportunity to, to call on states uh, when um, engaging in, in the vaccination campaign, which will probably start the, the, the next year, I think in the spring, they, they should not for, forget migrants. Uh, 
because because that that would be a mistake. We I would I would say one one one, one sentence which is I think quite often quoted: uh, No one no one is safe until everyone is safe. So if we leave this this group kind of aside, that can that can backfire in the in a in a, in, a, in a long run. Of course, we the migrants and refugees in general they have very difficult access to healthcare. Usually they they have limited insur health insurance or no insurance at all. Uh, you, are, you have also language problems. So how to approach the the local authorities when you, when you don't speak the language of the of the of the destination country and so on and so so forth. It's a, it's a, it's a long it's a long run, but uh, but uh, there are many good of uh, migrants and refugees helping actually the the, uh, the local population. We have to speak more about about those. There was uh, also some good examples in your country in 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 Turkey and, and many cities, if not governments. Have provided uh, good programs for for migrants and refugees, and I would mention, for instance, Portugal as a as a country which uh, which uh, extended the the uh, residence permits for for migrants for temporarily during the the, the COVID pandemic. Right. You mentioned the uh, vaccination process for migrants and refugees, Roslav, and we'll get into that later um, in the program. Mm -hmm. Valerie, I want to cross to you and to another uh, part of the world and focus on Yemen for a second here because it is facing the worst famine the world uh, has witnessed for decades and it's a very serious problem and you work for the um, World Food Program. Just explain to us if you can how dire the situation is there um, for the people there at the moment and ultimately how the pandemic has affected your organization and the amount of aid and food that it's been able to provide? So much for the question. And, and first of all, what we've seen broadly, globally, is that hunger has been on the rise in the past few years, mainly driven by conflict, climate, and economic disparities. And COVID has come on top of that, um, really exacerbating the situation and deepening the hunger, particularly for the most vulnerable. And, and in that context, we've seen an 80% rise in the people who are acutely hungry, 270 million people facing starvation this year as a result of these multitude of, uh, of crises, including COVID. And we have four countries um, that are literally at the brink of famine, uh, South Sudan, Northern Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and Yemen. So you asked specifically about Yemen. Yemen is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world right now. We have 20 million people, two thirds of the population, who are um, who really don't know from one moment to the next where their meal is going to come from. The country itself is already dependent. 90% of the food consumed is brought in uh, from abroad. And WFP has been feeding uh, more than 12 million people on a regular basis through a massive humanitarian assistance program. So all of these factors really come home to roost in, um, in Yemen. There have been access challenges in terms of reaching the most vulnerable, operational difficulties in terms of identifying and targeting in order to make sure that available assistance reaches those who are uh, most at risk of, uh, of, of famine. Um, and then funding challenges. This is a massive operation. And that has required a continual pipeline of cash uh, for purchasing food and for addressing other basic needs among the population. So uh, we, we continue to work in, in Yemen along with many UN agencies and NGO partners looking to ensure that those basic food, water, health and nutrition, uh, those care needs for the population are, um, are, are met. Um, it requires a, a massive undertaking, but for sure, Yemen is, is very much at the front of our minds when we're looking at a hunger pandemic evolving um, as a result of COVID's compounding effect. All right, uh, Valerie, thank you for that. Now, George, I want to cross uh, over to you. And one of the major impacts COVID-19 has had on our world is the economy, and it's clearly affecting every 
element uh, in our world, especially as Valerie mentioned, um, providing aid to the people most in, in need to countries around the world. And every country is trying its hardest to not go into recession uh, while being able to provide as much as it can uh, for its citizens. What role did the OECD play till now in combating the repercussions of the pandemic? Thank you very much. I'm really glad to join this conversation. Uh, the OECD, as you know, uh, uh, while being uh, a group of countries uh, with a certain level of, of development and wealth, uh, is not uh, focusing just on uh, rescuing uh, our economies, but uh, by country uh, helping uh, uh, to boost uh, international solidarity and cooperation in this context. So uh, we have this, uh, this different expertise from different uh, directorates. We created this um, data-driven response with the uh, with uh, responses from, from different areas. But in my area, the area on development cooperation, being the secretariat of the DAC, the Development Assistance Committee, we have been mainly focusing on identifying uh, 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 not just the needs, but, but the real responses through ODA and beyond ODA through public money, but also beyond the public uh, support. And unfortunately, based in our uh, research, we just launched a few days ago, a global outlook on financing for sustainable development. What we are seeing could be uh, named as a collapse of the development uh, finance system. Uh, I, I'm not exaggerating uh, what uh, uh, we have brought uh, in terms of analysis and facts is that before the crisis, uh, we were missing 2.5 trillion dollars uh, uh, to implement SDGs. Now we are missing 4.2. Uh, uh, based on our analysis, uh, developing countries uh, are facing uh, additional uh, needs of 1 trillion uh, to deal with the crisis. Uh, and furthermore, uh, there is a, a drop on external finance uh, to developing countries due to uh, the huge drop on foreign direct investment uh, and remittances. At the same time that we know that developing countries are facing uh, the perfect storm, not just uh, uh, the reduction on private finance through uh, uh, the portfolio investments, uh, foreign direct investment, uh, also uh, uh, dealing uh, with, uh, with, with, with the poverty and the levels of poverty uh, uh, that are being faced now push us back two or three decades, but also with limited space uh, to use uh, the fiscal policies. Uh, because several of these countries were already highly indebted for the crisis. So this is a moment where we have to avoid uh, uh, three myths or three uh, false dichotomies. It's dealing with this crisis, uh, 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 focusing only in our own countries, uh, uh, not understanding that we have an obligation of supporting uh, our citizens, our economies, but at the same time, uh, boosting this collaboration, helping others to address the crisis. Second, we have to avoid uh, a false dichotomy between this crisis and climate crisis and inequalities and poverty. We cannot make uh, a blind choice. We have to address in the response to COVID uh, uh, also uh, all crises, including climate and inequalities. And, and finally, we have to avoid this false dichotomy between policy and finance. Uh, finance alone won't fix the problem. Let me give you one figure. We have three, $379 trillion available in the financial market, capital market, uh, uh, insurance, uh, uh, institutional investments. Uh, so the problem is not uh, the, the, the availability of the resources, is the policies to ensure that we align all resources with SDGs and only 1% additional uh, 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 funds from this 379 would be sufficient to fill the, the gap that we are now facing. So this is a moment for um, uh, multilateralism, for collaborations, for solidarity. Uh, and uh, of course, the OECD uh, is happy to join forces with other international organizations, uh, with developing countries and with the members of the, the OECD. Great point you made there, George. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but do you think there was a drastic change in economies around the world uh, once the announcement of a vaccine was made? Well, let me say something before the vaccine and after the vaccine. I think that uh, there was a response from the UN, from World Bank, from uh, multilateralism that was compelling. I know that we tend to 
uh, uh, to identify uh, problems and uh, and efficiency issues, but I think it's important to recognize that there was uh, an overall effort uh, uh, that was coordinated. Also, the role of the G20 uh, uh, was was relevant in this context. Again, UN and World Bank providing uh, uh, concrete support to developing countries in the short term. But I think that also the DAC members, the, the members of the Development Assistance Committee, uh, according to our initial figures, uh, uh, $12 billion were mobilized uh, to uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, response through uh, members of the of the OECD. Uh, of course, part of that uh, uh, is 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 um, uh, a reallocation of resources. But I'm still confident that we are seeing some additional uh, uh, resources being provided. Several members of the OECD has uh, uh, identified in recent weeks additional resources. So beyond reallocation of resources, so I'm still confident that ODA will be resilient. Uh, to this uh, crisis, but ODA alone won't fix the problem. Let's make no mistake. Um, uh, OECD countries, but also G20 equ economies, managed to uh, uh, provide $11 trillion plan to rescue their economies. However, uh, uh, we, are, we still have a level of ODA that is around $153 billion. Uh, of course, uh, we won't fix the problem uh, uh, through the billions. We will need the trillions, but we need to ensure that the trillions are aligned with SDGs rather than just crowding in public and private money. So the role of public money to, to catalyze private investment is vital. But let me say something about the vaccines. Uh, uh, the, the, access, the access to vaccines will be a game changer on, 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 on multilateralism and on uh, collaboration and coordination. And uh, some signals are worrying. Uh, we, we know uh, that uh, there is huge pressure in our uh, constituencies uh, to get access to the vaccines the soonest, uh, and we risk to have developing countries uh, not getting the access uh, 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 as a, a matter of priority. So good signals are also emerging from COVAX uh, and the, the, uh, the ACT initiative. But again, uh, we have to ensure that um, developing countries will have uh, uh, the vaccines uh, uh, in a in a in an equal uh, and well coordinated uh, uh, manner. So th there is there is a uh, uh, the need clearly for a good plan, not just on mobilization of resources, because for many many uh, months we have been focusing on getting the resources to Covax, getting the donors providing the resources to Covax, right. uh, get scientists getting the vaccine. Right. Now we have to focus on ensuring the equal access to vaccine uh, by developing countries. Very interesting point uh, you made there. I just want to bring in Drauslav now. Is there a specific, taking into consideration the treatment that uh, of refugees and migrants in Europe that we were speaking about earlier, is there going to be a protocol that will be followed when it comes to refugees being able to get vaccinated? Uh, or are they going to be placed in another category where they are only going to be able to have that access to the vaccination after EU citizens get vaccinated? Well, I hope, I hope that there will, there will be no discrimination and they will, they will get the access uh, as, as, as uh, we, with, of course, all, all categories of the, of the, of the, of the population. We, we can't treat those, those people. Those people are, first of all, human, human beings. And if I also recall, Recall the uh, provision of Oviedo Convention, uh, which must be upheld. Uh, it requires that the access to the existing uh, resources should be m guided by medical criteria. So, so we should not create any 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 category categories which are more favorable or, or, or less favorable. Of course, I understand. I'm I'm not a doctor. I'm uh, I'm a lawyer. I understand that the vaccination will be first uh, given to. To the to 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 those group of uh, professions like doctors or medical services and the elderly population which are most critically critically hit, but in the migrants or refugees uh, population there are different different segments. You have you have elderly population, you have you have women, you have pregnant women, you have uh, children, so you you have all the uh, it's basically the, the 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 segments of the population of 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 a, of a uh, receiving country. Uh, so simply, uh, now I can only say that we are saying or calling uh, 
uh, that migrants and refugees should not be left out. Uh, and that, that is the call which should be made already today, and it's already made by the, as I recalled, International Organization on, on Migration. And this call should be, should be strengthened when the real vaccination will, will, come, will come and will be implemented in uh, beginning of the year or, 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 or in the spring of the 2021. 20, uh, 20, I, I, we are not, I'm, we are not human humanitarian organizations, so I can't tell you details uh, about the about the actual implementation of the of the vaccination. But but we will look at that definitely also from the from the protocol. Right. Um... I think there's a slight problem in your connection, Draslov. I didn't really get what you uh, last said there. But taking your expertise into consideration, what do you think needs to be done while working with refugees and migrants and making sure that they do indeed uh, receive some sort of treatment and vaccination and better the healthcare system for these uh, people that are put in a vulnerable category? Uh, as I said, I don't know if you heard my, my first intervention. I think there should be no 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 discrimination and no differentiation between the between the population of the of the destination country and and, and migrants and refugees. I, I, I all human beings are are equal and should should get the standard according to medical mm -hmm. medical needs. So uh, I also rely on the on the humanitarian organizations on the UNHCR IOM. And also on the on the on the on the non-governmental sector to, to to help with this, but I don't see I don't see any 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 difference between between people who are migrants or refugees and they are on the territory of a of a, of a receiving country and the the rest of the population. All right, Draslav, thank you. Um, now, Francesco, I just want to cross over to you, given that we're speaking about refugees and migrants, and whether it be in Sudan or across Europe or in Asia. It really brings us down to thinking, well, the Western world won't have much to worry about when it comes to attaining these promising vaccines done by Pfizer and Moderna. But we can't ignore the fact that the millions of people living in camps across the world, for example, in Syria's Idlib province, probably won't be able to get uh, vaccinated with these so-called good vaccines. What do you think needs to be done uh, in that front? So I, I think that my, my answer is not very far from what Mr. Uh, Stefanik just, uh, just said. I think that it's important to call the governments to, to give an equal opportunity and equal access uh, to every, every human being. This is why we are so vocal uh, in advocating uh, for, for protecting uh, uh, the, the, the vulnerable communities. And of course, uh, when we talk about vulnerable communities, migrants and refugees are, are uh, maybe the... the, the, the the most vulnerable one in this uh, particular moment uh, because uh, several factors that we discussed uh, in many occasions. But so back to the point, when we look at uh, the overcrowded, uh, overcrowded uh, refugees camp, uh, you mentioned uh, Syria, I can add uh, Alol, uh, not only the Glib situation, but also Alol, uh, where, uh, where uh, thousands of, uh, and, and tens of thousands of women and, and children are stuck. And uh, other uh, or uh, Kok Bazaar. So these is, uh, are places on which the, the, the spread of the virus is very, the risk of the spread of the virus is very, very high. So this is, should be prioritized uh, by, by, by the governments in protecting uh, these vulnerable communities because protecting them means protecting us. This is what should be understood uh, by, by every, everyone. Because uh, uh, we, we mentioned uh, you know, the motto that we are using all the international uh, actors, no, 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 safe uh, if everyone is safe. That means that we cannot use uh, the, the vaccine as a nationalistic tool. I've, I've stated this very, very clear, because if our neighbor is not safe, we are not safe. And this is the dynamic at global level is like the one that we live in our own buildings where we live. So we have to protect everyone. This is something that must go beyond a xenophobic approach and, and other things that unfortunately we are experiencing, especially in the Western country, growing and growing. We must be very rational. We must uh, uh, torpedo 
this wave of fake news, uh, not allowing that the uh, opposite is happening, uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the big spread of fake news, especially about migrants and refugees, uh, uh, bringing the virus in the country, uh, allowing to spread uh, in, in our communities. So this is a reason of concern and we must be vocal. Because, of course, it's not up to us. I think, with all the respect for my colleagues present today, we are not the one. This is the, it's about, uh, it's about the, the governments that might take their own responsibility. And, uh, and this is the moment uh, on which we have to prioritize uh, who are the most vulnerable, and starting from them. Of course, my, I'm not a medical doctor, too. But I'm a, I'm a person that lives with the, with the foot concretely on the ground. And I think that it's our common responsibility of the mankind to protect the most vulnerable. And this is a, we don't need a genius uh, to, understand, uh, to understand. This is why we are very, very concerned on the so-called nationalistic approach on this. And uh, about, if I understood correctly your question about the other vaccines, uh, let's wait. Let's wait for our uh, uh, regulatory authorities uh, to, to study, to verify the other vaccines that are coming not from the traditional one. You mentioned, you know, we are talking about Moderna, we are talking about Pfizer, and we know that there is also Oxford AstraZeneca one, which, uh, which is under, uh, is finalizing uh, the, the presentation. But then we know perfectly that Russia is, uh, is studying one, China is studying another one. Let's wait for the regulatory authorities to say something. We don't have to jump in the scientific dialogue. This is the huge mistake that also we are making. Let's do the scientists that work. We must trust and we must not torpedo the, 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 the trust that every citizen in the world must have in the regulatory authorities. We must protect them. This is a very delicate moment because uh, with this I close, sorry, where this virus is also a, a factor of um, it is, um, it is accelerating some uh, bad feeling about the authorities. So it's, uh, it's our responsibility to protect the regulatory authorities in this moment. Right. Um, Francesco, you mentioned that uh, it's our job to make sure and prevent that outbreaks in camps like the ones in Syria and South Sudan, uh, that outbreaks don't happen in these camps to protect our uh, wider community. Um, as a humanitarian aid organization, what is the Red Cross and Red Crescent Fe Federation doing uh, to make sure that mass outbreaks don't occur in those very cramped camps? Hi, of course. Uh, the, 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 um, we are working hard in the places where we are working together with the other uh, humanitarian actors uh, in uh, disseminating uh, the good practices uh, because we can do nothing more than this uh, in, the, in this uh, moment because we are talking also about countries which do not have uh, enough access uh, even to the treatment. Uh, we must be also very honest. So the, 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 the best that we can do is how to, to, to disseminate uh, how it's important to wear the mask, how it is important, uh, which is quite a uh, ironic uh, physical distance uh, when we talk uh, in the overcrowded, uh, in the overcrowded camp, how it's important, uh, personal hygiene and washing the hands. Uh, this is, uh, and building trust, building trust. Again, uh, trust uh, is, uh, is something extremely important uh, to protect also the environment on which the humanitarian actor are, uh, are working. And the good side of these, uh, is the aspect that we are working in this moment more than ever through the local actors, through our volunteers and the local communities, uh, so that are taking care of themselves uh, and of these camps, uh, because uh, uh, there are uh, they, they are the only actor because the, the travel ban, the, because the, the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, is making the life of the international uh, organization uh, more difficult. Uh, and this is the good occasion for the local actors to do their job, which we also uh, always advocated about it. Uh, and so this is a good moment also is that, that is, is happening through the community and, uh, and uh, with the, within the communities. Uh, and this is something that I'm very proud of. Uh, of the role that uh, the, the volunteers of the Red Crescent and the Red Cross, but also of the other humanitarian organization at local level are doing. All right, I want to bring in Valerie here for a second. If you can elaborate a bit on what uh, Francesco has been explaining to us by taking into consideration the uh, humanitarian crisis that's happening at the moment in Ethiopia, where thousands and thousands of people are fleeing into South Sudan. Um, and I know the UN is following the situation there very closely. They've already asked the Ethiopian government to 
open up aid corridors so organizations like the World Food Program can get um, basic necessities to the people very much in need there. Just if you can elaborate on what Francesco said and give us some insight into what uh, the people in Ethiopia and in the camps in South Sudan are dealing with at the moment. Well, um, thank you, thank you for that. And and picking up on on Francesco, I I would I would say that with the um, with the virus, um, WFP along with with um, with members of the entire humanitarian community um, very quickly adapted our operations and our mode of delivery and distribution in order to make them more safe, more safe for the people who we serve and reach, and more safe also for our our, our staff uh, and our partners to avoid any transmission or cross transmission. And, and that involved steps like decongesting distribution points, um, removing some of the, the, the more you know, closer face-to-face -face interactions and, and using remote uh, interactions where possible, um, using uh, cash transfers in, in, in situations and electronic cash transfers in situations where food was available in the market, um, but um, people didn't have the means in which to, to, to purchase it, um, but removing some of the uh, or or adapting some of the identification criteria like for instance fingerprint identification in order to avoid uh, many people touching the the same uh, the same devices uh, so a lot of steps taken of course the protective equipment for uh, staff and partners and for beneficiaries and the social distancing that Francesco uh, highlighted is also a key um, a key part of that um, but what what we're generally finding, in addition to that, and despite the importance of that, that in the 83 countries where we work on the ground, it's the socioeconomic impact of the virus that is driving vulnerability more than the risk of the disease itself. And so that is the main uh, um, impact that we're seeking to, to, to address. And, and we, you know, 20 countries have seen the cost of basic food items go up um, by 10%. A few countries, Sudan, Lebanon, have seen a doubling of prices of basic food items in the market. In Syria, we've seen the prices go up triple, three times. So all of this basically ensures that people, their access to, to, to food and basic, basic needs is hindered both on the one hand by the rising prices of these items and also by the job losses and the remittance losses that are severely impacting um, their, um, their, their, their income streams, basically. And so it's because of this that we've seen the needs go up um, so, so high on top of the conflict and the, um, and the, the, the climate shocks. And so you, you reference specifically Ethiopia, the situation in, um, in the Tigray region is another example of how conflict impacts both on the ability of populations, including the, um, the 800,000 people who were already dependent on assistance in the Tigray region um, pre this, um, this, this conflict, um, but it impacts their ability to access services and of course, it impacts the ability of, uh, of humanitarian actors, international and local, to deliver and support the population directly. So uh, we have been working as, as part of the entire UN community with stocks available already in the region uh, to use those to the extent possible. We've had a continuous dialogue with the government um, uh, uh, in order to, uh, to enable access to replenish those stocks and to ensure full assistance to the population. And then of course, assistance has been scaling up for those who have fled uh, the region to, um, to, to other countries um, through the normal refugee response uh, mechanisms. And, and so all of these cylinders are, are, are fired uh, simultaneously, and we're hopeful uh, that we will soon have full and unimpeded access to the vulnerable population in Tigray. And, and that, of course, is both our expectation and an obligation of the government. If I'm remembering correctly, you said 250 million people 
are hungry and are in need of food at the moment around the world. How important is government cooperation with an organization like the World Food Program to ensure that uh, you're able to deliver uh, food into these countries in need? So just to clarify, there's 690 million hungry people around the world. Uh, but within that, we have 270 million acutely hungry. This is literally people who don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Uh, and they're the target of our, uh, of our emergency um, action. This year, WFP, uh, we normally reach 100 million people uh, in a given year. We're on track to, to uh, or we've already reached that number this year, but we're scaling up operations to reach 138 million people uh, with, with basic emergency assistance in order to, to ensure that that next meal for them is covered, whether by providing them with food or by providing them and connecting them with the cash that they could use to purchase that food in the, in the market where they're finding prices are, are, are going up. So um, our work absolutely uh, requires cooperation. We, uh, we, we need to, we work with the assurance um, and the invitation actually of the, uh, of the government to provide our, our support. We count on government in, um, in uh, accordance with international humanitarian law and good moral behavior uh, to provide the, the access and security that we need in order to reach and assist the most vulnerable in a, uh, in, a, in a manner that's in full accordance with humanitarian principles. So allowing us to identify and target the most needy, impartiality, to work neutrally um, without, uh, without support for political views and, uh, and in, in favor of, of, of humanity, and to have the operational independence that we require to do our, um, our, our work. So in the countries where we work, we rely on that. Um, in difficult situations, we work closely both with national government, but also with local authorities on the ground in order to ensure that assistance is provided. Uh, but not only are we looking for government cooperation, we're also looking for government action uh, because far beyond uh, the very important and essential humanitarian assistance that were provided and that were supported to provide by the generosity of the of the donors that finance us, um, but these uh, these needs with hunger with health needs, with, with all of these issues, require governments themselves to be stepping up and strengthening their own safety nets and social protection systems in order to reach the most vulnerable. And so a good part of our job is to strengthen those systems to ensure uh, that they are um, providing the level of assistance necessary and that they're inclusive of those who are most vulnerable in the country. Um, but fundamentally, those are national systems that government is, um, is empowered to, uh, to create, to deploy, and ultimately to finance, even if there is uh, support that is provided um, from time to time. So, so we do count on that engagement of governments fundamentally to get the job done. Right, Valerie, I was completely off on that number. Thank you so much for correcting me there. I want to bring in George uh, now. And George, one of the promises of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by all United Nations uh, member states in 2015 was to leave nobody behind. Do you think countries could have taken the necessary steps towards that promise despite the pandemic? Well, we were already off track before the, the pandemic, so let's make no mistake. So the question now is um, how to ensure that we use the, the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda as the right framework to uh, address the short-term needs, the emergency, but also uh, a, a response uh, for the mid and the long term. And I think that we tend to reinvent the wheel too often. And I think that in this case, we just need to go from uh, design to implementation on the SDGs, on uh, the other components of the uh, of the 2030 agenda, including the financing for sustainable 
development. But this is also an important moment to uh, address fragility. Uh, as, as other colleagues mentioned in this panel, uh, this crisis uh, just uh, put it an additional layer on already uh, highly fragile context. Uh, as you know, the OECD, through the State of Fragility report, we have been insisting on the fact that, unfortunately, 76% 76, 76 of the poorest live in fragile contexts. And our report shows that this crisis, the pandemic, is exacerbating the fragility dimensions in those uh, countries. So we really need to uh, uh, address the prevention agenda. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has been uh, insisting in this point. This is the moment uh, for uh, giving priority to the prevention agenda. Uh, and this also uh, tells a lot about uh, how we allocate resources. Uh, you know, uh, as you know, we are the, the custodians of ODA and, and uh, we are all proud with the fact that 25% uh, of uh, ODA uh, uh, is being allocated to fragile contexts through uh, humanitarian uh, aid. But then if you ask how, you realize that only 4% of that is being allocated to prevention and only 13% to peace building. So we have to do more, uh, not just mobilizing resources, but ensuring that uh, we address the root causes of fragility and we uh, place the prevention uh, uh, agenda at the top. And this is also a very important moment to get rid of these um, uh, fragmented discussions of humanitarian development and peace. Uh, we have a nexus agenda, and now with the with the new uh, uh, recommendation agreed at OECD on on the nexus humanitarian development piece, uh, we have to apply it in a in a concrete manner when we program, when we plan, and when we finance. And I think that this crisis, the 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 COVID, is a, a, a stress test for this uh, nexus. So I think it's important uh, that when we um, address the humanitarian needs in the short term, and this is vital. Uh, creating, of course, the focus on the safety nets, uh, everything that colleagues already mentioned. Uh, we also create the conditions uh, to address the response through development uh, uh, to the to the to the post-COVID. And I think that that bringing the lessons learned from this crisis uh, when addressing global, global public goods is also important. We know that the multilateral system uh, is vital. With this crisis, uh, I think it's it's something that is tangible for everybody in the street. So this is not for experts, for uh, civil society, for NGOs, for international organizations. Now everybody knows, as Francesco mentioned, that we are only safe when everybody is safe. And uh, this uh, uh, idea of the global public goods being more tangible at the national level on politics, I think that the topic for this conversation on politics is very important. We need to bring this global public goods to the politics, to the discussion, to the, to the discussion with citizens. So, as you can see, I have some hope that uh, this crisis will be uh, a, a, a source of inspiration to deal with other crises uh, that we have been facing and others that unfortunately uh, will have uh, may have uh, even higher impacts such as climate. I want to pick up on your comment on finances and cross over to Francesco. Now, before the pandemic, we had thousands of people in need of humanitarian assistance, but now with the pandemic, that number is increasing as time passes and governments uh, are using the money that they have in hand to uh, force stimulus packages in their countries. Has this had an impact on, um, on organizations like the one you work for in the amount of funding that you've been receiving? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, and, uh, I, I told, um, I, as I said it during my, my, my first uh, answer, uh, of course, we, we are uh, really, really concerned because uh, all the operations, uh, not only the, the Federation operation, but also Baba colleague of the ICSC and the other humanitarian uh, organization, all the appeals uh, are badly uh, underfunded. And this is uh, as, a matter, uh, as a matter of fact. What we are hoping for, because of course we are calling to receive more support, we are asking for uh, for having a, uh, financial support from the traditional donors, uh, and also identify new way, new way to to to, to um, uh, find money and resources uh, to support uh, our national societies working uh, working on the ground. We do hope uh, that um, 
the recovery plan that the international community and the governments are setting up to, to tackle the, the social economic crisis will be green and resilient and inclusive. This is a huge opportunity to be optimistic for the future. So again, uh, in this particular moment, it's not about, unfortunately, as a matter of fact, we are passing through heavy difficulty, serious difficulty in uh, fulfilling our mandate uh, on the ground uh, for, uh, for the lack of funds, but we are doing desperately what, uh, what is needed to support those needs. On the other hand, I think that the governments uh, have the ball on the, in their hands and they can make the difference on this big plan that they are setting up uh, to, to tackle the, the, the uh, socio-economic consequences of, of the. If these investments will be green, resilient and inclusive, uh, that we could make the difference uh, in the middle term. And we will see the, the good consequences and the good benefits, especially in the, in the poorest country to the, uh, towards the most vulnerable communities in the, in, a, in a middle term. And this is, a, is something that is making me optimistic, uh, of course. Then we will see concrete facts and we will see if the government uh, will be able uh, to match uh, these expectations that are coming from, uh, from the, the, the humanitarian actors. But by the way, of course, uh, I, I, I told you this in this moment, uh, we are uh, we are doing our utmost uh, with uh, with few resources, uh, facing uh, several challenges, uh, and I uh, think uh, Valerie mentioned uh, places on which there are protracted crises for many years, uh, and uh, and uh, COVID nineteen and the socio economical consequences of the COVID nineteen are uh, are uh, creating uh, uh, heavy consequences in places that were uh, yet devastated by the, the previous crisis uh, for too many years uh, for too long. So. Uh, this is the situation in which we are uh, working, uh, but uh, even uh, even with these difficulties, uh, I'm uh, like Jorge, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic for the future. I think uh, as humanitarian, we must be optimistic, uh, and I want uh, this is a, this is a, is a, is an important train that is passing in the hands of the international community, in the hands of the powerful countries to make the difference uh, for 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 the future. No matter how difficult is the moment, I think uh, that the responsibility now lay in their hands uh, and in their plans. So let's see what is going to happen in the next uh, weeks uh, and months. Valerie, is the World Food Programme sharing the same concerns as the IFRC, as uh, Francesco mentioned there? Well, we're, we're 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 sharing the same concerns. I think we we can't we can't help but be concerned. Uh, this year, we did have um, uh, and work, worked very hard to to receive generous contributions from our um, from our member state donors, and as a result of that, we have been uh, reaching our, um, our our funding targets uh, for 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 this year. Um, but we are still the needs are still outpacing substantially the amount of resources that that are at our disposal, and when we look forward to 2021 we're concerned like like you know like Francesco like you know like all organizations are um, that the um, the domestic pressures that that, that come with the, the the fiscal stimulus packages that nations have had to do uh, to deal with their own recessions um, may impact on their ability to be similarly generous um, in the in the face of of the growing challenges that we expect next year. So um, this is not the time to take the foot off the accelerator on 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 that one. More is needed. Um, governments need to continue to step up to address these growing uh, needs. They need to understand and and recognize and translate that recognition into their um, their their policies and their finance saying that indeed um, this is a um, we're all connected and and this is a global um, effort um, we we can't um, we can't we have to you know time is of the essence particularly when we're looking at some of these very pressing um, famine near famine uh, needs that are that are emerging as I said in um, in in four um, four countries um, and um, and we, we we need to see that continue so um, I'm 
optimistic like the others um, that, um, that that we will get that continued understanding the prospect of the um, of the vaccine and its and its equitable distribution is a um, is a ray of light that I think we all uh, we all need to need to count on um, and um, and it's really the only way to, to, to go where we're entering a bit of a dark winter and we need to be looking forward uh, to that ray of light that comes afterwards and ensuring that the most vulnerable uh, continue to be assisted with at least basic needs and that we take opportunities to build back better is absolutely key for the future of those nations, but fundamentally for the world. Right, Valerie, I wanna bring in uh, Draslav now, and I wanna talk about the amount of job cuts that we've seen across the world and in Europe. Um, and what do you, how much of a challenge do you think this is going to be for refugees and migrants in Europe to uh, make a living for themselves and their families. Spread of this this impact uh, because the situation before before COVID pandemics was more favorable. I remember actually participating uh, at the OECD conference uh, on 15 and 16 uh, January, where OECD member states were were declaring that uh, migrants are needed actually for for uh, for to supplement the, the the labor market that the labor market of the of the eu and the oecd countries is not sufficient enough and they, they don't have sufficient labor force to 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 go on uh, so so there was a positive positive uh, i would say wave or positive direction uh, and very pragmatic direction to to engage and to to attract even migrants to for 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 number of, of positions or number number of professions. Now I yes uh, I, I'm af I'm afraid because also this uh, this uh, negative narrative is coming again that uh, people are losing jobs and and then a number of politicians across the Europe are saying yes we have migrants and refugees uh, migrants coming and we will, they will take the jobs which are not even available now to our to the to the to our local local uh, local population of course we will see how this impact will 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 be will be seen in a in in, in a long run but yes this this is this is a, a matter matter of concern maybe oecd can also provide some 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 uh, uh, prospects or visions or 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 or, or figures but we we are we are concerned about this because many many of opportunities which had been there before before March 2020 are are now gone, or many positions which were not attractive for local population and could be could be filled by by the people who saved just their 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 lives their their, their physical integrity and they they were eager to 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 continue or to to take up those 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 jobs. They are now taken, or they are they don't they don't exist. Let me bring in George uh, in then now. George, do you have any comments to make on uh, Draslav's statement? Well, I, I think that his his statement is totally aligned with our uh, work. But I would bring it even more broadly to other topics beyond uh, migration and inter and its uh, links with with economics, which is the need to have this whole policies informed by evidence and by uh, 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 well, science. I, I think that, that this crisis has revealed uh, the real need to uh, build trust on uh, institutions, on scientists uh, following their uh, advice. Uh, the same will happen on the climate uh, crisis. And I think that um, bringing the evidence uh, is fundamental when we know that social unrest and populism may use this crisis to challenge other uh, uh, policies and other assumptions. So we need, we, those that work in humanitarian and development, working at the national, uh, but also at the international level, I think that we should uh, bring the evidence case for all policies during this crisis, but beyond this crisis, for example, on vaccines. Uh, I was checking before this, this debate when everybody is so uh, uh, committed to get the vaccines access to all, that um, in 2019 uh, we have almost 14 million uh, uh, infants that did not have 
access to the normal vaccines. So we can see the challenge that we will face once we need to roll out massively these vaccines and we need to support developing countries in the distribution, but also on the rollout of these vaccines. The same will happen on that. So I think that in terms of collaboration, and you asked this to Valerie as well uh, in your previous question, I think that uh, there are some topics that will require in the near future uh, collaboration, coordination, a uh, boost on multilateralism. One is that, that is the elephant in the room. Uh, OVA alone won't fix the problem. We need private sector, we need uh, uh, to deal with the, with the, with the debt beyond debt uh, uh, respire because the DSSI initiative was uh, not uh, a restructuring or a forgiveness, it was a respire that was helpful for developing countries to have some liquidity but we know this won't fix the problem, so we need coordination on that between uh, uh, the traditional uh, uh, lenders, but also the new ones uh, from the OECD, but also from the emerging economies. The private uh, sector must be involved on this. We need uh, uh, coordination on the vaccines, on the, on, on the access to vaccines and on the distribution, as well uh, on uh, a good approach to humanitarian and development. So the agenda for coordination and collaboration that we have in the near future is is immense and of course uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, avoid uh, by contrary we must take uh, the lead on climate change now that we have a compelling case about the benefits of uh, uh, dealing with climate uh, it's not uh, a luxury it's not an effort it's an advantage to create jobs uh, growth uh, and prosperity so no hesitation is 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 accepted in this context Right, so I want you to elaborate a bit more on the job cuts that we've seen uh, across Europe, in uh, the Americas. Millions of people have lost their jobs and they've been put into the category of being the vulnerable uh, community. How do you think we're gonna be able to come back from that uh, as a wider community? I think that we will need uh, uh, coordination and collaboration. Uh, I'm coming from a country uh, that I was minister in Portugal during the big crisis, the austerity. A few years ago, we were under um, a memorandum of understanding with the uh, uh, IMF, the European Central Bank, the European Commission, to rescue Portugal. The same happened with other countries in the south of Europe uh, during the, the post-financial crisis. And you know what helped us was the fact that we could uh, uh, use the global market to export some of the goods that in Europe uh, there was no space to uh, uh, deliver. Why? Because Europe was during a crisis. What have we learned? That we are totally dependent, we in the North, we in OECD countries, from the global growth. So I think it's very important to take in consideration that there will be no growth in OECD countries. There will be no growth in individual OECD countries. There will be no growth in the G20 economies unless we help developing countries uh, in this pathway, especially in the context where tourism, trade uh, are uh, going uh, down with foreign direct investment be, being uh, squeezed. Therefore, I would say addressing the, the job creation and growth in OECD countries is vital. Uh, structural reforms are needed. Uh, financial support, investment, public, but also private investment is vital. But I would say we won't leave this crisis alone and we need this collaboration and coordination. So I insist in one figure that I think it's quite uh, impressive. We managed to get $11 trillion mobilized in the last uh, uh, months or six months, but we did not get the chance to provide the resources that, for example, the Minister of Finance from Ghana has been asking on behalf of Africa. He has asked for $10 billion per year in the next three years to deal with this crisis. 11 trillion were mobilized, but we didn't get to the 11 billion additional that is needed for this year. And this calling for a, a tectonic shift on the financial system. So I hope that we won't lose the opportunity of this crisis to really address the complexity of the system, of the development finance system, and uh, uh, being brave and bold. I don't remember any big crisis that did not uh, uh, inspire uh, reforms and transformation. I think that uh, the, the development cooperation uh, is in this uh, market for good ideas and for collaboration. 
All right, I want to take a moment to uh, focus on the role of media because uh, media played a major role when it came to uh, covering the coronavirus pandemic, especially focusing on the most vulnerable communities around the world who are facing a humanitarian crisis. Um, Valerie, let me cross over to you. Do you think media organizations have lacked in bringing awareness to various uh, crises worn torn countries are facing? And has media coverage helped or harmed your organization's works? I, you know, I think media, I mean, media clearly plays an important role um, when it comes to, um, to, to the role for, for, for mobilizing uh, attention and support. I would say that, that certainly, you know, what's colloquially known as the CNN effect is, um, plays a role in emergencies and in humanitarian crises. And, and so when media attention comes on a crisis, it does bring additional attention. And with that attention comes pressure and resources to, uh, to support action on the ground. And, and so that can be quite, uh, quite positive. Uh, one of the areas where we've been less successful has been in kind of holding that media attention um, for, um, for, uh, for long enough to really get at some of the complexities of the, of, of the crises, the root causes of those crises, and the action that is also needed by a range of different actors in order to address these in a sustainable way, build resilience, etc. And so here I, I would say that, you know, media attention tends to be a little bit fickle, uh, and it would be um, it would be good to see um, a, a, a media focus staying uh, with these very complex situations um, a bit longer and beyond the kind of, you know, the, the headline and the story of the, of the moment. And that would enable uh, work to, um, to, to, to be sort of simultaneously addressing the short-term and the long-term needs. So I'd like to see a, a, more, um, a more constant uh, media uh, engagement in, in some crises. What about you, Drauslav? How do you think media outlets in Europe uh, have dealt with depicting the refugee crisis and how vulnerable of a community they are especially in light of the coronavirus pandemic? Yeah, I think media, media play a crucial role, crucial role in, the, in, the, in perception and in, in creating, uh, creating positive or, 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 or negative na na narratives. And I would like to thank, thank uh, TRT for, for, for uh, having this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar and, and the, the conference uh, concerning the, this very, very, to very topical and, uh, issues concerning migration and, and refugees. Uh, we are now about to, to adopt a new action plan in the, in the Council of Europe uh, concerning the migration and refugees. And uh, part of that should be also to, to, work, to work with the media to, to provide them uh, necessary information, objective information, and also to provide them with good practices and good examples of the of the of the uh, work with the with the migrants and and the refugees. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the reality is that the media they are focused and they, they quite often they they like more negative news rather than pos positive ones because they attract more more attention of the of the of the public. But I I, I can't say that uh, the, the media would play I would say negative role in, negative role in the in in the pandemics. Uh, uh, situation, I think. I think the the news and the the the, the reports uh, were 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 quite quite objective. Uh, of course, you you can build and you can try to build positive narratives and positive positive consideration, but then it sometimes it it is it is uh, destroyed by 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 one or two 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 events, which which uh, and by by are some individuals which actually uh, destroys also the 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 image or or the the perception of, of, of hundreds of thousands of people. So I think media were more concerned with the, with the security, security issues concerned with, in connection with migration and refugees, rather than I haven't, haven't noticed much, uh, too much about the portraying uh, migrants as possible 
COVID uh, infection and, and 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 bringing the COVID infection into into the European European uh, continent. But still, still work has to be done. What I'm more concerned sometimes when I'm reading the the comments under the articles, especially on the on the on the internet portals and and there also there is also a, one judgment of the, of the European Court of Human Rights. Then <clears throat> media should take responsibility or, and, and, and to deal with the, with, with, the, with the hate speech and hate comments, which are often, often uh, under the, the relevant articles uh, coming from also including the migration and refugees uh, field. Definitely some good insight there, uh, Draoslav. Now, George, I want to cross back to you and bring up the multilateral cooperation that you had mentioned earlier in the session. Um, how important is multilateral cooperation to overcome global challenges? And how do you evaluate the current cooperation among countries? And what should the renewing of and reforming policies be once uh, this pandemic is hopefully over? Well, uh, to avoid repeating uh, points that I've made uh, previously, and I've been emphasizing a lot this idea of the of the, uh, the, the multilateral, multilateralism that is needed and the, and the push for global public goods, I would say that it's important to avoid what we could call a multilateralism à la carte. Our um, uh, recent report on multilateral development finance has outlined the fact that because countries are increasingly earmarking their contribution to um, UN agencies, but also to other international uh, entities. Uh, uh, in one hand, uh, they are more connected with some of the policies, but in the other, uh, they create uh, some additional pressures in the system uh, and uh, uh, therefore uh, creating the space for what we could call a multilateralism a la carte, the same way as the dependence from some international organizations from one single donor. Every, everybody noted what happened uh, when the US decided to uh, stop funding the WHO. We realized that uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation became the top donor uh, for this international organization. So I could name other institutions and other organizations that uh, uh, are uh, not just facing uh, resources constraints, this was already mentioned in our conversation, but also the, the 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 dependence from a small group of donors and therefore some uh, uh, unpredictability being uh, uh, an issue. So I think that this crisis uh, should inspire all uh, all members of of the international uh, uh, system, uh, governments, uh, to better support the multilateral system as well as the reforms that are in place in the multilateral system. Uh, uh, should, of course, uh, continue bringing this accountability and uh, efficiency and effectiveness component that is vital. But let me, in 30 seconds, if I may, uh, emphasize a point that you have mentioned uh, earlier on the role of, of media. I think that it's vital also dealing with the multilateral organizations and the need to bring citizens to this debate, to bring evidence and facts. Um, if you discuss uh, refugee crisis in Europe, uh, you ask uh, uh, European citizens and they, they would think that uh, uh, all refugees are being hosted uh, in Europe and they've crossed the Mediterranean. But then you realize that 90% of the refugees are precisely hosted in developing countries that were already facing huge problems. So the citizens, in many occasions, they, they are not really aware of the facts and of evidence and therefore some choices are not made in a well-informed manner. So we won't get rid of populism unless we bring facts and evidence to the political debate. And therefore, the, the media plays a vital role, uh, not just for this crisis, but for all crises that we have been facing and will face in the future. And this is vital to the multilateral system. We need multilateralism to be part of the political discussions at the national level, uh, rather than just something that is addressed by heads of state and government in, uh, in global summits. So we need citizens to be part of this game. Right, definitely. Francesco, I want your comment. I want you to uh, comment on that and tell me how crucial multilateral cooperation is between countries to ensure organizations like the uh, IFRC uh, can conduct its aid work. Yeah, uh, look, my, 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 I share uh, 
99.9% of what just Jorge, uh, Jorge ju just uh, just said. So I don't want to repeat uh, his uh, his comment and the, his uh, his views uh, on the, the importance of the multilateralism and how it's vital uh, for for. Uh, for uh, the humanitarian uh, uh, organization, the humanitarian role of the ground. But uh, I would be a bit more focused, if you allow me, on the role of the media, especially during the, the, this uh, pandemic. Uh, because I think uh, that, of course, uh, it's uh, quite obvious that the, the, the role of the media is, uh, is vital, uh, the role of the media is extremely important, uh, etc. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the, especially in the Western countries in the recent months or since the beginning of the first wave of the pandemic, media started to follow, to follow the politics and not the human beings. And uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, there is also a shared responsibility in this uh, difficult moment that we are living in our civil society, um, because uh, we, we, we sh instead of being stuck no, uh, uh, to, the, to the facts, uh, uh, in too many occasions, I've seen uh, uh, media following uh, the different opinion of the scientists, uh, and, uh, that, and this didn't help uh, the civil society in our countries uh, in elaborating what was happening. While the, the, the scientific community was uh, still uh, working uh, about the, the virus to try to understand uh, uh, what was going on, which was the best treatment, etc. No, we, we we started to to see uh, a very exacerbated debate uh, about what was just or unjust, uh, how to to respond to the virus, and this didn't help the communities to to. And this, uh, for me, is a uh, is an important responsibility when it comes uh, about uh, the, the 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 role of the media during the, the, the pandemic, uh, uh, and I mean this is especially at national, uh, at national uh, level. And then if I can add uh, also about migrants and refugees, you know that also our organization is working hard on this, uh, on this field. Uh, and uh, even on this, uh, too often the media, when it started to talk about a phenomenon, which is not an emergency, of course, I've stated several occasions that this is a phenomenon that we must deal and identify concrete solution, uh, the media follow the, the political debate uh, and not the human beings, not the real stories uh, behind uh, the political debate uh, that is happening uh, uh, around the phenomena of the uh, migration uh, and, the, and the role uh, that uh, uh, they can play in our community, how to be better inclusive. Uh, uh, too often uh, uh, the, the, the debate uh, is around what the politicians are saying and not what is happening on the ground. And, uh, and this is a missed uh, occasion, I think, uh, that uh, we, we, we should recover all together. And this, the dialogue, uh, as today is happening, and this is not the first time on the TRT, uh, with the humanitarian organization and other agencies, uh, uh, it's extremely important and vital uh, to address, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, to better understand, I think, as Vivian said, the, the, Valerie said, the, 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 what is happening on the ground. And, uh, the causes and the, the, the real causes of what is happening on the ground uh, in many places of the world. Right, I have about uh, five minutes left on this uh, session. And before I wrap up, I really want to get uh, each and every single one of you's thoughts on how you'd like to see a post-pandemic world as an individual and as an organization. If uh, I can, I'll start with you, Valerie. Well, um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see a world where we are using uh, evidence, science, and data to inform our policies and our action. Um, I'd like to see one where policies are um, and, and in the, that are aimed to support populations like social protection policies are, are designed in a manner um, that, are, um, that is inclusive um, of um, those furthest behind, the, the most vulnerable, whatever their makeup is in a particular um, context. Um, and I'd like to see one where we are, um, we're united as a world around, um, around common principles and, and, and common action and, and the Charter of the United Nations embodies this. Um, obviously, I'd like to see a more peaceful one and a less hungry one. And these are, um, these are aims that we must, uh, we must um, subscribe to 
and work and champion to 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 achieve. Um, but I, I do think that this is an opportunity coming out of COVID, uh, a, a crisis where everyone has been impacted, um, a situation where right. um, where the value of science has been revealed to all of us. I think this is an opportunity to build back better, and we better not miss this chance. All right, thank you for that, Valerie. Droslav, what are your thoughts? Sure, is that uh, we need contingency plans. I, I think the, I think the, the lack of those those plans, I think, was revealed by the by this crisis. And even after first wave of the of the, of the pandemics uh, in the spring, we I think the states and we have we have not learned a lesson enough because as soon as the situation got better in the summer, then we again relaxed and 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 we 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 under evaluated the preparation for for what has come now in the in the fall uh, what, what, we are human rights organi organization and also my colleague from w, uh, wfp has mentioned charter of the united nations we are regional organization we have european convention on human rights and those are the principles which uh, sh should stay with us shall be respected uh, we should come back to uh, humanity come back to human dignity and uh, human dignity uh, is the fundamental value not only in Europe, of course, all around the world. And mm -hmm. healthcare is a prerequisite for the preservation of human uh, dignity. Access to healthcare for all, right. including migrants and refugees. And I would underline again equal access. And with that, I, 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 would, I, I, I would finish. Equal access, uh, right. Thank you for this session. Thank you, Draslav. George, real quick, I have about two minutes left if you can just uh, give us your last statements. It's easier after Draslov and, and Varoli, so I, I, I would say that what I would hope from this crisis is that we use the SDGs as the framework. Uh, this is a, a crisis in, in, for a generation, and one day we'll be asked uh, how we succeeded. And I would say, rather than trying to, to find a, a new Marshall Plan, let's use the, the SDGs as the framework to uh, respond to this crisis and to build back uh, better. And uh, uh, I, I think that resilience and sustainability will need to be addressed in uh, new ways to deal uh, not just with this crisis and the new crisis. So maybe this crisis is the vaccine that we need Definitely. to deal with other crises. Unfortunately, it will appear soon. And Francesco, last but not least, real quick, if you can, for me. Just uh, sharing the thoughts of my colleagues. Uh, uh, as humanitarian, I'm optimistic. Uh, so let's hope that this is really is uh, an, um, the, 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 this pandemic could be an, an accelerator, as many said, uh, an accelerator of of, um, of understanding how important to his to heal our shared humanity. And uh, SDGs, I think, is the best framework that we can uh, we can uh, take in our mind. And I hope not only in our mind, but in the in the minds of the, the political leaders. So let me be optimistic uh, and uh, let's hope, let's maybe discuss uh, next year in the next uh, 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 TRT World Forum. Thank you so much. Hopefully, thank you so much, Francesco Rocca, George Moreira da Silva, uh, Drauslav Stefanak and Valerie Guarnieri. Thank you so much to all four of you for joining us here on TRT World uh, Forum for this very timely discussion. All right, now I will leave you with a uh, piano uh, recitation from a pianist and composer, Bishra Kayukje.
Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.
That's all from me, Efnan Han, at this year's edition of the TRT World Forum. I'll leave you now with the head of the Digital Transformation Office of the Presidency of the Republic of Turkey, Ali Taha Koç. I am happy to be with you in this session. COVID-19 has clearly shown us that it has a natural and direct impact not only on human well-being and health, but also on economy that rely on digital transformation. Therefore, we need a holistic approach consisting in a new, sustainable model innovation that explores the ways shaping the world. In the face of unexpected crises like the COVID-19 pandemic, we should remember we need to be ready for unpredictable events by working more global, creative, and human-friendly social innovation. Before the pandemic, globalization and the digital transformation already made businesses far more dynamic and unpredictable. In other words, today's hyper-connected world presents no guarantee that the future will resemble the past. In this respect, I would like to approach the forum's team with three different pillars, which are integration, data governance, and digital protectionism. In this session, I will consider these pillars as building blocks of digital transformation and innovation in the post-pandemic era. Let me start with integration. By integration, I mean global interoperability relying on cross-border data flow, considering all safety criteria and regulations. Interoperability is a key to sustainable success of the ecosystems. Digital transformation settles on the interdependent economy which requires business ecosystems by sharing the profits among all participating companies. Business ecosystems are dynamic and co-evolving communities of diverse actors. Digital business ecosystems create new value through increasing the productive models of collaboration and competition. Digital transformation cannot be successful without trust-based digital platforms whose building blocks are security, accountability, transparency, fairness, and ethics. Data is the operating currency of the digital platforms. Distributed peer-to-peer -peer networks are the conduits by which data at digital platforms are transformed and transported. To make an analogy, we would say digital platforms are vehicles of data flow and consumption. Therefore, digital platforms will discover and expand to new digital markets since they bring on the process of collaboration, co-creation, and cooperation. By catalyzing the creativity and synergy with co-creation and collaboration, we will be laying the foundations of an intelligent society. The idea of an intelligent society with digital age requires a new approach consisting of technology, humanity, and the economy. All of this requires embracing openness. Openness is the only key that would help data flows and interoperability across borders. Thus, open innovation coming from openness doesn't only refer to free knowledge or technology, but also refers to collaborative networking on a global level. Open innovation would produce value by considering technological developments in the context of social welfare in the post-pandemic era. It is about bringing people, processes, policies, and technologies together to ensure value exchange across an ecosystem. If we are talking about open innovation, then we also need to consider data ownership and privacy. In the context of the digital ecosystems, data ownership and privacy are related to data quality. Therefore, poor and unknown data quality can cause larger scale problems that affect all ecosystem services, and thus the entire reliability of the ecosystem. If we consider this from the perspective of health-related open data quality, it will require cooperation in setting standards for data quality and extracting relevant insights to policymakers on time. Therefore, the main priority in open data is to ensure the reliability of the data and the data source. At the moment, data quality standards and definitions are not yet clear. In post-pandemic era, the data quality assessment will be the most important issue. 
Identification of new quality assessment tools and methods to verify the quality of open data will affect the reliability of the digital ecosystem. Let's talk about the second pillar, the, which is the data governance. In the case of data governance, we need to focus on integration and orchestration in digital platforms to bring open data to the ecosystem. During the pandemic, we have realized that reliable, continuous and accurate flow of information from authorities is quite important. Therefore, once again, I would like to emphasize the importance of data quality, privacy and usability in the concept of data governance. Solutions for data governance in cross-border data flows enable us to create and maintain global value chains. Global value chains support almost all international trade and investment, but also global human health and well-being. The current shift in legislations toward increased privacy and user rights, along with increased user control and machine readability, must be considered when planning digital trade concepts with cross-border data flow. Privacy concerns on cross-border data flows leads us to digital identity. The fundamental solution for identity management, which requires a trusted third party that everyone finds reliable, can only be the government. Therefore, in the post-pandemic era, we will need a regulatory framework that creates incentives for data governance with a focus on privacy in a way not to prevent international trade. Let me also note briefly that if you look at the cross-border data flow and the emerging digital economy from the perspective of giant digital companies, we also face another phenomenon which we call digital data capitalism. Today, the third and the last pillar I want to talk about is digital protectionism. With the rise of the internet-based digital economy in the last decade, new problems have started to arise. How can we measure the value of an online free commodities such as Google Maps, Facebook interactions, smartphone apps, or YouTube videos? When digital products are available for free, they have no effect on GDP, despite the value generated by users. The first problem in measuring the value of digital product is the marginal cost of delivering them over the internet is close to zero. Online information can be updated anytime and can be accessed from almost anywhere in the world. But its price is often much lower compared to its physical counterparts. Without a valid tool to measure the value of the digital economy, how will policymakers manage it? GDP is one of the fundamental inventions of the 20th century, but there are some weaknesses. In particular, anything with zero price has exactly zero weight in GDP whether it be in an app on your phone or the air you breathe. The price of these digital commodities may be zero here, but digital giant companies are gaining a lot of value through them. Given the increasingly widespread economic and social role of data, its flow across borders have become a critical policy area affecting international trade and global economic growth. In most cases, data is provided free of charge by users of any online social network across borders. Therefore, they do not create any financial transactions in the country where the user is located. However, when these data points are combined with millions of other data from around the world, they form the basis of data analysis and therefore value creation. Here we are talking about an emerging digital economy that nation states cannot track and include in their GDP. The sanction power of nation states is limited by the capacity to control and configure data traffic. This power and the capacity may not necessarily be determined by law. In other words, digitalization and the digital economy have the potential to frustrate the written law rules on which nation states are built. Under these conditions, today's main problem is not about expanding the field of digitalization and digital economies. Today's main challenge is the question of how nation states can take a stand in the digital age shaped by digital data capitalism emerging from digital platforms of digital giant companies. 
Even though digital data capitalism seems to benefit from international deregulations, its survival depends on the nation states structuring the traffic of the data, namely the regulation of the digital economy. At this point, I would like to draw your attention to the digital protectionism, which is the natural result of digital data capitalism. Digital protectionism is a government policy that aims to localize and take measures on the data by taking control of the data flows in the international arena. All kinds of policies that regulate and block the international traffic of the data cause the digital giant companies' platforms not work or operate at low efficiency. Governments can adopt protectionist policies to reduce their dependency on digital companies that collect, store, and commoditize user data. Driven by such a policy, one of the steps taken in Turkey is the publication of information and communication security measures, with 21 articles published on July 6, 2019. Some of the measures are Use of domestic social media and communication applications shall be preferred in the public service offices. Operators authorized to provide communication services are obliged to establish an internet exchange point in Turkey. Measures shall be taken to make sure that domestic communication traffic, which needs to be routed domestically, is not taken abroad. We currently witness that strict inspection practices already spread all over the world, especially in the USA and the European Union countries. Fines can be imposed if digital companies do not comply with the norms like intellectual property rights or anti-competitive measures that are stated in laws and regulations. For example, nearly 4.5 billion euros in penalties were imposed in, on Google by the European Commission in 2018. Digital protectionism is a natural reaction of nation states to the conditions of digital data capitalism formed by giant digital companies. However, we should note that once digital protectionism begins, it can create an endless spiral of censorship and political pressure. Therefore, it is important to allow data to flow easily to take advantage of the benefits of the digital economy. It is important to ensure that the relevant earnings from open data flow should be fairly shared by the countries involved in creating value. This may require investigating new alternative approaches. Given current trends, it is not clear that open data flow and more access to data alone will help addressing the global digital inequalities. Last but not least, I would say that Digital transformation doesn't mean to digitalize everything, but it is kind of a seamless and spontaneous convergence of life critical ecosystems. It really means inspiring and connecting human intelligence and how the governments regulate and conserve resources within their own ecosystems. Over the next decade, one of the most prominent aspects of digital transformation will be the creation of vast interconnected ecosystems enabled by industrial trusted platforms. My forecast on the new digital world is a heterogeneous environment based on the decentralization and federation of diverse competing entities and resources. Emerging technologies like AI and blockchain can provide new ways to embed data governance principles into the automated interactions of ecosystem participants. It might need a paradigm shift in the idea of intelligent society emerging in the digital age. However, transformation is always a grueling uphill battle against the status quo, pushing people beyond their comfort zone. Let me conclude by saying that we will need to conceive a joint vision on the path towards sustainability to cope with the digital transformation processes that are revolutionizing life, businesses and society. Thank you for joining us today. I wish you all a successful conference.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the fifth and final session of this year's TRT World Forum. I'm Ali Janayanash, a correspondent and presenter for TRT World News. I have the pleasure, distinguished pleasure, of being your moderator for this next session. I hope you've been enjoying the forum so far, and I'm also sure that you would agree that we've had some really interesting discussions. Now, we'll be taking the discussion a little bit further with this next session called The Future of Work and Education preparing for a post-pandemic world. Here's a look at that. Without a doubt, the COVID-19 pandemic has been labeled as the defining global health challenge of our times. But in reality, it is so much more than that. It's also an unprecedented social and economic crisis, the likes of which the world has not witnessed since the Second World War. Yes, efforts are being made to ensure economic stability and the continuation of productivity as the world continues to struggle to contain this deadly disease. Now, as part of this process, and as many of you out there are watching can attest to, both our work and education models have undergone some very significant changes. I mean, from my part, I've literally set up a small studio in my apartment where I've been presenting news bulletins from home for the better part of the last nine months. So I've transitioned from the chaotic environment of a television newsroom uh, to a small living room filled with Couch pillows, uh, and it's not just work, education as well. Tens of millions of students around the world are being educated remotely. Things that may not have been considered, or things that may have been considered impossible before the pandemic, over the next pandemic, over the next 90 minutes, we're gonna be um, analyzing whether or not the current conditions around work or remote work and education are necessary and appropriate for this ongoing crisis. We're also going to be discussing the issue of equality when it comes to education opportunities and how these changes might impact the future of how we work and how we learn. All right, to discuss this and more, it is now my pleasure to introduce our panel of esteemed speakers. Professor Yin Cheng Cheng is an Emeritus Professor of Education and Senior Research Fellow of the Education University of Hong Kong. He serves as president to several global and regional educational associations. His research areas include educational reforms, paradigm shifts, and school management. Emiliana Vegas is a senior fellow and co-director of the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institute. Emiliana's expertise cover education in developing countries. Uh, she's written extensively on issues affecting educational systems in Latin America, as well as the Caribbean. Sachuk Shidin is a professor of applied psychology at NYU. Uh, Dr. Shidin's work focuses on uh, the development of educational and psychological resources for marginalized youth. He has conducted studies with vulnerable children across the US, Europe, and Turkey. And Kathleen Delaski is a social entrepreneur. She has launched or co-launched four nonprofit organizations in the past two decades, all related to improving the quality of education for non-elite students. With one of these, the lab, she saw the need for a nonprofit to help learning institutions and other players design the future of education. All right, welcome to you all. Um, Kathleen, I'd like to begin with you. Um, you know, we are, I guess this is the camera we're supposed to. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, when we talk about this pandemic, we, we often refer to it as um, the biggest challenge uh, of our lifetime, possibly the biggest since World War II. I can see the cliche in that, but uh, I also understand that the last 70 years has been a period of unprecedented uh, advancements as well as opportunities. Among these, obviously, uh, improved access to, to education all across the board. Yes, we know of the disruptions that COVID-19 uh, has caused, but from an educational uh, standpoint, 
Talk to us how deep and how strong uh, this offsetting has been. Well, if you want to talk about the, I mean, there have obviously been well, a couple of silver linings the, that are very important in terms of advancing of innovation, innovation and speeding up innovation. But obviously, you can't you can't get past uh, the, the negatives that will be. It will probably take us years to analyze. You know, people are talking about the generation that may be lost uh, uh, that in terms of the very critical development moments that they're missing that, you know, in our, that where I live in the Washington DC area, the students have not yet been to school physically, um, except for very few, they just, school has never been opened up and, you know, and, and it's looking like it won't be for a year and, and at least three months, you know, total by the time this is over. And, and the impact of that uh, when um, we, we, we hear about the students who are being lost in the system uh, when when learning is happening online is is um, you know it, it's devastating. Um, there there have been some bright spots, obviously, um, and I work more in the uh, school to work space, so looking at career training and co reinventing college. I run the Education Design Lab, which is focused on how to make learning more flexible, more affordable, more visible, and more relevant. And in 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 this sphere, um, actually, COVID has helped us in some ways to target the innovation to, uh, you know, necessity has become the mother of invention. And we have been able to work with many colleges and many training programs that are bringing their programs online and actually makes them more assess accessible to people who before COVID could not, uh, could not um, participate. Um, also, uh, the cost of universities and colleges are being, are being challenged in a way that, you um, is forcing uh, institutions to come up with cheaper ways to offer, you know, offer their services. And, um, you know, these are a few of the silver linings, but, you know, I, I don't, you know, well, well, I think a lot of us have seen a speeding up of our, of, um, of, of the interest in the impact of the work that we're having. We, we, we really have to start the conversation with, uh, you know, what is happening to children around the world who cannot go to school and have, have, the, have, have those needs met. Kathleen, I, I, I do see the, um, the silver lining, and, 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 and we're going to talk about sort of the, the reinvention and the future uh, of education as we sort of transition in, into this uh, post-pandemic world. But in terms of assessing the situation, Professor, you know, I want to turn to you. You know, as an international um, education researcher, when you look at what we've been going through, I mean, do you think that the, um, the coronavirus pandemic has uh, the potential to, to undo uh, the successes of the past. Professor Ying Cheng Cheng? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. I ask you, you uh, OK. Go ahead. I was wondering if you could sort of like uh, elaborate on, on the fact that, you know, if, if this, I know there's a bit of a delay, so let me just ask my question, then I'll wait for your answer in terms of uh, this coronavirus pandemic undoing the successes of the past. Um, the, the impact of pandemic on education uh, are really complex and, and huge, you know, uh, covering all key aspects and all level, you know, from individuals, uh, institution to the system level and also the whole world. Uh, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission has recently released a report on the impact of pandemic. Uh, I, I do not uh, uh, report, uh, repeat the report here, but I, according to my observations, uh, I would like to point out that uh, um, uh, the the pattern of impact, you, you know, that can be classified into a different uh, uh, type of uh, disruption, you, you know, um, including six types, such as the technological disruption in the technology, in the technical aspect, uh, economic disruption related to the resources, the economy. And also, the, you can see that uh, social disruption, you, you know, a big change among people. 
and also the political destruction, you, you, you can see that, cultural destruction, and all these destructions come together uh, contributing to the formation of learning uh, destruction, you, you see that, uh, affecting our school, our education, and also our young people's future. Uh, for example, the digital divide or gaps, you know, a typical uh, technological uh, destruction. Uh, in online learning and also in how to ensure quality equity for those disadvantaged students, you know. Other example, uh, lack of appropriate resources to support innovation and change in learning, teaching and school operation. You, you know, the school uh, have been closed and no education can happen. All these resources issue related to the economic uh, disruption, you know, on education. I think uh, really no exception. All country, all area are suffering from this disruption. But at the same time, but at the same time, you, you know, this challenge uh, from disruption may be used as crucial driving force to the future of work and education. In particular, uh, this challenge will meet together uh, with other driving forces uh, like uh, globalization, uh, technology big flu, uh, international competition, and strong demand for development. Uh, you, you know, that all these driving forces come together with the uh, pandemic uh, destruction, you know, driving the future transformation. The, the classification of uh, uh, multiple disruptions, I think, uh, can provide a, a comprehensive uh, perspective to look at uh, the impact of pandemic and also how to manage, to how to deal with that. It. To different countries, the, the concern about disruption uh, may be different. Some countries are more concerned with the technological destruction, you, you know, uh, uh, the whole city, you know, uh, uh, unable to, to operate uh, uh, due to the, uh, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, some countries are more concerned with uh, uh, economic destruction, you know, seriously. And also some are more uh, concerned with the social and political uh, destruction. Uh, from research or policy point of view, you, you know, what impact, what implication? Uh, to address the issue of these multiple disruption and other coming challenge, I think the research agenda or the policy agenda may focus not only on the constraint due to the, uh, due to the impact of pandemic, but also take the opportunity to change the traditional education into a new one. This is a golden opportunity to make our education change, you, you know, to a new one. Uh, that can meet the fu new future in a post-pandemic world. In particular, we, we need to change education with innovation. You, you see that. But what, what is the most needed innovation in education against disruption or pandemic? What most needed innovation? According to my observations, uh, we need innovation, particularly in four areas, four aspects of education. The first one, uh, we need to develop a new set of student quality and capacity for the future. Because the future has been changed a lot, you know, not following the traditional uh, lie or the traditional way to happen. A new, a completely uh, uncertain, you know, First, we need to develop, an, uh, you know, uh, in particular, we need to develop students' contextualized multiple intelligence and creativity as cutting edge. They have the cutting edge for them to deal with the multiple... Okay. Professor, if, uncertainty. If, okay, if, if I could sort of uh, interrupt you for just a bit, because I want to bring in Emiliana. Uh, Emiliana, you heard the professor sort of talking about uh, the different disruptions and how different regions are, are, are dealing with it. Uh, you yeah. know, as well as anyone, the impact this has had on uh, 
uh, developing regions. Uh, Latin America is, is your specialty. So perhaps uh, you could actually start off by giving us specific examples of that. I mean, I'm, I'm especially uh, curious to find out how uh, a disruption in, 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 in a classical model educational system uh, differs in developing countries when you sort of compare it to, to, to Europe. I mean, uh, are regional or, or um, developing countries more vulnerable here? Thank you so much for having me. And uh, let me um, start by saying, you know, even before um, COVID hit in developing countries and particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, education systems had managed to expand access a lot. And so there were, you know, almost uh, pretty much universal access to primary education. And a great majority of those who finished primary school were going on to secondary school. But the problems we were observing was that they were not learning the skills they needed um, even before COVID. So prior to COVID, let's say in the la latest program in international student assessment run by the OECD, uh, the countries from the region that participated, um, their students, only 20, less than a quarter of them, less than 25% of them, uh, mastered the basic skills in reading and even a lower share in math by the time they were 15 years old. And those are the students who are in school. Um, moreover, there were really large differences between students who come from um, wealthy backgrounds and students who come from the poorest backgrounds. So we would say that, you know, prior to COVID, learning was low, it was unequal, and it was very inadequate for, you know, the 21st century industrial uh, sort of um, technical world in which we live, where the tech digitalization is everywhere. Um, now COVID hit and sent um, all students home for months, as Kathleen was saying, in, in Washington, D.C., where I also live, um, but all over Latin America and the Caribbean, with the exception of, of Nicaragua, really, every country closed uh, schools, um, and only uh, Uruguay has been able to reopen fully uh, since June. And so we have, um, you know, all basically students out of school, some countries now making the efforts to gradually reopen in staggered ways uh, because they realize that a great majority, you know, that even though there's a lot of innovation taking place and a lot of really creativity, um, you know, from teachers and parents and very well intentioned administrators, um, the reality is that there's not the infrastructure in place and a lot of uh, inequality in access to, for example, connectivity, internet, quality materials online. And so that's, um, and, and we know also that there's more than learning that takes place in schools and particularly in developing countries, schools also provide in many cases, the only safe place for students, the only place where they get a, a full meal per day and where they also have access to health services. So the impact that it's having in developing countries is huge, not just in terms of learning, which is of course the main concern, but also in terms of other outcomes such as you know health and well-being. So uh, some of the problems that we're seeing in that region sort of predate COVID, uh, perhaps have its, have its roots in, uh, in early education. All right, this is, I think it's a perfect segue to sort of bring in uh, Professor uh, Satchuk Shirin. Um, Professor Shirin, good to have you here on the session. Now, an overwhelming uh, majority of education covers children. Uh, you specialize in children and youth development. I'm wondering what your assessment is when it comes to uh, the effect that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on this particular demographic. Well, you know, the one aspect, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a great session so far. Uh, one aspect of this is education, which has been mentioned. Uh, I think there we have to really look at the inequalities that was already there before COVID-19 and how it is kind of making uh, every every uh, statistics that we have in terms of learning gaps even bigger, larger. In other words, uh, children who are more vulnerable, either by status in their uh, countries or socioeconomic uh, background, are uh, falling uh, behind in terms of achievement uh, indicators. But, uh, you know, maybe we can talk more about that uh, later. What is also interesting here is uh, there is an opportunity for resetting the, uh, the gaps between countries because, uh, in a way, COVID-19 presents a 
universal challenge, and I think every country is struggling, like uh, we just heard. In Washington, these schools are closed the same way schools are closed everywhere else. Now, the problem here in the U.S. is is not that different from the rest of the world, where we have a large number of students who have limited access to quality online education, and they are the ones who are going to be left behind after we are we are done with this with this crisis. So, can we do something innovative here? Is the question, and I think COVID nineteen, in a way, uh, bring bring the reform. Uh, that is much delayed uh, to the education. You know, every, every country, every language, if you just type reform and education together, you will see that reform is most likely associated with the sector of education. But yet, it's a very conservative area. We didn't really change much over the last 200 centuries. We still have the same school buildings, pretty much the same curriculum. The delivery is the same. The roles of teachers and principals are are pretty much the same. So, you know, everything changes, but schools are the same. And now with COVID-19, we are uh, realizing that, oh, you can learn from home. Not everything, but certain things can be learned uh, out of school. So I think going forward, we really have to uh, start thinking about the role of teachers, the role of school buildings, uh, starting with architecture, uh, curriculum, why do we have class times? Uh, why are we stacking up 40, 50 kids in a classroom and putting one uh, adult in the room? It just doesn't add up. Everything we know about child development, you know, I, I, I study early childhood. Uh, over the last 20, 30 years, we learned so much about brain development and everything starts at age three. So why are we waiting until age six, seven to, uh, to have students in schools? Uh, and we also know that, you know, after, I am a college professor, and this is going to sound odd, but I think uh, the idea of teaching some of the basic skills at age 18 doesn't really make sense. When you think of brain development, it's kind of a little bit late unless you have an infrastructure. So I think there are a lot of questions from early child education to college education that we have delayed in responding and answering or thinking about. And now with COVID-19, we are here and we have to face all these issues all, all at once. And in that sense, I think it's an opportunity. I see, I see uh, a lot of uh, good answers that are being debated in different countries. And I think it's good to have different approaches to this problem. Now, the one, I think, uh, both in Turkey, in the US, and I, I just heard in Latin America as well, the, there's an immediate uh, issue that we have to address, which is all these kids who are left behind, vulnerable kids. You know, we're not even talking about refugees, we're not even talking about uh, immigrants, uh, but a lot of low-income kids in different countries are going to lose a year of learning. Now, if you lose a year of learning in elementary school, that, that's really multiplied if you get to college level. So a lot of these kids will not have the advantage of going to college. In other words, the effect of social class, socioeconomic status, has always been there in terms of achievable outcomes. COVID-19 made it worse. If you are living in a household with one college degree parent, with some books and some, uh, you know, social capital, that, as they call it, uh, you are okay. You are continuing to learn because you have an internet access, you have a computer, etc. That's, you know, depending on which country you are, it's half the kids or a little bit more or a little bit less. But there is this other group who have none of that. In other words, they if they are not going to school, they don't have quality interactions at home. They don't have adult supervision. They don't have uh, even the number of vocabularies shared in the household from early childhood forward. So they are the ones that I think we are going to call in the near future as lost generation of COVID-19, unless we do something about it radically. And I don't see any radical change there. Now, you know, uh, if uh, one more uh, point I can make, that's the idea of COVID generation. Now, we talk about generation X, Y, Z, alpha, you know, all those labels, but they are not really uh, as useful uh, as they are developed by market researchers, right? They're based on their consumptions, etc. What we are experiencing right now, what kids and adolescents, uh, young people are experiencing right now, 
will transform their lives, will transform their idea of where they live, how they look at the world. So I think this COVID-19 generation uh, will be not that different from, you know, 60, uh, 68 youth uh, uh, appraisals in France and the rest of the world, or not that different from the great generation uh, depression, uh, the depression are in the U.S. because they are experiencing something global together. My hope is generation which country they live will have a more global understanding of uh, challenges facing this earth. And I think they will be a little bit more open-minded about issues like global warming, issues like global inequality. That's my hope that will come out of the COVID-19 crisis. I think, I think we share that hope. All right. Um, as with all of our panelists, I think uh, many of you made a lot of uh, good points, but I sort of want to narrow the... Um, uh, the discussion as we move forward. Kathleen, if I can turn to you. Um, Professor Shidin talked about uh, narrowing the, ga the gaps, uh, the need to sort of bring innovation, whether it's uh, reforming uh, teachers or even the school buildings that, you know, date back 200 years. I mean, do you think that this uh, coronavirus pandemic was sort of the, um, the disruptor, the disruption uh, waiting to happen for the world of education? Uh, absolutely. We were talking about all these things before, but there was not that um, the forcing mechanism to to make that to make them happen. And obviously, I, I'm not an, an expert in in the K-12 or the you know the early childhood. Um, we we work more with um, starting at uh, uh, young young adults or you know sort of later in high school in in this country, what we call high school, through uh, workforce development and even lifelong reskilling, helping. With the massive uh, shift of, of skills uh, skills development that needs to happen probably across the world, um, so yes, when, when when we look at the question of does the school building need to change, um, we look at uh, something we call the weave. Right, the idea of the weave is that um, that learning, at least when you get past a certain age of maybe you know fourteen, uh, really needs to be thought about from. How do you weave together the parts of your life as you are becoming an adult uh, to uh, to learn from many environments? They say 95% of learning happens outside the classroom, and the skills that we are being asked to have in the future of work are much more uh, much more about what we call human skills or soft skills, uh, whether it's collaboration or empathy or resilience. That those skills need to be developed in contextual situations and assessed accordingly. So how do, we, how do we teach that? You don't teach it in a desk with the 40 or 50 students uh, that the professor was talking about. You probably learn that in life, uh, in school, in family situations, in community uh, service, and in work. And so we are designing programs around the country right now that are looking at how do you weave together school and work. We were doing this before the pandemic, and I will say, that aspect of our work has slowed down during the pandemic as employers figure out how do we do internships and apprenticeships and uh, give work experiences. And we're having to figure out how to do all of that virtually. But, but what, what comes out the other side of it, because we are getting so much better at virtual learning, is think about hybrid learning opportunities where you might, uh, you know, you work in teams as a group because that's critical going forward. But you might be moving in and out of situations physically and um, and and you know virtually, um, which will be much more comfortable for teachers, employers um, uh, in the future than it has been in the past. The piece that we that that we probably haven't been working on during COVID because COVID it, it, it's showing us that we need to, but it hasn't demanded that we figure it out yet. Is really how do you assess learning? Uh, uh, from the workforce point of view, because we're getting to what we're calling a skills-based uh, uh, learning and hiring environment, which requires us to know at the micro level, does, you know, does this student or does this worker have this skill and how do I know? Um, and it's all going to be, you know, in the future, it's all going to be digitally displayable and you'll be digitally visible. And so assessment really becomes the task that we, uh, that we need to figure out. But I would say to your question, what COVID has helped us do really is, is imagine both from the, the employer's point of view, the teacher's point of view, and the learner's point of view, that we can mix all these things together. 
Okay. Uh, Professor Yin, if I could turn to you, I mean, uh, you've been listening to Kathleen. I mean, do you think that this will sort of um, ultimately prove to be beneficial this, um, in, in terms of the transition that we're going through or talking about? Uh, I think uh, related to uh, two aspects I would like to address. The first one related to the, the school concept. I think uh, after the, um, uh, the using the technology, uh, you, you know, uh, we changed the concept of school into a kind of a learning ecosystem. It, it means that uh, it is uh, including uh, uh, te technologies, uh, platform, you, you know, and also as well as uh, uh, human resources together, such that the learning is there not in the classroom only, but beyond classroom as upon the, out by other speakers, you, you, you see that. I, I think the, how we can use the environment, no matter technical expert, technology expert, or human expert, come together to groom our students a multiple, a contextualized multiple intelligence, such that they can deal with the, uh, the complex and multiple uh, situation. You, you see that uh, this is the, uh, we, 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 we need to further uh, develop the, the technology aspect. You, you know, so. Now, the other issue related to the digital divide, you, you, you know, uh, be, because a different school and different uh, uh, ecosystem may have a different level of, uh, of uh, 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 impact. To some schools, uh, they have the uh, equipment, they have the uh, computing facilities, such that they can achieve higher level and have more opportunity for learning, you know. Uh, to solve the problem of the uh, equity, you, you know, uh, we, we need to ensure students have the opportunity uh, to use this kind of learning ecosystem. Uh, you, you know, not limited by sc individual school, uh, individual teacher, S they have uh, unbounded learning opportunity, uh, open learning, uh, benefit from all kinds of uh, uh, new development in the world. You, you know, it means that they they have not uh, only the standard learning, they have the individualized learning, localized learning, you, you know, go to the, the community, and also the uh, globali uh, globalized learning, I think. A more comprehensive concept, you know, not the traditional concept of school anymore. This is the preliminary uh, response. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Professor uh, Ying, thank you for, very much. All right, um, I think uh, it's time to bring in our fifth and uh, final panelist. Uh, we do excuse uh, our viewers for the slight delay, but uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Andreas Slicher. He is the Director for Education and Skills over at uh, the OECD. Uh, he oversees the, uh, the program for the uh, International Student Assessment, as well as uh, other efforts to uh, improve global education practices. Uh, Andreas, is, uh, it's interesting, his efforts have had numerous praises from global leaders uh, in terms of education policy. If is, Andreas is ready, uh, let's bring him. Andreas, good to have you here on this panel. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you, uh, you know, one of the, the programs that you initiated uh, is that of the Program for International Student Assessment. I mean, do you think that the uh, educational <laughs> assessment can be used to um, account for the loss uh, in terms of uh, how much and where COVID-19 has set us back? Yeah, absolutely. I do think that's very important. I think we need to track very carefully the learning losses, particularly among the most marginalized students. You know, I think learning losses have not affected all students in similar ways. You know, students who were very good at learning on their own, who had access to great technology, who had a very supportive ecosystem around them, you know, teachers and parents included, for them, you know, learning losses probably will be very contained. 
but the many young people, you know, who used to be spoon fed by their teachers, you know, who didn't have access to technology, who didn't have, you know, parents pushing and supporting them, they were left very badly behind. And if we want to give them a second chance, we will need to be able to track their their learning losses. And I do think that's a very important task for public policy. Um, all right, so no student behind, that, that's your philosophy. Uh, Professor uh, Sheeran, I want to come back to you for a second. I mean, what type of programs do you think uh, specifically, uh, not only programs, but also uh, interventions, do you think can sort of uh, alleviate some of the, uh, the difficulties uh, that have sort of come with, been accompanied with this COVID-19 crisis? Professor Shidden? Can you hear me? Yes, okay, <laughs> sorry. Yes, I, I, I keep moving myself. I have a small cough this morning, but I, I just had my test and then while oh. you, everything is clear. <laughs> it's just coffee. Um, so uh, to respond to your well, question. Well, the good thing is uh, that we're all in a virtual environment, so we're all safe, but. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am at home, I am at home. Uh, so, the, you know, in each country, we know which groups are left behind. We know the vulnerable populations or student populations. So unless, you know, like I said, uh, unless we do something for those populations in particular, the gap will be there, right? Because uh, while some kids continue to learn, it's like the summer learning gap, which we know a little bit uh, from research. During summers, we know that you know, low-income kids, kids with limited resources to access, uh, you know, educational resources, uh, are left behind. One idea uh, would be to use the summertime uh, for extra uh, learning uh, to for, to to get uh, at lost learning capacity in different segments of populations. Another one is. Uh, giving extra uh, resources, including you know laptops, whatever online materials you have, not old populations, maybe some of the identified interest groups. But the idea has to be general. In Turkey, for example, as you know, the large number of students who are in villages and and the rest of the country are also uh, not attending schools in. in they should be attending because it's a small village anyway. Everyone sees each other. Uh, so we have to have local solutions uh, in different countries using both technology but also uh, giving more room to make decisions at the local level. Uh, in addition to those, I think going forward, okay. technology will be a big part of uh, distance learning, online learning, however you call it, will be a big part. Go ahead. All right, uh, Professor uh, Shidin, they're talking about sort of um, uh, technology making a big Did difference. It? We're experiencing a slight uh, gap in that technology. I think we may have uh, temporarily lost him into, yeah, I, I, I was just saying that uh, your connection was poor. Uh, do you want to sort of maybe wrap up your comments? We can. All right, let's just put you on hold for a second. And, and, and I want to bring in Emiliana. Let's see if we can sort of improve the connection that we have with you, Professor Shiden. Um, you know, I was looking at your, your previous experience with the, uh, the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, as, as well as the, um, the World Bank. Um, and I want to talk, sort of bring in this concept that we haven't talked about before in terms of uh, education financing. I mean, um, how much do you think that should be focusing on uh, alleviating some of the constraints when it comes to education supply and education demand? Thank you for that question. Um, indeed, I mean, we have uh, great concerns about the impact that the pandemic and the economic crisis that is resulting from the pandemic is gonna have on education investment uh, around the globe, but especially in the poorest countries um, that need the most support. And so uh, we are working, you know, the global education communities is um, trying to mobilize attention 
for prioritizing education both in government budgets but also in the big donors like the multilateral institutions and the big philanthropists and it's it's a challenge because of course a lot of the attention is going to the health sector you know to developing the vaccine and and treatments for the virus to contain the virus and then secondly to um, reviving the economies of countries investing in the private sector so a big concern is how can we as a community as a global community really raise attention of policymakers um, that you know not reducing investments in education and actually even not increasing them because we need more resources we need as um, everybody has been saying to focus on those most in need who have less resources both at home and in even in their schools we know um, in most countries uh, there's a high correlation between poverty and the quality of schooling and so um, it becomes even more imperative for uh, the communities uh, across the globe to really prioritize education you know just today we we heard the news that um, one of the vaccines that private sector is producing has been approved by the UK uh, government. Um, it's likely that they're going to be fast tracked also in other countries around the world. And here in the United States, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, released you know the priority list for um, vaccinations. And I was struck that teachers are not a, among the first. You know, I understand that health workers have to be uh, prioritized but i i believe strongly that uh, you know just as important as it is to keep our health workers uh, healthy it is to keep our teachers healthy so they can be at schools and be in person and help our students learn and uh, you know have the safety and the kind of care that they require and also to allow the, you know parents to go back to work so we have, I think as a community, we have to both invest more and better in education, for sure. I most definitely would agree, especially in terms of parents going back to work. All right, um, uh, Andreas, let me turn back to you. Um, when it comes to, to financing um, and the, the, um, the, the education ecosystem, um, if you could sort of talk to us about how big of a role uh, that plays in terms of finding a solution, because Emiliana was talking about sort of the, um, the, the, the very apparent uh, correlation between uh, poverty and the quality of education. Yeah, you know, obviously <clears throat> money matters a lot, but uh, and particularly in disadvantage, I think there's no question about it. At the very same time, you know, I would also be cautious to that to see the solution simply in doing more of the same and to just think, you know, just adding more time and more money will uh, lead, lead to the kind of improvements that we are seeing. If you look at the last, you know, beyond COVID, if you look at the last 10, 15 years, we have actually significantly raised spending on education and more or less see very similar outcomes. The question really is to not to conserve what we are doing, but to transform it. And I do think we have to find ways to use resources differently. And it starts with equity. You know, we need to become a lot better to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms and to get the best school leaders for, for the toughest schools. I think we can learn a lot from countries in Asia, you know, China, Korea, they're doing very well on that. But most importantly, I think we need to uh, raise productivity in education. And that is about, you know, reconfiguring the space, the time, the people, the technologies. We have a very industrial culture in, in schooling. You know, we teach everybody with the same kind of big machine. Uh, we need to better understand how different learners learn differently and then embrace it. You know, if you look at the power, I think one, one of the things the pandemic has done, it has just shown the power of new technologies if you think you know you while you study mathematics on a computer that computer can now study you and figure out you know what you're good at and where you are not so great and what you find interesting and what you find boring where you advance and where you get stuck you know? if you look at learning analytics teachers can now get a sense how different students learn differently so yes i think the financing part is very important particularly in the developing world but uh, if i look at countries you know in the oecd area where i work you know i think uh, the issue really is that uh, is the productivity question you know education is an incredibly conservative social enterprise 
And I tell you, you know, we as parents are often part of the problem, not part of the solution. You know, we get very anxious when our children no longer learn what was very important for us many years ago. And even more so when they start to do learn that we, what we no longer understand. If you look at teachers, they often teach how they were taught, not how they were taught to teach. And as a minister of education, you know, you can lose an election over education when something small goes wrong. You're never going to win an election over education because it just takes time to translate good ideas into better outcomes. And that's why we haven't seen change in education. It's not primarily a question of money. It's really about aligning resources with needs. If you come from a wealthy family, you know, schooling is not going to make a big difference in your life. If you come from a poor family, you have only one card to play, and that is a great teacher and a great school. So that's where the resources need to go. Actually, I'd like to, um, I was hoping I could bring in Professor Shirinin because this is, you know, right up uh, his alley. Uh, but I believe that we're sort of in the middle of uh, sort of reestablishing our connection with him. Uh, so Professor Yin, let me turn to you. I mean, one of the themes that you have been sort of um, underlining uh, throughout this evening's session is, is technology and digital divide. Andreas talked about sort of, you know, it all starts with equity. Um, you know, so my question to you is what kind of um, education reform would work best to protect uh, students, vulnerable students who are, um, you know, uh, at the center of all this? Yes. Um, I, I think... Um um, the the directions uh, for for school uh, you know for schooling so that quite depend on the central platform the central established centrally established uh, learning ecosystem. It, it, it means that uh, where the the poor student have the opportunity to use the uh, good platform. Uh, uh, individualize the platform, can meet the lead, you know, and, and then they learn. Uh, this is very important. Uh, the question to us is that uh, whether the government used, uh, uh, you know, create a critical mass in terms of expertise and, and also have the money to, to, uh, to implement the technology uh, network organize the human resources together, become the ecosystem, such that the student can learn by themselves, you know, like the uh, use of online learning during the pandemic period, you, you know, uh, and then the, they can move uh, in, in a pace, very similar to other uh, students, even though they, ha they are rich, you, you know. It, it, it means that uh, the uh, the, the lesson to us is that school-based uh, initiative, school-based effort is important. You know, depend on teacher, parents, uh, and also principal. But, uh, but on the other hand, using the central platform, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the AI, the artificial intelligence, you know, the, uh, knowledge intensive, and, and, and then the, the student and teacher can use the resources quite conveniently, you, you know, uh, quite straightforward. No need to develop by themselves. They just uh, use the resources uh, uh, from the tap, uh, platform. But at uh, individual school, they cannot uh, develop the platform by themselves. The government have to do it. And even the regional collaboration, uh, you, you know, to do it. And even use a global uh, collaboration to create such kind of uh, uh, central platform such that even though you are very poor, poor student can learn in the same situation like the rich student. With this kind of uh, setup, we, we have the opportunity to tackle uh, the issue of equity. Otherwise, no way. Because uh, the rich student, those in advanced, uh, advantaged a situation, they take the better opportunity. The poor student, they have the poor opportunity. But with the central platform concept, you know, organized by the government or by the regional uh, country together, you, you know, 
uh, such that we can support poor students no matter, uh, you know, such that they have the individualized uh, resources, package, and learning place, you know, and, and learning curriculum. I, I think that the very important lesson to us, in the, in the 1990s, the people believe school-based approach is the wonderful. But uh, I, I, I would like to tell you that, you know, uh, not sufficient to overcome the learning difficulties, except uh, we have the critical mass. How we can build up the critical mass? We should have the uh, central platform, use the high tech, use the technology, such that uh, we can use the AI, you know, to help, to identify the learning problem, or what is the effective way to do it, to learn it, you know, uh, just, uh, just this is the, the, the concept behind, you know, yes. Okay. Um, Professor Satchuk Shiden, I think that uh, we have you back uh, 100% now. Um, listening to what Professor Yin was saying, and, and, and Andreas made a really interesting point which stuck with me in terms of, you know, if you come from a wealthy family, uh, the level of your education could have marginal difference. But if you come from a, a poor background, it makes all the difference in the world. So, uh, and then Professor Ian was talking about, you know, the need for fundamental change and, and, and inequality. I mean, what, in your opinion, uh, is needed in terms of education reform that would not only protect, but also elevate uh, the most vulnerable of students? quite substantial evidence that we know what needs to be done. Now, number one, you have to invest in early childhood education as early as age two or three. That's the you know best uh, rate of return for any kind of investment in education, we know, especially for low-income families, especially for those kids who have limited resources at home. By the time they come to school at age six, or depending on the country where you live, age six, seven, or maybe five and a half, most of brain development, you know, about 90% of our brain, the hardware, develops in the first four years. Uh, if you grow up in an environment, you know, with limited resources, uh, that could also include, you know, nourishment as well. Uh, as, as well as intellectual environment that makes certain kids ready, uh, prepare certain kids ready for school by the time they get to age six, and other kids not ready for learning. Uh, very, you know, commonly cited research are uh, here in the U.S., which is very old now, but it's been replicated in different forms, is uh, talks about 30 million word gap, for example. We know that by the time kids from low resource families come to school, they are not ready to learn, not because they are not motivated enough, not because they don't value education. And on the, on the contrary, they are motivated, they value education, their parents are involved in schools, but their kids are limited in terms of vocabulary to express themselves, also to understand teachers' instruction. In most ways, that gap that, are, that is set in early childhood is really only get worse over the years, and every, every summer, uh, comes we have you know we have this <laughs> it you know the, the school calendar makes no sense it was designed 200 years ago why do we have two three months uh, gaps during the summer to learning as we know learning is continuous it makes no sense but we have summers and any kind of break that is really putting all these vulnerable children who are all already disadvantaged at uh, first grade or kindergarten uh, put them uh, or put, put them at a higher risk to lose learning, whatever they are learning in school. So if you look at kids from these two big backgrounds throughout the school year, you know, in, in September, the gap between these two groups when at the beginning of the school calendar year is widest. And then over the year, uh, throughout the se second semester, by the time you get to May, it actually shrinks a bit. This, in other words, schools are doing their part to a degree. It, can, it will never cancel the home advantage, but at least it does what we expect from schools as a, as a place for social mobility. But then we have summer, another two months, and then if you accumulate it for 10, 12 years, depending on the school system, 
then you have one, one and a half year gap there as well. So unless you address these two issues, early childhood education and summers, the gap will be there and COVID-19 made it worse. Okay, um, Kathleen, I want to turn to you. So, um, Professor Sheeran was talking about, you know, the importance of early childhood um, and some of the disadvantages uh, faced by, by, by certain groups. Um, and this is a, a topic that you uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning of our discussion. So, how do you move people into, uh, a, a, or move them into a skills-based education? Uh, your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, it's funny, I, I used to be, I used to work in the K-12 um, uh, reform ecosystem, and I actually left it uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago to work in, in the next phase, sort of the, what happens when someone is 15, 16, 17, and moving into the, into the, the world of work, um, partly because I, I really felt, and, and maybe COVID changes is that the that the the point that I think Andreas made that, that that the numbers don't don't show us that 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 throwing more money at the problems are working and the intractability of the you know of the of the um, you know whether it's uh, the institutions uh, have have made I think the kind of transformation that we're describing in in, in K twelve or in in uh, for you know early childhood and and middle middle childhood very difficult. Um, however, the reason I came into the higher higher education space. Uh, is because nine years ago, because of technology and, and you know, all colleges were being disrupted, going directly to higher to higher learners uh, from uh, you know from high school, and, and and colleges were feeling there was a fear factor uh, where colleges were feeling like we're we're going to go out of business unless we start to innovate. And and so you've seen that you've seen that innovation curve and, and a lot of uh, private investment coming in. It's it's a hot you know the ed tech space has been very hot internationally, uh, and so you see uh, AI is is playing a big role. More innovation is possible in higher education, and I think what what COVID has helped us recognize is that this skills based ecosystem holds a lot of promise for the very populations that we're talking about. The idea that in the future, you could be hired uh, for, for things you can do um, and things you can demonstrate you can do rather than you know, where you went to school or whether you could afford to go to a four-year college. Um, obviously, there'll always be some, uh, some fields that require licensure, but the idea that, that you can break down skills uh, to the point that they can be unlocked from degrees which could be expensive and inflexible and not really an option for you know you know many 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 people how do you make those the skills uh, acquisition uh, attainable for, for people and and the kinds of programs that we're um, that we started before covid but now we're really taking off in th in this country in the US are what we're calling micro pathways it's the idea that you could earn micro credentials in a short time frame that help you build the skills from the skilled profile you have that help you know, hospitality or uh, let's say uh, uh, you know, retail job because those many of those jobs are not coming back after COVID. And I think that's happening you know, around the world. How do we help people make the jump to other careers? And we're, we're working with the Federal Reserve Banks uh, here in the US which have created a, a, a like a similarity score for skills where you can look at a retail job and say, what are the overlap skills and how do I, how do I make that jump from retail to something that's, uh, that uses the retail skills, you know, of, of um, interpersonal skills and sales and those kinds of things. And it's really uh, catching on here among both policymakers and cities and economic development organizations uh, and employers and colleges who are saying, okay, we need to unlock our degrees and turn them into competencies that can be earned. Uh, one term being used here is credential as you go. And high schools, you know, so in other words, the, 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 the secondary schools are picking up on this too. And they're, they're asking and they, they wanna be connected into this skills-based hiring and learning economy. So, you know, I could go on about it. I don't wanna take all the time, but uh, you can tell I'm excited about it. And, and that is because it's the first sort of um, construct really that holds the promise 
uh, where where learners uh, become empowered to have the visibility of where targeted skills can take them. It's a strength based uh, frame because it says it starts with what can I do? What can I already do that I could demonstrate rather than having to go to a college and I may not even graduate? I can't afford it. So th those are those are the reasons that um, you know those of us who are kind of working with what we call new majority learners are excited about the skills based ecosystem that's starting to emerge and COVID has helped to give it a push. Um, Emiliana, if I could sort of ask you to pick up where, where, where Kathleen sort of uh, left off, because a lot of the things that she mentioned uh, overlap with some of your expertise as well. Yes, as, as, as I was thinking about what we are all collectively talking about, forming education after okay. COVID and building. Emiliana. Can you hear me? Oh, Emiliana, sorry. Yeah, I, I think we're having a, uh, yeah. an issue with with the sound. I mean, uh, so let me just ask my uh, our technical operations to actually maybe sort of reestablish the connection or check the audio levels, uh, and then I'll bring you back. But uh, let me turn to you, uh, Andreas. I mean, um, you know, Kathleen was talking about um, younger children and the children uh, that are you know, and, and the in the disadvantaged situations that they faced, uh, and up until now, generally we've been sort of talking about sort of these uh, these broad brush uh, solutions. I'm wondering if you could sort of uh, elaborate if this is possible in terms of uh, making student profile specific recommendations uh, for for improvement. Well, you know, I think Kathleen has pointed us to this solution. You know, I think we need to move away from this kind of very monopolistic structures that we have, particularly in higher education. You know, a university is very good in bundling, you know, content, uh, delivery and accreditation and then selling you a very expensive degree. I think I, I do agree with Kathleen that the future lies in micro credential, that we are recognizing what people can actually do right now, irrespective of where they have learned it. You know, people may learn great things at the workplace. People may learn great things in private life. And uh, I think we need to become better to recognize what people know and can actually do rather than the kind of specific pathway they have gone through. So if micro-credentialing really takes off, and I think together with blockchain technology, there's a real chance for that to happen, to break that monopoly of the big institutions. I think if those, take, if those credentials take off, you're going to have a lot more discretion for people to decide you know, what they learn, how they learn, when they learn, where they learn. You give real ownership to learners, and I think that will make it so much more possible. Think about, you know, all the people in the informal economy. I think Turkey is a great example. You know, you have lots of highly skilled people that are actually doing a great job every day, but they're not recognized for their skills. They're not paid for that because nobody knows what, what they can be doing. So I, I actually think particularly people in the informal economy will greatly benefit. You know, it's just shedding a light on this. and. Uh, I think uh, this is an amazing perspective for the future. This is what technology will allow. It's going to be empowering the learner and disempowering the providers, the institutions. That's a good point. Um, all right, let me just, since you made a, a, a point on Turkey, let me turn to the only, uh, the Turkish uh, participant, uh, Professor uh, Satrik Uh I, I know that you you specialize in, in early childhood and, and, and youth development, but um, you have spent time in this country. Um, so picking up where, where Andreas left off in terms of, uh, you know, empowering the learner, what can, what specific models do you see here and in, in other uh, developing countries? Well, you know, Turkey actually have an open university that was one of the best in the world, uh, the, uh, you know, other than the one in, in London. Uh, it's been very successful in training teachers over the years. More than a million teachers got their training through this open university. And most recently, uh, Minister of Education, I mean, so, sometimes centralized uh, organizational structure helps in crisis. Uh, it was the case in Turkey. And uh, as you know, can you hear me? Do I still have a problem with connection? Yeah. No, no. We can hear uh, you loud and clear. Okay, thank you. So, Minister of Education started their own uh, TV channel, public TV, available everywhere. 
And within a very short period of time, they created content in every class or every level, in every uh, category you can imagine, multiple versions. I actually lectured there in Turkish. I loved it, the, the, you know, the, the professionalism of TRT, I think uh, where we are doing this forum was behind that uh, effort as well. It's been very successful. It's also uniquely uh, unique, I think, in, in the developing world where they made this available in a such short time, within, within weeks, they had the TV running. Uh, all courses were simultaneously are, were, uh, uh, put online as well, so every child can access their database and follow classes. Teachers can communicate with students. In terms of infrastructure, I think Turkey could be a model. Now, there are other problems, of course, like uh, internet uh, uh, availability. You know, uh, we don't have the infrastructure for all of children, students in Turkey to access some of this uh, uh, advanced materials available. Uh, but I also want to say something about higher education because it's an area that, you know, obviously <laughs> where, I, where I work and I'm worried for the future of higher education for the same reasons that are shared here. Because I think, uh, you know, there will be role for research at higher education, high-end research, and I think we will have uh, some of the universities uh, in the future doing the effective work of creating knowledge. Uh, we will uh, train, you know, advanced uh, researchers, scholars in different fields. Those are constant. I think what will change is some of the other uh, elements of higher education, like skills development or, or vocational school as higher education. I think that will be gone. And I, in one of the analysis here at Stern School of Business at NYU shows, you know, about quarter of universities in, to, in the United States will go out of business in the next decade or two. Uh, so this is, this is an immediate challenge. We are not talking about some, some distant future. We are talking about tomorrow or if not today. And I think we have to be ready for that. And for that same reason, uh, I want to just underline one more time the importance of early childhood education. If we were starting from scratch and designing education, not knowing anything at all from, from, uh, from the current system, I would start education at age two or three and end it at age 18. We are talking about institutionalized central uh, you know, educational system. I think after that point, you know, you can have internship you can have you know on the on the job training you can have all kinds of credentials or, you know all the ideas shared before me uh, but the idea that we spend the first most critical years without providing education until age six makes no sense with what we know about brain development right now um satrick thank you very much uh emilian i want to bring you back in because uh i do apologize to you i, I had to sort of cut you off because we were experiencing a, a slight um a problem with our connection so uh, i'm going to give the floor back to you and and sort of maybe pick off what, what what kathleen was saying but also incorporate uh some of maybe the um the regional uh, your regional experiences that you have in latin america uh, and as well as in the caribbean with with satrick giving um uh, an example from turkey well, thank you. I hope I don't have the robotic voice anymore. Um, yes, I. Emilia, I can you, you hear know, me? So I was, yes. Can you hear me? No. Oh shoot. Let's see. Can, let's see if with a headset, maybe. Again. Emiliana, can you hear me? Can you hear me better now? Yes, I hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I yeah, loud and clear, loud and clear. It, this is sort of difficult to sort of coordinate. Uh, we're in this virtual studio. We have five uh, guests from, from all around the world, and, and sometimes uh, we do suffer from some of these, uh, these technological gaps, uh, and no pun intended in terms of uh, what we've been talking about, too. Uh, let me give the floor to you in terms of some of the comments that you want to make, because uh, I had to sort of cut you off twice. Yeah, so I, I wanted to say that we can learn a lot from, you know, I totally agree with the previous speakers about how to rethink the way we do schooling and start much earlier, but also make it much more learner driven, let's say, and recognizing that a lot of the learning takes place not just in school, but out of school. 
And really, you know, our models of schooling were thought through as, you know, very industrial that all kids would enter with uh, the similar level of skills, would learn at the same pace, the same material. And prior to COVID, that already was failing uh, almost all children in the world, all students. But now it's really, you know, we're in a cross crossroads where we have the technology, we have the the AI, we have the resources um, to really dramatically change the experience so that, um, you know, we cater to where the student is, we understand better where they are when they come in the door, and we let them progress at their own pace um, and follow kind of their own uh, pace trajectory, knowing what we want everybody as a collective to, to have as foundational skills and then uh, continue learning throughout the lives. You know, so I think from my experience and, and a little bit related to the conversation about resources, the challenge is really that a lot of uh, particularly low income countries and low and middle income countries don't yet have the resources to do this and high income countries um, will be able to leapfrog quicker. And so how do we as a global community really um, ensure that we don't continue to grow gaps between low income and high income countries, for example, or low income and high income uh, students and children and youth within countries. And I think that's the core of the work that we do at places like Brookings and in and, and general in, in development is thinking about how can we uh, help leapfrog and, and really do things differently, use resources more effectively, but also recognize that the availability of resources in low income settings is much lower. Um, and so we need to uh, push for prioritization for those settings. Okay, um, Kathleen, let me turn to you. I mean, some of the themes that we've been discussing uh, in this evening session, uh, technology, uh, the digital divide, um, resources, lack thereof, as well as sort of the, the, the economic divide and, and what you've been talking about in terms of uh, the skill-based economy and uh, skill-based education. Um, I'm wondering if I can sort of get your thoughts on what you think uh, public uh, information programs can play in all this. Um, well, yes, I, I started my career in, in the field that you're in uh, as, a, as, a, as a TV broadcaster. So I think a lot about the public, uh, the public square. Um, it, the problem right now is like the, the sort of the work that I just meant to, to you, to you and, and others around what does it look like to be in a, in a steady state or in the, you know, people are things they can do they can they have their the skills in their backpack because of blockchain and they do uh, test out a new a new field um, and and what it takes to get to that so they have perfect owner has perfect information um, employers can discover them by typing in a search saying I'm looking for somebody with collaboration and these specific data data base skills uh, and they can find people all over the world who have those skills. So it, it's a very empowering from a, uh, you know, a, um, it, it, it solves to some extent the issue of, um, of low networked people who don't have social networks. Um, but um, but I, I think the problem is, is that we, you know, there's probably 200 people in the world right now who have kind of have this vision in their head. How do you convince employers? It's got to start with employers, right? Because they have to, they have to create the demand. Um, and and so we we need a huge public uh, public campaign around helping employers see the benefit for them of a skills based economy. Right? Is it retention? Is it diversity? Is it uh, is it fit? Um, is it just you know higher reasons why they should care a lot to get from where they are today to being able to really put it into practice. How do colleges and institutions and learning providers, how do they make the shift? It's a lot of work to be done to unlock your, you know, your, um, you know, your history major or your, uh, your, um, you know, your current training program to make it uh, competency based with the assessments required and to make all these, you know, to create the digital badging that goes with that. That's what the, that's what the institutions have to do. And then learners have to understand the value of making themselves visible and, um, and knowing how to do it. Um, so those three stakeholders 
uh, all require huge um, public, uh, you know, a public campaign to get them to understand it, to test it, and to care, and to feel like it's it's going to be useful. That's a huge amount of work, but that's that's the kind of work that we're that we're doing right now, at least in the U.S. Okay. Um Professor Yin, if I could turn to you, you know, Kathleen was, so uh, one of the things that she said that, you know, learners need to make themselves uh, visible. How do you take uh, some of the discussion points that we've been talking about tonight, uh, deploy them into schools uh, once this pandemic is over so learners can make themselves more visible? Yes, um, I, I, I think... Uh uh, the concept of uh, learning, uh, you know, that will will be changing, you know. Um, previously, we uh, we focus on the side bounded learning. You, you see that, uh, but now the, uh, we brought in the concept with using the, the technology, you, you know, uh, such that uh, the learning opportunity is quite different from the traditional way, you, you see that. Now, for example, uh, uh, to prepare our young people uh, to adapt to the fast changing and challenging uh, situation, you know, in the post pandemic uh, world, you, you know. But uh, when, how they can adapt to the situation uh, easily, uh, you know, uh, they, they need that kind of uh, innovation, creativity, and uh, multiple thinking, you, you know, uh, in addition to the basic skill they have, that the basic uh, knowledge they, they have. On, on, the, on top of this, that they, they need to, to have uh, this kind of creativity. But how they can groom the creativity, I think it depends on whether they have the uh, multiple thinking you know, whether we, they can develop multiple thinking, you know, in different areas, such that they can adapt to the situation from different point of view, you, you see that. Um, now, creativity often defined as uh, jump out of the box. If the student do not have the, uh, several boxes, you, you know, they can jump out to other box to make, create, to make a creative, uh, to make innovation, you, you, you see that. Uh, I, I think that it's important. We we have the facilities, we have the uh, platform, uh, we we have the technology. In addition, we need to have have the a new paradigm of learning, emphasizing on the multiple contextualized multiple intelligence, not not psychological intelligence, you know, but also uh, contextualized multiple intelligence such that they have the ability to jump from one box to other box. You, you see that? Uh, to, to make creativity and also to make uh, innovation. I, I think uh, um, the skill-based learning is important at the basic level. Beyond that, we, we need to encourage our young people to develop the multiple perspective and have the multiple thinking ability such that they can jump out of the box and make innovation to make uh, uh, creativity possible uh, in the future life, you know, in the future uh, challenge. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to sort of, sort of move into sort of wrapping up this discussion because we're sort of running out of time. But Andreas, let me turn to you. So we've, um, we've identified problems, we've quantified them, um, and we've sort of maybe suggested some, some solutions, but I'm wondering uh, if you think that this uh, pandemic has perhaps maybe uh, fast-tracked um, inevitable, inevitable changes um, that, were, that, that are needed in, in education, and also uh, sort of what Kathleen has been saying in terms of, uh, of how we work in the future too. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, we have seen probably maybe less reform, but certainly more change in education over the last six months. Uh, we have seen incredible amounts and not just technological info innovation, but also social innovation in education. You know, if you as a teacher in the past used to broadcast knowledge to all students in the same way, 
in this crisis, you were out of business. You had to become a good coach, a good mentor, a good facilitator, a good evaluator, a creative designer of innovative learning environments. So I think it's done a lot with teachers and uh, teachers have faced a very steep learning curve, but grown a lot in this experience. I think students as well. Students have, you know, been more on their own. They had to sort of be a lot more resourceful, uh, understand how to learn. It, I mean, the inequalities are all real, but I do think this crisis has uh, accelerated change. And I think there's going to be a lot of young people who are going to go back to their teachers and said, hey, you know, I've learned to learn on my own. I found it actually very interesting to find new resources on the Internet. Why do we have to go back to boring classrooms? And I think you're going to go see a lot of teachers who are going to back to their school leaders and say, look, you know, I have actually now done my own kind of lesson projects and I've connected with my colleagues. I have actually learned to work within a profession and to create the education system rather than just to transmit it. Uh, why do we have to go back to regular schooling? I think that momentum will uh, stick with us. Uh, uh, let me just make one more point, and I think that's a... <clears throat> uh, 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 Pro Professor Sirin made this as well. You know, the, the, the early years are not just about a greater equity, creating a level playing field. I think that's a very, very important part. But I think the other part is that many of the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that are going to be so central in the 21st century are best learned in the early years. If you think about curiosity, if you think about empathy, if you think about, you know, leadership, if you think about courage, for us as adults, they are personality traits. They're very hard to change, very hard to improve. But for young children, they are skills like mathematics. You know, in a way, schooling was the education of the 20th century. The early years, the early childhood education, that is the education of the 21st century. So I think we have to leverage that change. The crisis has shown us that the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, they are disappearing from our economies, from our societies. And the robots, artificial intelligence are taking all of this over. You know, we have done very well in education to educate second class robots, but now it's time to think about what it means to be a first class human. And I do think that's what this crisis has, you know, accelerated. Some all right. Uh, fantastic stuff, Andres. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Emiliana, I want to give you the closing comments. I mean, we talked about the shifting uh, momentum. Uh, what are your, uh, your closing comments? Um, thank you. I, you know, I hope that, you know, and we have realized that it's the opportunity, as we say. I, I loved how Andres said it, that we've had more change, although not intentionally, not designed by policymakers. I hope we keep uh, what has uh, been some really useful innovations. For example, the way we have leveraged technology, um, the way that teachers have, um, you know, been forced to embrace technology and and enhance it. You know, I just uh, recently published uh, a report on how to realize the potential of education technology to improve learning for all that really explains what are, uh, based on the evidence, the comparative advantages of technology to uh, complement the work of teachers. Um, but also, I think we need to, um, you know, I think the the crisis has revealed the crucial role that schools as institutions play in our societies, uh, providing uh, a place where kids, you know, thrive or can thrive when well done, and where their parents and guardians can work and be engaged in their own productive activities and, and know that their children are, are, are well taken care of. And, and also, you know, an, a source of employment. And so really, you know, seeing the sector as a driver, as a driver for the whole development of a, of a community and a nation, I think is, is one of, I hope, the silver linings of COVID and one that I hope we will um, exponentiate uh, moving forward. Right, with that, uh, I have to say that uh, I'm afraid that we've come to uh, the end of our discussion. Uh, thank you to all of our guests, Andreas Slesher, Professor Yin Cheng Cheng, Emiliana Vegas, Professor Satchuk Shirin, and Kathleen uh, Delaski. And thank you to all of you who have turned into uh, this session, tuned into the session rather, uh, and this year's uh, TRT World Forum. Uh, you know, over the past two days, we've been looking at uh, how our world is changing and how the dynamics are shifting 
as we uh, start to transition into a post-pandemic world. I hope you found it as interesting and informative as I did. The open sessions of the forum comes to an end here, but we do have a couple more roundtable discussions that will be going on later on this evening, so uh, be sure to catch that. And before we sign off, on behalf of uh, all my colleagues at TRT World, I'd like to extend my uh, thanks to Mr. Ibrahim Eran, Director General and Chairman of TRT, and Ms. Punar Kandemish, the forum's director, for again putting on a spectacular event and last but not least, our friends in the vision department. I know it's been a different year, a different form, one unique with its challenges, but once again, you stepped up to the plate and you delivered. Thank you to you all and hope to see you next year.